the elder or poetic edda author unknown translated by olive bray introduction a translation is only a compromise at best and effected with a sense of resting and defeat it has therefore always some need of apology especially to those who are already acquainted with the original and for a work which is entitled to a high place in international literature such place we claim for the edda not only as the fountainhead of germanic mythology and tradition but for its own beauty of expression the art of the scandinavian poets they sent it forth long since armed with winged words and girded with power and only for want of speech in different tongues has it remained so little recognized two previous renderings into english by thorpe and york powell might well have proved its worth but the first was allowed to fall out of print while interest was only beginning to awaken and the second is included in the corpus poeticum boreale with other less worthy material in a form that cannot appeal to the general reader both have been used in preparing the present book which is offered less to scholars and students than to all who have sufficient taste for mythology and understanding of old lore to recognize the truth and beauty which are not expressed in precisely the forms and language of today but who are also insistent like ourselves that old books are not true because of their age nor old lamps beautiful unless they can be polished anew to satisfy truth and for fear of doing injustice to the original we have endeavored to keep the translation as literal as possible though ambiguity in the original occasionally necessitates interpretation by a somewhat freer rendering where we have failed to catch the spirit of the icelandic or to find for it worthy english expression we hope that the illustrations will suggest that a wealth of beauty is waiting to be represented in modern art by the painter as it was pictured of old by the icelandic poets for their style is so essentially graphic without being descriptive that the more familiar we are with their works the more difficult does it seem to translate them into words instead of colour and form simon's edda bears a title under which its first editor would have failed to recognise it simund a well-known icelandic scholar of the twelfth century had no part in its composition although according to popular tradition he was the author of a work on mythology nor was the name of edda given to it before the seventeenth century we find this word attached to a collection of mythical stories made by the great icelandic historian snorri storleson eleven eighty one to twelve forty one its earliest meaning was great grandmother and it is thus used in rigsthula what were the intermediate steps in sense development we little know but great grandmother's stories like old wives tales was deemed by some sceptic a fitting title for snorri's account of the old norse gods and goddesses of asgarth and it was thus deemed equally suitable by bishop brynjolf svensson sixteen forty three for the more venerable work which from that time was called simuns or the poetic edda note many scholars however incline to the theory put forth by mr eric magnusson in his paper on edda saga book of the viking club volume one page two nineteen that the name whatever later meanings may have been given meant originally the book of odi or codex odensis and that edda is merely a feminine form agreeing with bok of odi the home of snorri where his love for history and literature first was kindled it exists in several manuscripts none of which were brought to light before the icelandic renaissance of the seventeenth century the finding of the first and most complete manuscript was somewhat dramatic and resembled the long-awaited discovery of the planet neptune magnus olafsson had suggested the former existence of a more ancient edda and we soon find this hypothetical work regarded in the light of a hidden treasure of wisdom and ancient lore of which all existing fragments were but the bare shadow and the footprint we know nothing of how it was tracked and at last discovered but by sixteen forty three the codex regius was in the hands of bishop brynjolf this most important manuscript known as r is in the copenhagen library it is an octavo volume consisting of five parchment sheets belonging to the thirteenth century and containing nearly all the poems given below the others are found in manuscripts of the fourteenth century 
which were brought to light by the same scholars. The Codex Arnamagneanus A supplied Baldr's Draumar. The Codex Wormianus includes Rigsthula with Snorri's Edda. Inluyoth is found in one of the great saga books, the Flate Jarbok. Grogaldr og Fjosfinismal are only known in paper manuscripts of the 17th century. Thus, with a few modern editions, Saemund's Edda is an early collection of much older lays, some mythical and some heroic. The mythical lays only are given here, although, as regards style and authorship, no line of distinction can be drawn between them. Brief passages in prose have been added at some later period. The poems themselves belong to somewhat different dates and show the work of different hands. Some are fragmentary and have suffered from rearrangement and interpolation. All are more or less obscure. They point back to lost traditions, forgotten creeds, and, it is suggested, a wealth of early poetic literature and mythology which are common to the Germanic race. They lead us forward also to the more intelligible account of Snorri's prose book, which is the earliest commentary on the subject. This cannot rank with the primitive sources of tradition, except in so far as it quotes old fragments from lost poems and strophes of those found in the Edda. Christian and foreign influence, the orderly mind of the scholar, the shaping hand of the artist, have left their traces behind. In one or two cases we can even correct his misinterpretations, where an earlier and perhaps grander myth, less understood in the narrow light of medieval learning than by the broader and more comparative knowledge of today, has become overgrown by some later fairy tale we are obliged however to rely on snorri's version where all other explanation is wanting for gaps and obscurities in the poems indeed there is little else to throw light upon the subject iceland has a magnificent prose literature in the sagas of the thirteenth century which are records of the old norse kings stories of family life in iceland or the mother country and viking expeditions both romantic and historic they treat of times past when the mythology of the edda was still living but they show only the cult and worship of the principal deities odin thor and frey who differ widely from the heroic beings of the myths the skalds or court poets save ulf ugason and thjodwolf rarely chose such subject for their songs but in praising their lords they made use of a poetic diction based on mythical lore and full of allusions which sometimes bear out what is written in the edda though often too obscure to be of much service the only other contemporary source of information is a not very reliable history of denmark by saxo grammaticus eleven eighty five a d who to honour his native land the more has stolen the traditions of neighbouring peoples and brought the old norse gods upon the scene as heroes only or as vanquished foes it is the unwritten literature the folklore and fairy tales of germanic nations and of other races which often supply us with the motive and help us to an understanding of the edic myths but the poems are not so obscure as they appear at first sight when taken together and compared and fitted one into the other they become intelligible and reveal much concerning themselves their nature and their history from internal evidence alone we must seek an answer to the question when and where were they composed the manuscripts as we have seen belong to the thirteenth and fourteenth centuries but the poems themselves are clearly older an atmosphere of heathendom pervades them and suggests a time before one thousand a d when christianity was established in iceland the evidence of language the icelandic dialect and of metre shows on the other hand that they were not written earlier than the ninth century when the old norse tongue underwent definite changes between these dates therefore eight fifty to one thousand a d it is now generally agreed that the edda was composed during this period the icelanders in their intercourse with norway and in viking expeditions or more peaceful settlements in the british isles had every opportunity of drawing from all the medieval springs of language and literature and the question has now become how far do the poems belong to iceland and the north altogether olsen thinks finur jonsson gives them to norway but in contrast to the early critics who held these myths and legends as the heirloom of the whole germanic race the tendency is now to regard them as mainly borrowed from christian classical and other foreign sources 
thus buga and figvusson will not allow that they belong to the north at all but rather to the west where they were composed under the influence of international literature by settlers in the british isles this theory cannot be wholly accepted but their researches have at least shown that the vocabulary and descriptions of life are not exclusively icelandic or even northern and they enable us to view the poems in better perspective few traces will be found of the immediate history of the icelanders their settlement in the ninth century their life as depicted in the sagas with its strange mixture of law at home and lawlessness abroad the stage of the edda is filled with kings and earls such as those who once ruled in norway or figured in heroic legends of the past strange fables old world charms and saws where wisdom works by spells and knowledge is immersed in magic lore barbarous customs savage heathen rites all harmonize in the picture of an earlier life and suggest that the writers were repeating the traditions of their mother country or even as jessen holds those of the primitive germanic race it is only when we come to the individual style and treatment that the setting becomes truly northern the kennings used the descriptive details the atmosphere and scene alike are characteristic of iceland and here we meet with foreign words such as plog plow tresk tress which shows the influence of european civilization and medieval romances the myths likewise in their broad outlines do not belong to iceland alone but to other scandinavian countries and to germany and england odin or woden thor hel frigg tyr were known to all the tribes as were dwarfs and elves even the jutun a being so familiar in the edda is met in old english as a monster eotun their presentation however hell no longer as the underworld but a northern land of mist and cold the jutuns who have become frost giants and odin as the warfather a viking in spirit can only be creations of the icelandic poets while the conception of a new world and higher powers and the figure of baldr betoken the near approach of christianity it seems most reasonable therefore to adopt mug's theory that the poems were composed mainly on old themes which had been brought from the mother country into iceland where they took their present form with traces of old english and celtic influence but the wealth of interest in the edda has been disclosed by the manifold researches and conjectures of different scholars pursuing each his own theory perhaps to extinction uhland hofery mullenhof tracing the delicate outlines of some nature myth grimm and max muller finding links in mythology and heinzel in poetic form between the indo-germanic nations Riedberg attempting without even attaining complete success to prove that one grand historic saga and a few heroic forms of germanic origin are the source of all the late and varying traditions schwarz monhard meyers distinguishing the fancies born of superstition from the religious creeds of more developed man kaufmann and fraser revealing how once savage rites are still remembered and transfigured in poetic myths but no one has done more towards proving the value of the edda than buga who has shown that all its interests in literature history mythology religion are not drawn from one barren source alone but from the wisdom of the world partly for this reason because its interests are too wide and deep to yield themselves at once and partly because the edda has suffered too much from the chances and changes of time we offer suggested explanations of the different poems for readers who are not previously acquainted with eddic literature we should like to have avoided all the vexed questions which leave their scars behind and spoil appreciation of the art and spirit of the work but too often these questions ask themselves and the many possible answers give depth and largeness to the subject to those however who would read it without commentary we offer the translation only with notes of reference between corresponding passages which may possibly serve as guides in following the right thread and occasionally find an end for a story begun though they will not nor will any commentary unravel all the tangles in the edda for mythology itself is a tangled garden of thought unless it has undergone complete transformation in the hands of the artist it is nothing less than the mind of the nation laid bare which like the mind of the individual discloses a mass of inconsistent incongruous ideas childish notions mature thoughts 
fleeting fancies high imaginings borrowed opinions lying side by side all stamped by past experience but never blended into unity it is for some artist or historian to reveal the mind of his nation if a true artist his own sense of beauty will discover something which is immortal and which like the sculpture of the greeks he can leave in fixed abiding forms if a true historian he will disclose some one phase or stage of development or if a prophet he will declare the ideals of his nation and show mythology in the light of religion but no such influence has given unity to the mythology of the north the edda discloses only a mixture of rational and irrational ideas folklore and fairy tale savage heathen ritual symbolic acts and mystic legends are found as different expressions of the same human instinct and even associated with the same deity for the gods themselves are continually changing their characters and forms well defined one moment the next they are shifting shapeless beings sometimes appearing as types of thought statuesque and classic in repose or as natural forces in their workings full of almost human life and passion we seek in vain for the indo-germanic heaven or sky-god by which is meant no unalterable personality who lives on in tradition from age to age but merely the conception of an overruling power now inhabiting now symbolizing and now identified with the heaven itself odin the wind god the high one is set on his throne as the all-father whom all other gods obey and serve but soon we find him parting with his weapons or attributes of heaven god his sword of light to heimdal or to frey his thunderbolt to thor we could scarcely hope for unity in a mythology which is handed down in old wives tales and scattered fragments of art but in a work as poetic as the edda and a collection which was almost co-existent with the myths themselves we might have looked for some fundamental idea some one aspect whether of art or history or religion in which they would present themselves but we have already pointed out that the edda is too diffuse in its interest to confine itself to one side of life it is like some old building in which many hands and many ages have taken part its charm lies in all its varied features and claims and to follow the poems in an appreciative way we are obliged to dip into a world of fancy and emerge into one of fact only to plunge and be lost in mysteries of thought a specialist will find no satisfaction in studying it nor can he appreciate its merits to consider its myths as in any way representative of old norse religion would lead us very far astray they hint now and then at acts of worship sacrifice and rites but the narrative or dialogue is never interwoven with prayers or hymns of praise and seldom broken by moral teaching the connection between the mythology and the religion of the people is obscure and probably very slight for the poet's hand has been at work adding grace and humour reinterpreting in the light of fancy rather than of truth history also after tracing with delight some ancient custom distinguishing scandinavian features from germanic origins and filling in a background of contemporary life in the viking period rejects the rest as fiction an art will not forbear to criticize a cycle of poems which show a total lack of unity which are manifestly by different authors and of different dates full of obscure allusions half-forgotten tales discrepancies inequalities of style but here censure will be lost in praise of the almost unique qualities of the individual poems the dramatic power suggestiveness humour which seldom appears conscious of itself vigour and swiftness of expression where word follows hard after word with a kind of impetuous eagerness and where all the force of the ballad writer is often combined with the grace of a finished artist nor will admiration pause for there is colossal grandeur about the whole subject which inspires reverence and awe a material grandeur such as men loved and feared until civilization taught them the minuteness and also the pettiness of life an entire contrast to the intellectual delicacy of the greeks and yet a mythology even more fitted than theirs for an epic poem the germanic ideal naturally expressed itself in large heroic action its huge forms and simple outlines allow infinite space for the play of power and a skilful hand might have wrought these poems into an epic cycle as fine and much stronger than the arthurian legend but they approach most nearly in fact 
only for want of the one shaping hand they just miss being the mightiest drama that has ever been written the characters odin balder loki njord frey freya are capable of infinite development they possess even now all the steadfastness of the type all the life of the individual they are godlike in their power and majesty they are girt about with the freshness and vigour the tenderness and youth the breadth and atmosphere which belongs to them as forces of nature and yet they are intensely human in their passions in their actions and their speech it is indeed as we pass from the drama and get closer and closer to a representation of life itself that a principle of unity appears in the edda it is seen at last in a thread which is woven through all the poems that of fate or rather weird for the power of germanic mythology is not the fate which takes revenge on the individual and which can be seen to interpose in the fortunes of men it is a sweeping world force set free by the first-born beings the jutuns and left to work itself out in the life of the universe it knows no law except that of consequence and obeys no impulse except that of nature it is weird which renders the meeting of menglod and dayspring as inevitable as the sunrise at dawn gerd must surrender to frey as earth must ever respond to the wooing of summer thor will recover his hammer as surely as spring will return but weird is seen at work on a yet mightier scale in the whole cycle of the edda it is as inevitable for the aesir the war gods to perish as it is for all imperfect ideals to be shattered and they are destroyed before even the coming of mightier powers as a result of their own weakness and folly and by forces which they have long held at bay at intervals in the poems doom is foretold the weird motif is heard but only in voluspa does there seem any conscious attempt to trace its power through all the history of the gods this poem stands first in the codex regius a place which it merits for it is the grandest of all the works in the edda and is necessary for a full comprehension of the spirit which moves and lives throughout and the unity which binds all the fragments together but it is full of allusions whose significance is not understood except by those already familiar with the various myths and their interpretations for this reason and because the attitude of the writer is essentially one of summing up and estimating the value of old world thoughts in the light of new we have placed it last the other poems have been arranged where possible in their right sequence in the history of the gods but more often for they are seldom closely related to introduce scenes and characters most conveniently to the reader this scheme is perhaps made clearer by the explanatory notes grimnismal stands first for in it we meet with much that is most characteristic of old norse mythology the chief gods and goddesses their homes the rude warfaring life in valhalla the valkyries and the great world tree yggdrasil odin the all-father is shown in the manifold forms in which he must henceforth be recognized alvismal and vafruthnismal complete the description of cosmology and make us familiar with the inhabitants of different worlds and the history of the earliest times these poems place us at the outset in a right attitude towards the type of mythology found in the edda its myths have their place in evolutionary history among those drawn by the poets from a religion in the transition stage between a worship of nature and of more anthropomorphic gods in havamal the high one reveals himself by relating the mysteries of his own experience and the wisdom he has gained imiskviva thrimskviva and skirnismal are less didactic narratives of thor and frey told with a simple love for old themes and still in touch with nature myths but in the next poems fjolvinismal rigsdula hinluyolv and harbaljolv the myth is associated with some new theme and used merely as a setting veiled meanings suggest themselves and the gods have become more conventional forms their power is waning and in baldur's draumar and lokasena the weird motif is heard waxing stronger and louder proclaiming the near approach of doom or ragnarok for once more the icelandic word is required to express a doom which is but the last of life's issues the first of these poems with its tone of solemn warning is like a return to faith in the old gods the second with the mocking laughter of a sceptic 
reviews and criticizes their history and their characters voluspa also is a retrospect but seen with a tender discerning eye and as we have noticed an attempt to find unity in truth the text has been included more for the sake of comparison with the english than for the use of scholars and students the version is based of that of gettering paderborn nineteen o four whose spelling and metrical corrections have generally been accepted the spelling is to some extent simplified u is used both for the e umlaut of o and the u umlaut of a u represents the e umlaut of u the u umlaut of a is neglected as in all later manuscripts different readings of the more important passages are noted below with the same abbreviation of names which are found in the best german commentaries emendations and all changes in order of strophes were also noted with a reference to the manuscripts as given by detter and heinzel leipzig nineteen o three whose edition it should be observed is arranged in half lines no precise attempt has been made in the translation to render the original metre which follows strict laws of its own the long line is divided by cesura into half lines which are connected by alliterative staves falling on the most emphatic words and occasionally by rhyme two forms of strophe are found the fornirvislag resembles most nearly the oldest epic metre of the germanic race it is used in voluspa thrymsnida and other epic lays and consists of four such lines as described liudahatar which is peculiar to old norse has greater rhythm and flexibility variety is given by the alternation of long lines with and without cesura it is more suitable for the dramatic poems like skirnismal or for dialogue as in lokasena alliteration has been retained or introduced where possible and the rhythm which is hard for modern ears to catch has been slightly emphasized all we freely admit resulting in a compromise which satisfies neither the new nor the old but which seems the only means of introducing the one to the other it is with great hesitation that a translation based mainly on suggestions by detter gering finner jonsen figfussen and other authorities has been given of the names many of which are of doubtful meaning by names often seem to be used only for the sake of alliteration in such cases it has sometimes been considered advisable to substitute the better known title on the other hand we ourselves have occasionally introduced a familiar by name for metrical convenience in every case however the text will supply the original form even to those unacquainted with icelandic where the meaning of the names is wholly obscure they are given in their original form in the translation d is adopted for icelandic v since this has been done in previous versions and a few names such as odin which have already become familiar to english readers are retained the nominative case ending r l n is dropped except in the case of ir as in fenrir or where r forms part of the stem as balder we would here express our gratitude to professor kerr mr w g collingwood and mr a f major whose corrections and suggestions have been of inestimable value in the translation commentary and general plan of the work end of introduction part one introduction part two the sayings of grimnir it has been suggested that grimnismal is one of the oldest poems in the collection and it may well have been such in its original form for there is a grand simplicity in expression and an absence of any seemingly borrowed ideas it touches only on the main features of old norse mythology and has no knowledge of later stories which grew up around the separate gods and goddesses and which form such frequent subjects of allusion by the poets supplying them with a wealth of obscure poetical imagery but the confused arrangement which we have altered only for the sake of giving more sequence to the ideas and such details as those which surround the original conception of the world tree suggest revision and interpolation and give ground for the supposition that the poem as it stands is of late origin and an attempt to revive a belief in the old religion by the teaching of old myths the setting of the poem too bears the mark of a different and more skilful hand it is wonderfully dramatic in contrast to the quiet rehearsal of old-world knowledge and traditional lore 
odin and frigg appear first as humble peasants who give shelter to the sons of a certain king hraudung next the sky god is pictured in heaven sitting on his throne of window shelf from whence he can view all the worlds odin says snorri is highest and first born among gods he rules over all things and the other gods however mighty serve him as children serve their father beside him is frigg his wife who is also a power of the sky and perhaps the ruler of the clouds the scene changes and odin is found once more upon earth as a stranger at gerod's doors he appears in the form best known to men grey-bearded and clad in blue mantle and broad-brimmed hat but he is unrecognized by gerud here the poem opens with the tortured god sitting between the fierce heat of two fires craving one draught of water from agnar's hands to cool his parched lips before he can answer the questions of his tormentors concerning the secret and holy places of the world from time to time the narrative is broken by a cry from the god to his faithful valkyries who even now bear refreshing ale to the chosen warriors in valhalla to his kinsmen who are assembling as was their wont to drink in the sea halls of Egir. how he is at last delivered from his painful situation is left uncertain owing to the obscurity of stanzas forty two and forty five to a like skilful hand belong the magnificent strophes in which grimnir reveals himself to gerud as odin the highest god where the poet shows him as the one who in different ages and for different beings has many aspects and many names in his character as heaven god he is odin wafter tree rocker wind roar as ruler in asgarth they call him the high one equal ranked third highest he is the life and source of all things the maker the all-father he rules the world as the watcher from window shelf he comes forth from valhalla as the death father and goes to battle as war father host leader helm bearer to evil giants he appears as the dread one bale worker flashing eyed flaming eyed both gods and men know the wanderer grey beard long beard broad hat as welcomer he has many a love adventure as hoodwinker form changer wizard he is the great master of magic he is moreover the god of culture the sage and wise one the counsellor or poet who has won the song mead and even bestowed the gift of poesy upon men this glorious monotheistic hymn reminds us of some indian poet singing of krishna countless mystic forms unfolding in one form in such protean fashion the supreme god of every mythology has the right to change his shape and assume the powers and attributes of lesser beings it is unusual however for an old northern mythologist to show such appreciation of this truth he is usually content with presenting a god now in this light now in that and each of the different poems which relate to odin will reveal him more fully in some one of the above characters here the masked one has veiled his godhead and suffered torment in order to instruct and enlighten mankind grimnir begins his recital of old lore by enumerating the homes of the gods which usually correspond with the characters of their owners all the principal deities are mentioned except frigg who as we are told elsewhere has her dwelling in the halls of moisture where perhaps she rules the clouds loki also is omitted for the airy fire demon had no resting place until he was bound in the underworld odin is here the warfather who shows the true viking spirit of an old norse hero his home is valhalla the hall of the slain described in stanzas eight through ten and twenty through twenty four it is seen from afar standing high in asgarth overshadowed by yggdrasil and surrounded by the air river thund which roars and thunders when the dead are brought through by the valkyries this dwelling is reserved for the chosen sons of odin who have been slain in strife other dead folk pass to the underworld of hell snorri says drawing his information mainly from this passage and other extant poems quote, 
All the warriors who have fallen in battle since the beginning of the world come to Odin and Valhalla. A great host is there assembled, and more shall gather. Yet they will seem too few when Fenrir the wolf is let loose at Ragnarok, the doom of the gods. They have for food the flesh of a sooty black bear called Sehrimnir, which will never be consumed, however great the throng in Valhalla. Each day he is boiled in Eldrimnir, the fire-smoked cauldron, by Andromnir, the sooty-faced cook and every evening he becomes whole again but odin partakes not of the same food as his chosen warriors he gives the portion from his table to two wolves greed and ravener for he himself needs no food but wine is his meat and drink two ravens sit perched on his shoulder and whisper to him tidings of what they have seen and heard thought and memory are their names he sends them flying each day over all the world and at breakfast time they return thus he is made ware of the things which come to pass and is called by mortals the raven god the chosen warriors have a drink which like their food is never failing but they drink not water for how should all father bid kings and earls and other mighty men to his halls and give them naught but water a great price would it seem to those who had suffered wounds and death to get such a draught for their pains but there stands a she-goat called hadrun over the roof of valhalla biting leaves from the shelterer's boughs mead flows from her teats into a vessel so huge that all the chosen warriors can drink their fill when they are not drinking they hold sport each morning they put on their war gear and take their weapons and go forth into the courtyard and there fight and lay one another low and play thus till breakfast time when they go back and sit them down to drink these daily conflicts it would seem are but a preparation for the last great conflict at ragnarok valhalla as a paradise is the ideal of the west in contrast to that of the east it is no home of rest but one of conflict and strenuous endeavour where the warriors fight on higher planes the same battles that they fought upon earth still with the same hope of achievement and honour still with the delight in the struggle itself which is never finished even the alternating periods of bliss have no resemblance to the passive nirvana state but are like the ale which the old norsemen drank at their revels deep and intoxicating draughts of active material enjoyment in stanza seven odin as husband of saga the seeress is a god of wisdom and perhaps the by-name which we omitted propped that one who utters was used with intent but the story attached to it is unknown it is perhaps only another version of the mimir myth where the god draws his wisdom from sacred waters page two eighty seven full of pictorial beauty is the scene of odin and saga drinking peacefully from the fount of knowledge three sons of odin are mentioned thor stands a four who as wielder of the great thunder hammer owns the home of strength vidar stands her seventeen called by snorri the silent god who lives in wild wood home and baldr stands a twelve whose dwelling place is fair and shining as his face and pure as the heart of him who is the best and the most loved of all the gods two gods ul and forseti stanzas five and fifteen play little part in old norse mythology but were well known among other germanic tribes ul as the great archer owns the land of yew trees which were used for making bows he is called olerus by saxo and is said to have been given both the name and kingdom of odin when the latter was banished for practising magic for seti is the son of balder and nanna his cult may be traced among the frisians in heligoland which is called by latin writers for land the god had his temple and holy places and the people told legends of a culture hero sprung from the gods who came once and taught them justice and frisian right the owner of vala shelf stanza six is not clearly indicated many obscure myths have attached themselves to the name of heimdall who was primarily a god of light as such he is warder of the gods 
and sits at the end of heaven to guard the bridge Bifrust against the giants. Loki taunts him with this arduous life, page 263, but he had also his pleasant home of Heaven Hill. Frey and Freya, with their father Njord, belong to the gentler tribe of gods called Wanes, Vanir, distinguished from the war gods, or Isir. Frey, stanza five, as god of summer fruitfulness, dwells in a home of sunshine among the elves. Freya, stanza fourteen, who has here assumed the powers of Frigg, rules in Folkfield, while Njord, the peaceful sea god, has made his home in Noatun beside the ocean. One dwelling place, Sound Home, stanza eleven, is not found in Asgarth, the god's realm, but in Jutunheim, or Giant Land, which is always associated with the stirring sounding elements of nature. The famous story of Thiazi and his daughter Skadi is given later on. After describing his own home and the joyous life there, Grimnir, tortured by fiery heat, calls to mind the cool rushing waters which flow from Roaring Kettle, the central fountain of the world, which brings him to the holiest of all places, the doomstead of the gods, where they assemble daily to hold counsel and judgment here also are two other fountains the well of mimir whence odin draws his wisdom and the well of weird with the norns who dwell beside it shaping the lives of men overhead rises the world tree yggdrasil which grimnir has just called by the name which in his torment most appealed to him the shelterer he remembers now its sufferings the fair green boughs which stretch over the heavens and whence fall the dews of life are being gnawed by spiteful hearts the roots springing no man knows how deep are torn by the fierce dragon of the underworld and the mighty stem which rises like the central column of the universe rots and suffers from decay in all ages and among many peoples has been traced this reverence for a tree first as the embodiment of the tree spirit the home of vegetative life and lastly as typifying the source of spiritual life yggdrasil is sometimes the world tree which embraces the universe of space and time here behind the poetic fancies which are peculiar to old norse mythology it stands in grand outlines as the symbol of all creation groaning and travailing together in death but quickened and renewed with never-failing life a well-ordered scheme of old norse cosmology meets with a difficulty in stanza thirty one the realms of hell of jutunheim and of mankind which lie beneath the three roots of yggdrasil are there clearly conceived as on one level and bordering on each other but elsewhere pages two forty and two ninety one hell is stated to be underground other passages suggest that there was a confusion between an old germanic idea of hell situated beneath the earth and the scandinavian notion of hell and jutunheim in the bleak and terrible regions of the north and east divided from midgarth the home of men and asgarth the home of gods by great rivers which flowed from roaring kettle it is now that odin stanza thirty six cries aloud to his war maidens the valkyries they are choosers of the slain winged beings who attend the conflict who slay the fey or doomed ones and bring them to odin's hall a song worthy of these battle maidens is given to them in hjal's saga let us wind let us wind the web of darts fare we forth to wade through the host where our friends are crossing weapons let us wind let us wind the web of darts where the banners of the warriors are streaming and thus weaving the web of war they foretell who shall stand and who shall fall on the bloody field their more peaceful office is to serve the chosen warriors at their feast in valhalla grimnir then resumes his narrative still craving for coolness and shelter from the burning heat he tells of the weary sun horses refreshed in their labours by a delicious chill which is given by the gods to lighten their toil of earth protected by a mysterious shadow-maker whose nature is unknown of sun herself 
who fares swiftly as one in fear but has a home of refuge where she may hide herself from her tormentor the grim wolf skull the next strophes which recount the creation of the world are best considered with the words of the mighty weaver where they are also found page forty seven forty three and forty four have little bearing on the context the story of the wielder's sons is famous in old norse mythology and a frequent topic of allusion snorri relates how loki the mischief-maker had once cut off the golden hair of sif the thunderer's wife and to appease the latter had gone down to the dwarf race called dark elves the wielder's sons and persuaded them to forge her a wig of gold they made this with other treasures so wonderful that loki never weary of stirring up strife wagered his head with two dwarfs called brook the badger and sindri the sparkler that they could not make aught as fine thereupon the twain set to work and forged three treasures although loki sought to hinder them and changed himself into a fly which settled upon brook and stung him as he was blowing the furnace when all were complete loki and the dwarves brought the treasures to asgarth to settle the wager and the gods went to their thrones of doom to hear the judgment of odin thor and frey which none could gainsay the work of the dark elves was first set forth and to odin loki gave gungnir the spear which never failed to hit the mark and to thor the golden hair for sif which would grow into the flesh as soon as it was placed upon her head and to frey the ship skidbladnir which was followed by a fair wind when the sails were set wheresoever it went it was so huge that all the gods could find room in it with their weapons and war-gear and yet one could fold it up like a cloth and put it in one's pocket then brok brought out his treasures and gave to odin the ring called draupnir saying that eight rings would drop from it every ninth night to frey he gave the boar which could run through air and sea by night and day swifter than any steed for never was night so dark nor the underworld so murk but there was light enough to go on from the gleaming of its golden bristles but the hammer which was called mjolnir broke gave to thor and told him that he might strike with it as hard as he willed no matter what lay before him and the hammer would not fail that if he hurled it away it would never miss the mark nor fly so far but he would find it there when he felt with his hand moreover that it would become so small that he could hide it if he liked in his bosom there was but one flaw in the hammer it was somewhat short in the handle then the gods gave judgment that mjolnir was the best of all treasures and the mightiest weapon of defence against the frost giants perhaps myers is right in tracing an indo-germanic myth in this tradition of the dwarf forgers they were like the cyclops of greek mythology and the air beings of the vedas personifications of natural forces who wrought weapons to aid the gods in subduing the ruder and more hostile powers most precious in each case was the thunder hammer or thunderbolt bifrust stanza forty four is a bridge between heaven and earth which snorri says is woven out of the colour of the rainbow its name signifies the trembling way from its nature as light it will scarce bear thor and must be broken at ragnarok sleipnir odin's eight-footed steed is seen in baldr's draumar bragi the mythical poet at the great banquet scene of lokasenna garm the hell-hound with his loud baying announces doom to the gods this strophe sounds like a conventional song of saws with which grimnir ends his recital end of introduction part two the sayings of grimnir introduction part three the wisdom of all wise in alvismal we pass from the fearful scene of a god in anguish to the elfland of poetic fancy here the author is little bound by traditional ideas but may exercise all his imagination and skill in describing nature who has ever fresh beauties to offer and fresh poetic themes in two particulars only has he borrowed from mythology 
he shows himself familiar with all mythical beings in the worlds of the edda and he has taken for the setting of his poem some possibly well-known story which told how thrym the daughter of thor was pledged to a dwarf by the other gods in the absence of her father this dwarf all wise is discovered hastening to the home of his betrothed rejoicing too soon at the good fortune which has won him a bride born of gods thus lost in love musing he is met by a rude and wayworn traveller thor returning on foot from some weary journey into the land of giants all wise does not recognise the father of his bride and is much injured at the harshness of thor's address he has doubtless if such vanities are permitted to dwarfs clothed himself in his best as a bridegroom and now he is taunted with the disfigurements of his race the pallor of beings who may never see the sun and the shortness of stature which gives rise to fear and hatred of their giant foes swelling with pride he stands upon his rights and even answers the irony of the ill-clad wanderer by admiring his rich attire but the god of thunder declares himself and the dwarf seeks to propitiate him by a display of wisdom thor detains him in conversation strange behaviour in one whose wonted speech is brief and stern until the sun has risen and all wise is turned into stone which is the fate of all foolish dwarfs who are caught by the first morning beam above ground thor questions all wise on the different names which are given to objects of nature by the beings of different worlds all of whom are well known to old norse mythology and reappear so constantly that it will be worth our while to make their closer acquaintance mankind occupy midgarth the middle dwelling of germanic cosmology between heaven and hell the gods born of odin's race or adopted as his children have their home in asgarth in this poem and elsewhere they are called aesir to distinguish them from the other god tribe the wains the jutuns are best known as giants but this name little describes their true character they appear sometimes it is true as three-headed monsters who walk the earth in anthropomorphic form much like the giants of grimm's fairy tales they are seen too as beautiful human creatures such as skadi who know the loves and sorrows of humankind but in old norse tradition they still retain something of what they have lost in the folklore of other germanic tribes their original character as wild forces of nature born before the controlling ordering power of the gods had been established as such they are akin to the titans or the fomors of celtic mythology their home was once in the storm in the waters amid the tumultuous elements but by the poets of the edda they have already been given a fixed habitation jutunheim a waste and desolate realm situated in the north or the east skadi alone still dwells in sound home as beings of nature they are clearly shown in the frost giants and the mountain giants in hymir lord of the dusky sea in skul and hati the wolves of darkness and the giant eagle who makes the wind they are the great opponents of the gods but not all for some have lent their powers to be used with skill and purpose for the good of all living things Ygir, ruler of the sea in its milder moods provides the gods with drink and is even numbered among them mimir gives a draught to odin from his fount of wisdom the norns who dwell by the tree of fate are weaving strands of life asgarth itself is built by a giant smith odin learns the fate of baldr from a giantess and seeks giant maidens as his wives for the gods cannot dispense with the power of the jutuns they are dependent moreover on another race of beings the dwarfs who forge their treasures and cunning weapons for this myth also we must seek an explanation in the instinctive beliefs or intuitions which man keeps with him from his earliest days till superstitious fancy ends in knowledge his sense of unity with nature the feeling that earth and air are filled with a life in some way akin to his own but made visible only in its workings the dwarfs and elves are in contrast to the jutuns the secret silent forces unseen agents who toil beneath the ground and possess the hidden treasures of the earth or creatures of air who make their homes in mountains woods and fields 
and who appear in such fairy form that beautiful as an elf became a customary phrase in different tongues snorri speaks of the dark elves or dwarfs and the light elves who inhabit elf home and those future realms of paradise which he calls far blue and long life in early folklore they were usually beneficent beings and their presence was held as a safeguard to men but later on through christian antagonism to all heathen superstition they were regarded as malevolent sprites and became confused with evil working trolls of the other races mentioned the powers and high powers are mysterious the word regin is often used for the gods from whom they are here distinguished hell folk are the dead who have not perished in war and who have therefore no place in valhalla but must pass to those regions of the underworld called hell which in later tradition was given to a goddess of that name thor questions all wise concerning thirteen different objects which fall into pairs earth and heaven moon and sun clouds and wind calm and sea fire and wood corn and the ale which is brewed from barley night alone is without her fellow day either because dwarfs may not see him or because too soon he will appear each object is described in six different terms such as might be used by the inhabitants of the different worlds though to us their fitness is not always apparent sometimes however they show careful discrimination on the part of the poet men use the more ordinary names and thor also employs these elves call heaven the fair roof because it stretches over their home in the air jutuns call moon the hastener for he is pursued always by one of their own kindred the great wolf hati while dwarfs who are permitted to look on his soft light call him the shimmerer but sun who plays hide and seek with them is the dallier's playmate the synonyms do not belong to the ordinary poetic diction of skalds but with a dainty touch and a delicate play of language the poet of avismal employs an art which is clearly his own showing individual love and observation of nature end of introduction part three the wisdom of all wise introduction part four the words of the mighty weaver vafthrudrismal like alvismal is a song of nature but more in accordance with traditional ideas it is a poetical interpretation of old norse mythology which has suffered change from that existent among the people with its unquestioning belief in elves and giants dwarfs and trolls as veritable beings who helped and hindered their doings for day and night winter and summer are here the wonderful giants of a fairy tale rimy mane and shining mane are never found in folklore nor the great eagle who makes the wind the most lifelike figure in the poem is that of mighty weaver a giant sage unutterably old and unutterably wise the personification of all experience who sits on his throne throughout the ages waiting to be questioned by those who dare enter his presence in old norse tradition there are no legends of inspired prophets who in visions have been allowed to look into the future of the world or of singers who have been given utterance in divine madness the mysteries of nature are hidden deep in her own bosom and shared only by those beings who are nearest akin to her and draw their wisdom from its source or those who by long familiarity have learned their ways knowledge must be sought from bird or beast from souls of the dead who have gone back to their home in nature but above all from the giants that ancient race who were born even before the earth and were made of like substance there was one other way indeed though scarce permitted in which it was deemed possible to attain wisdom through magic spells such as those used by witches when they sat out enchanting like the vala page two eighty seven and compelled the night powers to give up their secrets odin has now resolved to contend with the giant whose knowledge is a race heritage but frigg is fearful as to the issue for the contest is no mock one odin though a god is not all wise by nature but has to learn borrow buy and even steal his wisdom disguised as riddle reader he enters the giant's hall and stands on the floor with an assumption of humility until he has proved his right to sit beside the mighty weaver if the latter had known the nature of his guest 
he would scarce have asked the wind god concerning powers of the sky and the steeds of light and darkness which odin well knows day and night in this form as we have already noticed are only a late invention of poets though they were undoubtedly objects of superstition among germanic races and sometimes conceived as animals in german poetry day is a beast or bird who tears the clouds of darkness with his claws in anglo-saxon he is a raven who blithe-hearted announces the joy of heaven the language used at all times to describe the ever-recurring phenomena of day and night show that they were felt as living personalities whose presence was not merely visible but could be heard in its mysterious movements in old english day glides and climbs clangs and hastens and pushes on in modern english it still breaks and peeps in german it gathers strength erstarket or turns aside erfendet night sinks and falls and in anglo-saxon wears a shadow helm the old norse lay of sigdrifa has a greeting to dawn which sounds like an ancient hymn and prayer for divine aid hail day hail sons of day hail night and the daughter of night with eyes of blessing behold us now and grant us victory who sit here sun and moon belong to part two of this poem but may be mentioned here for they have undergone a change corresponding to that of day and night caesar notes their worship among the old germans whose religion in a period better known was far removed from any pure nature worship and one in which sun and moon no longer play any prominent part their humiliation is recounted by snorri in a myth the gods were wroth because the sun and moon took to themselves such mighty names and set them in their places in heaven where they could only move on their appointed course sol or sunne is still a goddess the sister or companion of the moon god she is drawn in her chariot by the horses early woke and all fleet and is pursued by the wolf skull while mani who rules the changes of the moon called nai and ni stands at twenty-five is followed by hati but the glory of sun the myths which tell of her ever-renewed conflicts and triumphs over darkness her wealth and her bounty have been transferred to the more anthropomorphic gods baldr odin frey and freya who each in turn represent the sun deity though openly deprived of their dominion traces of sun and moon worship linger in old customs and folklore the power of moon though somewhat impersonal is apparent in superstitions practices which have hardly died out his waxing and waning was regarded as influential for good and ill on the doings of mankind that which required growth and increase was undertaken while he was waxing money was counted weddings took place and seed was planted which bore fruit above ground but with the waning moon timber was felled grass was mown charms were used against pestilence and the seed planted whose fruit ripened beneath the ground stanza twenty seven is the only passage in the poems which speaks of winter and summer as personal beings though at one time they were doubtless regarded as such the custom of crowning a may king or queen and the expulsion of winter represented by a victim or an effigy are recollections of the days when both were powers who had to be propitiated and coerced by ceremonies and magic the conflict between winter and summer has become in the edda a struggle between the gods and the jutuns and especially between thor and the frost giants the last question of the giant stanza seventeen concerns the future when this is answered he admits the wisdom of his guest and invites him to a seat on the throne but riddle reader has so far only proved himself equal to his opponent he must now show himself superior the first questions are comparatively easy who should know better than the old giant how earth was framed from his forefather ymir in the beginning relates snorri there was naught but muspelholm the world of fire in the south and mistholm the region of ice and snow in the north and between them the yawning deep called ginunga gap then ymir the first jutun was born he arose from the melting poison drops of the chill river stormy billow which flowed southward towards muspelholm in due time he begot children stanza thirty three 
but before long arose another race of nobler kind once when the cow called audumbla was licking salt from a rock there appeared a man's hair then his head and at length his whole form this was boor father of boor whose son by the giantess besla was odin thus the gods were born or evolved like those of many other mythologies after a first imperfect creation they slew ymir and made the world out of his mighty frame while all the other giants were drowned in his blood except bergelm who was laid in some mysterious object here rendered as cradle stanza thirty five and thus saved from the flood snorri has many details which are not given in vathrudnismal and modern critics have still further completed a picture of the deluge with bergelm floating on its bloody billows in a noah's ark perhaps of scandinavian type or translating icelandic luther as flower bin of a great world mill in which the giants were ground up for the making of the world but the poem is aware of no such studied myth it alludes vaguely to some great epoch when the everlasting war began between the gods and the jutuns when natural powers were first made subject to godlike ends the mighty weaver has now proved his knowledge of giant lore and is asked concerning the history and life of the gods he remembers the first great war between their kindred races the gentle wains or gods of culture and the warlike Isir, see also page two eighty three which ended with exchange of hostages and the admittance of njord among the Isir. he knows too as well as humble earth folk that when the wind is heard roaring overhead on stormy nights odin the lord of valhalla the victory father is holding sport with his chosen warriors this most famous of old norse myths is not peculiar to scandinavia it is found in britain in connection with king arthur and among the superstitions of somerset where however a somewhat close resemblance suggests direct borrowing from old norse sources more original is the widespread superstition among german peasants of the furious host or wild hunt which was heard passing through the air led by an old man sometimes visible in his broad-brimmed hat who rode a white or black horse and was called by the name of wode or wote both versions have arisen from the blending of different ideas the souls of those who died appeared to be withdrawn into the world of nature from whence they had come in woods by streams among mountains their presence was detected and they dwelt in companionship with elves and water sprites but most of all they haunted the air odin as wind god became lord of these spirits but especially of the dead warriors since he was also the god of battle and those slain on the field were dedicated to him and called guests of odin his valkyries as we have already mentioned used to ride through the air at his bidding and choose from the battlefield those who were worthy of a summons from the war god the questions now become more abstruse they touch on the future history of the world and the reign of new powers after the great doom which is foretold in the soothsaying of the vala even in the present untroubled lay which seems only to rejoice in the life and powers of nature weird is already visible to the giant he knows its end but there is one secret which he does not know and which all have failed to divine a secret hidden between god and god which odin whispered in baldur's ear as he laid him on the bale fire in words which only the dead could hear the very question reveals the personality of the god the weaver admits his defeat and it is shown that odin has thus far attained all the knowledge which can be won by experience and learned by tradition in the next poem it will be seen how in mysterious fashion he attains the wisdom which more properly belongs to him as a god end of introduction part four the words of the mighty weaver introduction part five the words of odin the high one another poem introducing some of the more remarkable and interesting myths is havamal or the words of the high one it has been subjected to almost more discussion than any other poem of the edda but all the ingenuity of critics and scholars has not cleared it from mystery and confusion it has served rather to show how superficial and fragmentary is our knowledge of the history the myths and the soul life of the early germanic races 
For although this poem, with its wisdom of yesterday and tomorrow, myths which are purely Scandinavian, ideas which can only be Christian, may belong to different periods, it seems to be archaic in the main. The same half obsolete words occur in the various parts, and the teaching is traditional, proverbial, such as might have been handed down by word of mouth. Moreover, Odin or Woden appears not as the warfather of the skalds, but in his more universal character as the god of culture. As such, he was best known to all the Germanic tribes and to the Romans, who identified him with their god Mercury. Wednesday or Woden's Day, corresponding with Dies Mercurii. The varying metre and style of the poem, its discrepancies, and abrupt changes of subject prove it to be a collection of once separate fragments. Attempts have been made to distinguish between these, but there are only three well-marked divisions. One, stanzas one through 108, the guest rules, in which are included ethical laws and Odin's love adventures. Two, stanzas 108 to 136, the counselling of stray singer. Three, Odin's quest after the runes. Parts two and three are linked together by the entrance of stray singer into both and all the three by a poetical fiction in which it is assumed that odin the high one is speaker throughout and that the precepts are given with divine authority it is indeed in the person of odin himself that a real unity can be claimed for the poem it would seem that its final author who was more teacher than poet possibly a christian monk with a taste for antiquarian knowledge had a mind not merely to collect the wise sayings of heathen lore but to show forth odin the heathen god in a higher and more spiritual aspect than that of the warfather he had none of the poetic imagination of the author of grimnismal to picture in rainbow strophes the manifold nature of the god in a loose and inartistic way he has associated traditional sayings and mythical stories freely admitting the later and more christian seeming ideas to a place beside the old he has not however altogether failed in his aim for notwithstanding the signs of christian influence which have caused the poem to be rent in pieces by criticism and held as a haphazard collection of fragments new and old odin reveals himself still a heathen and emerges from a web of heathen thought steeped in the magic of old charms and runes in the whole teaching of the poem which is filled with sober beauty and wisdom there is no creed save that of humanity in part one odin comes as guest to a hall and it is assumed gives friendly counsel to those assembled within in his character of wind wanderer he often passes thus unrecognized through all the worlds with loki and hunir he is often found adventuring in giant land and comes to the dwellings of men calling himself guest the sagas tell how he visited many kings and rulers of norway under this title to the christian king olaf the holy he was an object of terror and hate as the dread heathen god of enchantments who still lived and could be exercised only by the more potent spell of the mass book far have i fared much have i ventured said odin and it was thus as wanderer beggar guest that he learned the ways of the world and the hearts of men laws of love friendship and war are expressed often with epigrammatic humour sometimes with a tender half-pitying knowledge of life the first part and the advice given to stray singer in the second are full of sayings and maxims which agree almost word for word with the wisdom of solomon or other ethical teachers for they are of the nature of those simple truths which take up their abode with mankind so soon as he has learned humanity and fellowship but unlike the teaching of the eastern prophet there is nothing of religious duty no aspiring after an ideal of perfection the sober precepts of common sense are never interrupted by sudden upward soarings and yearnings of passion the wisdom of odin in this part is the wisdom drawn from experience historically the poem is of immense value we are taken far back into real life and meet people no longer in a world of myth and speculation but on the firm ground of daily existence customs manners social duties and relations are brought before us corresponding closely sometimes with what tacitus wrote in the germania about the race in the first century 
and it is seen from his descriptions that stanzas eleven seventeen forty one allude to what was especially characteristic of the old germans stanza one fifty five also refers to a curious practice mentioned by him the german warriors advanced to meet their foes like the giant hrim page two ninety three with shields lifted to the level of their lips as a sounding board for their song they sung gently at first letting the sound swell out until it became like the roar of the sea inspiring terror and rousing their own courage other customs are typically northern the word for court mentioned in stanza sixty one is ving a name for the great assembly or parliament of the norsemen which was most democratic in character here were settled the laws of the land and private cases were tried with no lack of ceremony and red tape though matters frequently ended in a duel or a free fight between the two parties in stanza eighty four we come to the love quests of odin in which the high one has descended from his height and laid all dignity aside his love is not even the idealized love of the medieval knight-errant but like that of zeus the pastime of the god there may once have been some underlying motive in these tales of odin and his giant wives explaining his conduct as that of some fickle power of nature but here he figures only as the favourite of the skalds the love adventurer who knew as well as any the chances and mischances of love we may imagine that our author selected one of these skaldic poems which contain the famous story of how odin won the art of poesy for men by making love to the giantess gunlod but unfortunately for the dignity of the god he included also the other episode with billing's daughter but here too he may be intending to record one of the most important incidents in eddic mythology which led to the birth of vali baldur's avenger we have allusion in the edda pages one fifty nine and two forty three to odin's courtship of rind saxo grammaticus tells more fully of his ardent wooing in a story which so closely resembles the above as to suggest that billing's nameless daughter is rind although the one is seemingly of dwarf rind the other according to saxo a giantess the tale of this crafty maiden who thrice outwitted odin is here told in delicately suggestive scenes enlivened by amused disappointment or passionate regret according as we choose to regard it for the explanation of the other story snorri's help is required although as usual we find a myth so disguised by later editions that any interpretation is doubtful in the peace treaty between Isir and wains the gods created a wise being called kvasir who was slain by certain dwarfs and from whose blood was brewed the mead of poetic inspiration called soul stirrer this passed into the hands of sutung a giant of the underworld who gave it into the care of his daughter gunlod to guard deep down in the earth odin in the character of bale worker hired himself to sutung's brother and was promised the mead as his wage he must fetch it however for himself and after boring his way through the rock with rati the owl he gained admittance to gunlod three nights he lay with her and three draughts she gave him of the mead in which he drank the whole then disguised as an eagle he bore it safely to asgarth despite the giant who followed so hard after him that a few drops of the precious liquid were spilt and thenceforth deemed worthy only for the makers of bad poetry snorri does not finish the story nor tell how the frost giants came storming to asgarth knowing that bale worker was there who had stolen the mead it was thus that poesy was won for gods and men and was given the name so often used by skalds odin's craft or odin's drink and thus as ever a great power is first found in possession of the jutuns and must be won by the gods before it becomes serviceable to man in soul stirrer we meet with the most primitive ideas a drink producing a divine madness is found among many peoples and familiar is the notion that intellectual or spiritual powers can be gained by drinking the blood of their owners odin's discourse is now broken off by the writer of part two who states that while listening in the most sacred spot the well of weird he was able to see and hear what went on in the world of men and in the high one's hall where odin was giving instruction to a mythical poet called lodfafnir or stray singer but the well of weird 
is a fount of wisdom known to all poets and seers a secret place of communion with the divine where all the strands of life present past and future are revealed and the writer is merely claiming divine authority for his words by the use of mythological language he describes inspired moments when things hidden to others were made known to him the counsel to stray singer is of much the same character as the last set of maxims though in expression they seem less archaic especially when compared with strophes such as eighty through eighty two eighty four and eighty six they sound more like skaldic verses than the saws of old time which are again heard in the charms of stanza one hundred thirty six very different in tone is the solemn opening of part three in the midst of half humorous half serious words of warning and advice a recital of love tales and charms we come suddenly upon this awful and mysterious scene of a god offering himself in sacrifice upon the world tree in order to attain the maturity of his wisdom and power the whole passage is full of mystery which we have not attempted to elucidate by rearrangement or ingenious translations nor is this the place to discuss the vexed question as to whether with all the earlier authorities in some old and mystic legend we are entering the very sanctuary of heathendom or whether with buge meyer golter it is merely a scene borrowed from the christian sacrifice where tree and spear must be identified with cross and lance there is no other record of the deed in northern mythology except an old song from the shetland isles quoted by buge in confirmation of his own theory whether it is genuinely archaic we cannot say nine days he hang padarutless tree for ill wist da folk in good was he a bloody myot within his side made with a lance at wid na hide nine lang nichts in da nippen rhyme hang he there with his naked limb some day loich bit ithers grit this without doubt is a description of the crucifixion but leads to no conclusion as to which of the two has borrowed its details from the other the sacrifice depicted resembles in many points the human sacrifices that were offered to odin in this if we may take that of king vichar described in gautrek's s chapter seven as typical the victim was hung on the branch of a tree and stabbed with a spear which is as intimately associated with odin as the hammer with thor there will be better hope of an explanation of this passage or at least a more fruitful result when the discussion no longer centres around the exact meaning of yggdrasil and of the windy tree the labours of research will then perhaps be given to finding the origin of a strange and world-wide legend without which no mythology seems complete this legend in outline is of a god call him odin balder osiris ishtar adonis who must be sacrificed or voluntarily die in order that he may rise again in fullness of power or even give place to some new god sometimes it is clear that he typifies the beneficent powers of nature whether as the sun or the spring or summer fruitfulness but occasionally as here his significance is more doubtful when our knowledge of comparative mythology is extended and when all these legends have been arranged in due order beginning with the early superstitious rite of savages ending with a reinterpreted idea of philosophy some rightful place will then be claimed for the myths of balder and of odin the sacrifice of the god was made for the sake of attaining the runes by this word is usually understood the letters of the old germanic alphabet but its earliest meaning must have been something softly spoken whispered or rounded in the ear it was especially used for those metrical charms which preserved from all danger whosoever whispered or chanted them as civilization advanced and the art of writing was learned these charms were inscribed in characters cut in stone or wood and thus seemed to lend to the characters themselves a magic power the transmission of thought by writing must have seemed strange and supernatural to the uninitiated and the name of runes was soon applied to letters of the alphabet among many nations of the past there has been a lawful and unlawful use of the supernatural a distinction between white magic and black magic to the latter class belong the evil spells which one man wrought for the destruction of another stanza one fifty 
such practice of magic was the unpardonable sin in the old ethical code of the germans and was punished by burning according to saxo odin himself was banished for a while from asgarth because he won rind his giant wife by magic craft but the use of supernatural power was permitted in prayer or in the divine rites performed by priests and in this passage runes also seem to have been a lawful agent through which a power above nature could be compelled and used by the individual kaufmann suggests that runes of this kind were mystic names for objects which expressed their essence and being and which gave control over nature to the initiated in strophes one thirty eight and one thirty nine are recorded odin's attainment of three kinds of wisdom upon which he grew and throve one the runes two mimir's wisdom for which he pledged his eye three soul stirrer the mead of song with regard to the last it is clear that we have here some variant and perhaps older myth than that of one o three to one o eight a passage in the heroic poem of sigrif fumal although it cannot be fully explained throws suggestive lights on the subject and shows the intimate connection of the threefold wisdom and the purpose of odin's sacrifice with the help of moisture from hodrofnir that is a draught from mimir's well odin is said to have read graved and thought out the runes then they were cut off and mingled with soul stirrer or the gift of song and sent on far ways where they are found with the gods and found with the elves some with wains and some with men in the different accounts there seems to be one fundamental idea by self-sacrifice and toil odin drew a shapeless and unordered knowledge from nature upon which he grew and throve and then gave it back through the medium of his divinity interpreted and rendered serviceable to all things it is unlikely that the earliest thinkers ever arrived at a defined notion of this kind but they uttered in the language of fairy tale their belief that the gods were saving ordering powers who stood between them and nature with the spells which begin in stanza one forty five there is a change of tone and style suggesting that they belong to a once separate poem stanza one fifty eight where odin can hardly be the speaker seems to confirm this view the second poem was added to supply the nine mighty rune songs alluded to it in stanza one hundred thirty nine although eighteen are thus given the songs mentioned below whose words are unknown must have been such as those sung by groa to day spring page one fifty nine or like the old merseburger brucher which is found in a german manuscript of the tenth century in this odin or woden heals the foot of baldur's foal singing bone to bone blood to blood limb to limb as if they were limed stanza one fifty eight seems the utterance of the poet himself if mullenhoff's explanation is correct that folk stirrer is the dwarf who day by day is surprised and vanquished by the dawn and who in some wondrous song of praise announces the conquering powers of light and life the poet himself claims knowledge of this mystic song to give dignity to his own the reappearance of stray singer in stanza one sixty two is a clumsy device of the author to unite the different parts in stanza one sixty four an epilogue such as those with which skalds were wont to end their recitals end of introduction part five the words of odin the high one introduction Part six The Lay of Hymir Himiskviva has been chosen to introduce and illustrate the character of Thor, because it shows him in truer though less familiar aspect than the famous Lay of Thrym. Two or perhaps three motifs are combined in this lay. The first recounts how Thor fetches the great cauldron for the gods to drink. They are all assembled after their hunting expedition to consult the oracle and learn where they shall make their banquet according to old germanic custom the twigs which have been sprinkled with sacrificial blood and graven with runes are cast on a cloth and by the manner of their falling it is shown to the gods that they will find plenty in the halls of Egir. it is a momentous occasion for not only have they chosen their banqueting room for all time but they must win the alliance of the wild sea giant Egir, who from henceforth will be numbered among them as the god of ocean in its gentler moods his fierce wife ran who remains hostile and catches drowned men in her net 
is well known to skalds, as are also his nine children, the waves. Thor, a strange ambassador of the peace, is sent to greet the giant, who is found sitting on the rocks in proud contemplation of his daughters, the merry sparkling waves tumbling one over the other in their sport. When his peace is broken by the harsh voice of the thunderer, demanding his wealth for the gods small wonder that he takes offence and bids them find a cauldron for their drink as usual the wants of the gods must be supplied by the jutuns the only kettle large enough is in possession of the frost giant hymir who shall be sent on this new errand but much enduring thor he sets forth with tyr who is here called kinsman of giants but elsewhere the son of odin though perhaps only one of the chosen sons of the war-father speedily they harness thor's famous goats tooth gnasher and tooth grinder and swiftly they drive to the borders of giant land where the rumbling car and goats must be left behind while they cross the river which flows between asgarth and jutunheim and fare on foot to hymir's halls the frost giant refuses to give up the great kettle until thor has proved his might by breaking a cup of wondrous strength and this the god not without help from the friendly wife at last performs thus having won the cauldron thor and tyr return to the banquet but while they are still in jutunheim another episode is introduced that of thor's fishing expedition he has consumed all hymir's store of provisions with an appetite like that which he displays in the courts of thrym and therefore volunteers to go fishing the next day in a manner characteristic of the god whose deeds are all on colossal scale he fares to the wood and slays the biggest ox he can find called heaven hitter to provide the fishing bait thor has designs upon a nobler prey than mere fish or even whales and he compels the reluctant giant to row further and further out to sea but snorri who has already supplied some of the particulars must be allowed to describe this incident in his graphic manner Quote, they made such way that soon hymir said that they had reached the place where he was wont to stop and fish but thor was fain to row much further and they fared swiftly onward with vigorous strokes presently hymir said that they were so far out now that it would be perilous to stay on account of the great world serpent called midgarth's worm but still thor declared that he must row on a while and did so while the giant waxed sullen and was filled with gloom at length thor laid up his oars and made ready a fishing line exceedingly strong with a hook no slighter and not a whit less strong he baited it with the ox head and cast it overboard where it sank to the bottom now in truth it may be said that the world serpent was beguiled for he opened wide his jaws and gaped at the ox head and the hook stuck fast in his gums as soon as he became aware of this he lashed out and tugged so furiously that thor's hand slid over the gunwale then was the thunderer wroth he girt him with all his god's might and stamped so hard that with both his feet he leapt through the bottom of the boat and found himself standing on the ground he pulled the monster up to the gunwale and it may well be said that none has ever seen a more fearful sight than this when thor set eyes on the serpent and the serpent glared back at him from below and breathed out poison tis said that hymir changed hue and grew pale for he was appalled when he beheld the serpent and saw the waves flowing into the boat at the very moment when thor raised his hammer aloft the giant groped for his knife and cut the line in twain over the side and the serpent sank back into the sea thor threw his hammer after it and some say struck his head off but others say with truth that the world serpent still lives and lies beneath the sea End quote. Snorri goes on to tell us how Thor slew the giant, which would not have suited our present author's design, who, as already noticed, completes the first story and introduces an episode to which Snorri refers, another of Thor's adventures, which occurred when he was on his way to Utgarth Loki. He had stopped for the night at a peasant's, probably Egil, mentioned in stanza five, where, as usual, he killed his goats for the evening meal, but ordered the bones to be carefully preserved the peasant's son however broke one to get at the marrow and in the morning when thor brought his goats to life again by hallowing the bones with his hammer one of the animals was found to be lame 
the peasant trembled when he saw the thunderer grow wroth and draw his bushy brows down over his eyes in atonement he was obliged to give his children thialfi the digger and ruskva the swift one to be thenceforth the servants of thor in the poem stanza thirty nine this takes place on the return journey with the cauldron at first sight the lay of hymir seems to have lost its connection with mythology and to be a mere fairy tale about giants who are real giants and heroes with human appetites and human passions common fairy tale motifs are introduced such as the good wife who conceals guests from her husband and betrays his secrets the writer scarcely regards his story from a humorous or artistic point of view but like some child he tells it with a simple air of conviction and a delight in the incidents which obscure the original nature myth but the outlines of this nature myth may still be traced the more clearly because of the faithful repetition of strange and impossible facts it is the story of how the god of thunder goes to release the storm clouds from their winter bondage and brings them into summer realms filled with summer showers of rain explanation might also be found for some of the details the cup which had to be broken is perhaps the ice-bound sea but there is so much which is mere fancy that further interpretation becomes dangerous it is mainly through combining the separate adventures of thor that the poet has secured for his fairy tale a high place among the mythological poems for whether consciously or unconsciously he has given us the most complete picture of thor the god the latter as son of odin and jord is the offspring of heaven and earth and his character is twofold human and divine thor whose name is derived from vunor thunder shows himself to men in the aspect of a heaven god when they hear the rushing of his chariot wheels in the storm and in the lightning see the swift blow of his hammer for like indra zeus and jupiter he is armed with a destructive thunderbolt but though terrible in his might he is feared only by evil beings to those who ally themselves with the gracious gods his appearance is ever welcome for it means that the winter powers are dispersed and in his fierce accents they hear the promise of summer rain among the gods he is protector of asgarth and midgarth the giant forces of nature quail before him and even loki the elusive fire demon is obedient to his word in such form he is shown in the myth of the cloud cauldron but thor is rightly called by the poets a son of earth he is the most human of all the gods a hercules in old norse mythology who is continually exerting himself in the service of man we can see his mighty form striding over the wastes of jutenheim where endless labors and conflicts with the giants demand his presence rude featured with gleaming eyes beneath his bushy brows with quivering red beard clad in toil-worn garb forever attempting the impossible to unbind earth to empty ocean to conquer old age he is alike glorious in victory and defeat it is this figure which is presented to us in thor's fishing adventure and in the various incidents of the poem one after another he proves himself equal to the tests of the giant he slays the oxen unaided he lands the boat and bears home the tackle and the whales he breaks the cup and finally carries off the cauldron but all these are only stupendous human tasks proofs of mere physical strength and daring yet more human is thor in his failure to catch the world serpent and in his baffled rage which is childish rather than godlike perhaps it was this weakness this striving to perform the impossible an inability to admit defeat for once again thor met with the serpent that appealed to the old norse seafarers and peasants and made him their favourite among the gods not only is this myth characteristic of the north but also the manner in which it is told or rather pictured in scenes while the curtain is allowed to drop over all the uninteresting details with the saga writers a national method of storytelling grew into a self-conscious artistic style but they never surpass the poet of Hymir's lay in impressionistic realism the entrance of the frost giant with the icicles clinging to his beard is like the sudden blast of the wintry storm sudden too and alarming is the fall of the row of mighty cauldrons and the shivering of the ice cup into a thousand pieces but most striking of all is the majestic picture of the thunderer 
as he strides forth with the great cloud kettle upon his head it is one which carlyle loved to recall Quote, thor after many adventures clapping the pot on his head like a huge hat and walking off with it quite lost in it the ears of the pot reaching down to his heels a kind of vacant hugeness large awkward gianthood characterizes that norse system enormous force yet altogether untutored stalking helpless with uncertain strides End quote. the language of the poem is rude words and sentences are ill-strung and the use of clumsy epithets makes it difficult to translate without losing its almost savage vigor in life but in the original the strength and simplicity have a wild attractive power and render it a favorite in northern literature end of introduction part six the lay of hymir introduction part seven the lay of thrym in thrymskviva we come to one of the best known and best sung of all the scandinavian myths strong and vigorous like thor striding into jutenheim crisp and clear as a northern snow scene in the sunlight this narrative poem is very perfect of its kind and needs but little explanation like the more modern saga writers the author shows an appreciation of the spirit and peculiar qualities of scandinavian literature which appear in the lay of hymir but his arrangement and choice of details is made with more conscious design he handles his subject as an artist and plays with it as a humorist throughout retaining a simplicity and rudeness which is strong but never crude thor is discovered in helpless plight his red beard quivering in impotent rage a thunder god searching vainly for his thunder hammer which the frost giants and mountain giants well know when they see it uplifted and small wonder for many a head has it broken of their forefathers and their kindred but now it is stolen and none must be told the dire secret except loki the mischievous fire god and the swiftest of all messengers who on this occasion uses his cunning in the service of the gods and soon discovers the lost treasure the hammer like the thunderbolt of superstition which is silent during the winter months is deep hidden below the earth in the keeping of the frost giant thrym nor will he surrender it until he has seen the fair spring goddess freya coming as bride to his dark realms like the sunshine which she impersonates he has never yet beheld the bright maiden though he may have heard her light footfall overhead thor hastens to her court and bids her at once put on her bridal veil not dreaming that with asgarth in danger and the precious hammer stolen she will refuse to go meekly into jutenheim but she is not so poor-spirited and flies into a rage as godlike as that of thor himself when the great sea serpent refused to be caught upon his fish-hook thor must himself fetch the hammer then heimdall who though one of the warlike aesir is as wise and far-seeing as the wains counsels that thor should deceive the frost giant disguised as freya in this scene one can almost hear the laugh that goes through asgarth at the rueful picture of the thunderer thus decked with jewels and feminine trifles his sturdy figure draped in woman's weeds thrym seems to accept his strange bride without expressing surprise perhaps because frost giants and spring goddesses have seldom a chance of meeting but thor can control his appetite as little as his temper and the giant wonders much at its capacity he wonders yet more when he stoops to kiss her and sees beneath the veil those flaming eyes half hidden by the bushy brows the wedding however must be completed the hammer which hallowed the wedding feast of man is brought forth and thor seizing it becomes once more the god and summer is first announced by the crashing thunder peal this poem is worthy of all praise for its realism and humour but it is responsible with others of its kind for the comic even ridiculous figure which has always passed for thor in the ruder lay of hymir the heroic outlines of the god are more clearly discerned the nature myth too suggested above would be unrecognisable if thor and his hammer had not elsewhere played such parts mjolnir is one of the mythical treasures forged by the dwarfs a belief in it was not confined to old norse mythology for it appears in many traditions and fairy tales of germany 
two other famous objects are mentioned freya's feather coat in stanza three and her necklace called brisingamen in stanza twelve if the story of the last could be reconstructed it might prove to be one of the most poetical in mythology it is undoubtedly old though it may not as Mullenhoff suggests date back to indo-germanic times it was known in england the earliest reference to it being in beowulf and in denmark where saxo mentions it as the property of frigg in the surla Vater we have the following story once freya mistress of odin spied a necklace lying in a cave it was the work of certain dwarfs perhaps the breezings and when she looked at it she longed to possess it they promised to give it her if she would stay with them four nights and this she did odin was angry when he discovered it and caused loki to steal the necklace from her chamber and would only give it back to her on condition that she stirred up war between two kings whence the legend of the everlasting battle the poet ulf ugesen tells in the following lines of the battle between loki and heimdall the famous and skilled one of the bridge of the powers bifrost wrestled with the evil and cunning son of farbauti loki as singastone ere the mighty son of nine mothers gained the shining necklace of sea stones what is the meaning of this fragmentary tale the shining necklace must have been a symbol of light especially the light cast upon the ocean waves we can scarcely venture like some critics to define it as the moon the morning and evening star or the rainbow it belonged to the sun goddess whether called freya frigg wife of the heaven god or gefjon for that the three were originally one is suggested by the frequent confusion between them in saxo in surlavater and in l s stanza twenty and twenty one but brisingamen in old norse tradition is the property of freya who is also called mardul or sea shining and menglud the necklace glad freya loses her necklace and heimdall the god of light wins it back for her in some conflict with darkness which was probably confused with the last fight between loki and heimdall at the doom of the gods or it may have given rise to this latter incident which is only told by snorri Mullenhoff pursues the myth of brisingamen through the story of hildr and hogni and other heroic lays which belong to more recent times end of introduction part seven the lay of thrym introduction part eight the story of skirnir the song of skirnir like those of thrym and hymir is a simple narrative poem but less severe in its outlines it is full of sentiment and even romantic in its love motif while a soft tinted nature myth still clings to it and lends a mysticism which is absent in the others it is the springtime and frey the lord of light and heat longs to embrace gerd the fair earth and to draw her away from her father's wintry halls that together they may bring forth the rich summer fruits whom shall he send as his herald but skirnir the light-bringer to bear the first greeting of the sun to earth after the long winter darkness in the north but earth is wilful and reluctant hardly will she forsake her frost-bound halls she dallies with the first tender caresses and bribes until the sun grows fierce and impatient and her heart melts in love to him who had once seemed as alien to her as the summer warmth to the winter cold the story is told in true northern fashion in a series of dramatic scenes frey discovered alone in the hall wandering aimless and lovesick and refusing speech with his kind skirnir holding speech with his horse sustaining his courage in the fear and mystery of the night journey his parley with gerd in words aflame with such passion that one sees his slight form quivering and hears his voice rise higher and higher as he passes from gentle pleading to fierce denunciation the curse itself pictures the hell of northern belief which is widely different from the fiery kingdom of other mythologies it is a far-stretching waste hemmed in by snow-clad mountains bleak and cold dark and desolate of all inhabitants save three-headed monsters or eagles rending corpses and the dim form of frost giants stalking to and fro and binding all things in their chains of ice small wonder that gerd is threatened with raving madness in this lonely land 
without speech with humankind without love without the good cheer which gladdens winter in the north there are however indications that this poem is not exclusively icelandic or norwegian the romance and sentiment are more fully expressed than is usual one or two familiar forms and objects suggest that the author had a knowledge of international literature and the best-known motifs of legend and mythology there is the watcher who greets skirnir the newcomer and demands the reason of his coming magic flickering flames are one of the perils of the way the sword which he borrowed from frey must have been one like that in beowulf or that of sigurd or other ancient weapons forged with magic craft engraven with stories of old battles and runes of protection and victory the golden apples of youth which were the property of idun and either borrowed or stolen by skirnir are scarcely known to the edda though mentioned by snorri they were a fruit little known in norway and iceland and the poet it seems also has been borrowing perhaps from the golden apples of the hesperides more peculiar to the north is another object the ring draupnir which was forged by the dwarfs it belongs to odin and the illusion shows that baldr is already slain all the different treasures are symbols of light growth fertility and other beneficent powers and the passing of them from hand to hand is commonly found in the myths of polytheism where no god is ever truly individualized but is apt to melt away in shadowy outlines assuming the form and attributes of some other god unless indeed like thor he has become so anthropomorphic as to have lost already something of his godhead frey the hero of the story was better known in sweden than in other northern lands there he was worshipped as the highest god temples were built and yearly sacrifices were offered to him frey's cult though perhaps less evident in folklore is more noticeable in history than that of odin he was especially regarded as the patron of harvests and in this aspect he is known to the eddas snorri says frey rules over the rain and the shining of the sun and the growth of fruits in the ground hence the symbols of fertility and light which skirnir is allowed to carry with him and hence too the god's gift of elf home to frey where the elf folk work his kindly will in nature see grimnismal stanza five in this poem his more original character is apparent he is the sun god who awakens earth out of her winter sleep too weak at first to melt her frozen heart stanza four and skirnir is not merely his messenger but himself in disguise the sword or sunbeam which he sent as gift to the earth maiden is now lost forever to the gods and in the possession of their giant foes at ragnarok he will seek for it in vain see loki stanza forty two but here as everywhere there is a discrepancy between the myth and its nature interpretation the symbol in the one must pass away but year by year the power of which it is the emblem will be renewed end of introduction part eight the story of skirnir introduction part nine day spring in menglud grogaldr and fjolsvinismal are found in several manuscripts none older than the seventeenth century as two separate poems but they have been associated for many reasons the one without the other is fragmentary together they give a story which is told in a danish ballad of the sixteenth century called young svendal in the first part the hero is starting forth upon a dangerous mission in the second he has accomplished his journey and arrived upon the scene of action where he attains his object no details are given of the perils of the way but it is not even necessary to assume that the strophes recounting them have been lost for a sudden dramatic opening a swift passing over of incidents are sufficiently common in the edda and require only some brief line of explanation such as then dayspring fared into jutenheim here and there are found connecting links between the two poems the object of search in part one is mengludum those joyous with necklaces stanza four and dayspring in part two wins mengluth the necklace glad if as most authorities take it both are proper names the identification is complete in stanza fourteen is prophesied dayspring's dispute with the giant warder much wise the same motif runs through the whole action 
which from beginning to end is ruled by destiny in stanza four of part one and stanza forty seven of part two this is openly expressed the issue must follow fate the doom of weird may no white withstand in no poem is the weird motive heard more clearly in none is it more distinctly seen to work in obedience to natural law menglud is often met in fairy tales as the princess who sits on a glass mountain and is won by a princely lover but with the help of young svendal the story can be reconstructed in its more original form dayspring has been sent by his stepmother to seek menglud a fair giant maiden who owns a shining necklace and is of such renown that she has long been sought by lovers in vain dayspring comes for help to his own mother's grave and stands calling her at the doorway for she has promised to aid him with the wisdom of the dead she comes forth reluctantly like all who are compelled by love or enchantments to re-enter their old haunts and standing at the gates of the tomb she sings him magic songs to render him victorious in all the difficulties which lie before him bonds shall not hold him foes shall not slay him bitter frosts on the mountains storms on the sea mists on the night journey even the spirits of dead women shall not dismay him one thing alone can hinder his desire the doom of weird which nor gods nor men can withstand the charms which she sings are rune songs such as odin knew and one which he had even used to win his giant wife rin the scene between groa and her son is characteristic of the attitude of the old norsemen towards their dead who were still regarded as a power for good or evil in their lives and whose constant presence among the living was loved or feared but never a matter of wonder or an occurrence different in kind from the ordinary events of life this supernatural influence had to be met with one of a corresponding nature hence the charms and spells cut in runes which men used against one another and to combat difficulties here ends the first fragment before the opening of the second a long interval has elapsed during which dayspring has endured untold perils and prevailed through the spell songs of his mother he has moreover though this incident is veiled in mystery met with menglud stanza five and forty nine and has lost her she sits waiting for him on the mountain top knowing that he will come back and he is seeking her with the assurance that he can break down every barrier between them the next scene opens abruptly dayspring has arrived in the gloom of night at his journey's end in the dim flickering light of magic flames he sees the giant's hall rising up before him and in front passing to and fro is outlined the dark figure of the warder the ring of fire has here a deeper signification than the wonted circle through which the princes of romance had to pass to their princess it is inherent in the myth dayspring hails much wise the watcher and is refused admittance but he will not now turn back his love is almost within sight and he stands conversing with much wise under the assumed name of windcold gradually he leads up to a revelation of his true name before which all barriers will fall and leave the way open to menglud his beloved who is destined for him alone he questions much wise concerning all that lies in front of him and one by one interwoven the obstacles are seen outside is the fiery ring of flames and round the castle a huge rock wall with but one entrance the barred gate called sounding clangor yggdrasil the tree of life and fate stands overshadowing all things and in its boughs sits golden comb or wood snake the cock whom the giants watch in dread for when he crows their doom will be at hand fierce dogs are guarding the courts and can be eluded only when feasting on wood snake's wings but wood snake himself can be slain by a magic wand alone which is in the keeping of the giantess sinmara and she will not lend it except for a tail feather from that same cock thus the chain of difficulties is complete but still dayspring asks concerning ember the flaming hall built by wondrous beings of whom we know only loki the fire god and delling the dwarf of dawn until he comes to menglud herself a contrast to the ruthless spirit of old norse literature and to all other descriptions in the edda is this patient figure a tender gracious woman waiting and yearning in heart for her lover but shedding meantime contentment and peace on those around dayspring at last reveals his name 
and they meet like the lovers of all time first with trembling doubt will she have me and is it he then with the certainty that they have known and have been destined for one another through all eternity the whole scene is so complete in its human passion that it seems almost superfluous to ask for any further interpretation but those which suggest themselves are so natural and fitting that just seen they fade away in delicate ethereal colours and form a background of opalescent light the underlying allegory which castle suggests is not wholly false although far-fetched in some of its details the idealist sets forth in search of perfect love and beauty which he sees far off on some high mountain top and longs to gain the difficulties appear insurmountable to those who strive with them in the spirit of worldly wisdom but to him who follows the true instincts of his heavenly nature they give way and he attains much also may be said for the view which sees in this myth only another presentation of that concerning gerd and skirnir the oft-repeated wooing of the imprisoned earth by a summer god if however the interpretation lies in natural phenomena it must be the one suggested by the names it is a radiant light picture day-spring or day-hastener child of sunbright comes as wind-cold the cool fresh breeze which springs up at dawn to wed menglud on the mountain-tops while she the bright sun goddess and her shining necklace are well known to us as freya and brisingamen the sudden revealing of dayspring is that earliest moment in the dawn which can be called day rather than night still a few moments pass before sun herself comes and the inevitable meeting takes place between her and the day no myth so poetical and so fitting could be told of this union as that of two predestined souls we cannot well compare the poem or associate it with any other in the edda it is different in spirit more romantic more tender with a passion which cannot be limited to any one age or locality everything tends to show that it is of late origin the writer makes frequent use of the peculiar type of synonym known as the kenning in which some other person or object is employed to represent and describe the particular one in view the name of a god or goddess serves often as a general term for man or woman thus air stanza twenty eight who in the prose edda is a goddess of healing means only a fair woman in the present case a giantess the old mythology had become a conventional system technical rather than imaginative and names which once belonged to personal beings had lapsed into mere words expressing abstract qualities the question of poetic diction is of importance here for it is possible that many difficult passages could be explained in this light stanza eighteen as we have given it alludes to golden comb who will first announce doom to all giants and giant wives but if the names of cert and sinmara must be retained the passage is meaningless to any modern reader not only in language and sentiment does the writer stand apart from the other poets of mythology but his knowledge of its most famous objects is defective and obscured the mistletoe which loki plucked stands at twenty six seems confused with golden comb and the doom of the world the cock itself who has his station in the scene of dawn resembles the christian symbol of watchfulness whose cry dispels the power of darkness the description of yggdrasil with its fruits which are instrumental in the birth of men is so different from the old tree of life and fate that some critics have denied their identity the nature myth itself seems to wear a modern garb quite unlike the old-fashioned and improbable stories of a less critical age end of introduction part nine day spring in menglud introduction part ten greybeard and thor harbarsliof is one of the old flighting scenes which are so familiar in the sagas of history and romance where hero mocked hero hurling frank abuse across the hall in language which might be softened but was little disguised by a rude strophic form two such flightings are recounted among the gods the present scene in the more famous one in egir's halls page two forty five there is a wide difference between the clumsy dialogue of the first with its mixture of prose and metre and the polished strophes of the second the wit is of a different texture here it is rude and forcible 
but sometimes merely abusive there it is keen artistic swift and sparkling as loki himself no one has yet been able to discover any definite principle in the metre of harbarsleoth we have therefore made thor speak in for nislaug abrupt and trochaic like the harsh-spoken god while greybeard uses the more musical lo the hutter as in the song of rig mythology is used to outline a sketch of social life but once again the contrast is striking old world stories and nature myths serve but to illustrate topical allusions the gods themselves are mere exponents of different social ideals in treatment of their characters and in the real humour of the situation the author redeems himself for any lack of brilliance in the dialogue but the skit for it can be called nothing less presents little attraction to us although it may have seemed witty enough to contemporaries who knew all the obscure traditions of the poem and shared the intense feeling and bitterness which underlie its humour for us the colours are faded and the stories half forgotten we can however still recognise certain features of history and mythology the historical background indeed scarcely needs to be recalled for it is ever present with us that of struggle between the aristocracy and the people this began at a much earlier date in norway and sweden than among other medieval nations and had a more immediate and decisive result the viking who had tasted the sweets of freedom in his wild seafaring life refused to submit to dependence when a bondi at home tyranny had once been enforced by the right of conquest and feudalism strove to maintain it by the authority of law successfully for a while in the south but vainly in the north strife on the battlefield strife at the thing and strife in skaldic verse between class and class was the order of the day the two figures on either side of the stream though caricatures of the gods as we are wont to meet them are easy to recognise a weary traveller arrives on the banks of the fjord which flows between him and his home unwilling to wet himself by wading through the flood he hails a ferryman whom he spies over by the further shore but the latter an old man with a grey beard and a tongue which might have learned to wag more kindly in a spirit of pure contradiction refuses to aid the traveller both reveal their names greybeard shows an intimate knowledge of the other's antecedents in the uncomplimentary dialogue which follows and the story ends where it began with thor raging on the further shore vainly longing to get within reach of his tormentor who has just described the length and weariness of the journey thor shows the same character that we know well in other poems had he called himself by some other title he would not have escaped recognition and could scarce have gone in disguise as greybeard suggests a veiled reminder of how thor once wore woman's weeds rude in his appearance and harsh in his speech as when he met allwise the dwarf straightforward and simple in his thoughts and actions he takes literally the sneer of greybeard when told that his mother must be dead or she could scarce have thus neglected his appearance he has just been engaged in the never-ending somewhat thankless task of fighting the giants many of the labours which he proudly boasts and the failures with which he is taunted are well known the battle with hrungnir mentioned in stanza fifteen is one of the world-famed contests of old norse mythology and is told by snorri in skaldska parmal it happened that the giant hrungnir whose name like that of other jutuns means the sound maker and whose head and heart were of stone had been invited to feast with the gods in asgarth there they plied him with drink till he grew boastful and threatened to destroy them all save freya and sif whom the giants had oft tried to win at last the gods grew weary of such mighty words and uttered the name of thor who was then warring in jutunheim forthwith entered the thunderer all wrathful swinging his hammer and asking who would let a crafty jutun drink ale with the gods who had made peace with hrungnir that he was now within valhalla and why was freya thus filling the ale cup as she was wont at the gods banquet then answered hrungnir and looked at thor with no friendly eyes odin bade me drink with him in valhalla and he is surety for me thor refrained for the moment from slaying hrungnir and accepted his challenge armed and thirsting for battle they came to the appointed spot hrungnir with mokrkalfi a giant made out of clay to support him thor with his trusty servant thjalfi his arrival on the scene is thus described by thjodulf 
the son of earth with swelling heart drove forth unto the play of swords and moon's path rumbled beneath him before him blazed all the realms of space the ground was dashed with hail and earth rent asunder as the mighty hoofed goats of his chariot drew him forth to the meeting with hrungnir then baldr's brother spared not the rocky foe while the mountains trembled and were cloven and ocean blazed thor slew hrungnir while thjalfi dispatched the clay giant the god was wounded by a stone splinter which stuck fast in his head he besought the giantess groa to extract it by singing a charm over him but she forgot the charm in her joy when she heard that thor had brought back her lost husband arvandil in a basket from the icy realms of the north safe except for one toe which had been frozen and thrown up into the sky to make the morning star many incidents in the story have been interpreted by uland hrungnir is the stony ground which vainly resists the thunder showers mokrakalfi is the less stubborn clay which submits to thjalfi the delver groa is nature's power to heal the rents and scars that have been made in the storm conflict and arvandil whose name belongs to the morning star in old english is a summer being imprisoned in jutenheim during the winter perhaps some constellation which is seen with joy when it appears on the horizon as the herald of summer our poet seems to have confused him with thiazi stanza nineteen whose death was a yet more famous event in the chronicles of asgarth thor however played little part in it and the full account is best reserved for the appearance of idun in lokasenna in both incidents thor is redeeming the faults of other gods of odin who had invited hrungnir of loki who had stolen idun the deeds of stanzas twenty nine thirty seven thirty nine are unknown but they were all of like nature the destruction of jutuns and their yet more terrible wives stanza thirty nine has perhaps some connection with gerald's daughters see page two seventy five stanza twenty six is an allusion to one of the most humorous of thor's adventures which snorri recounts although it is not well for mortals to speak of those powers which the thunderer could not subdue he was journeying once with loki and thjalfi whom he had just taken for his servant see page thirty four presently they came unawares into the land of utgarth loki in the uttermost parts of the earth and there many wonderful things befell them one night they sought rest in a large and empty hall but about midnight they were disturbed by a great rumbling and earthquake then thor arose and called his companions they groped around them and found on the right of the hall about halfway down an outhouse where they entered thor sat him down in the door while the others who were sore afraid went further within but he kept a grip on the handle of mjolnir for he had a mind to defend himself so the night passed and in the morning the adventurers found that their hiding place had been the thumb of a giant's glove this giant utgarth loki himself is called by various names fjallar the dissembler and skrymir he plays many tricks on the three companions and unwittingly they race with thought and wild fire strive with ocean and with old age and inevitably suffer defeat but as we have noticed defeat without dishonour was the privilege of thor throughout the poem the author shows a complete understanding of the god's nature as seen in its human aspect from the side which made him loved by the norwegian and icelandic peasants he was the companion of their labours when they prepared and softened the hard earth he hallowed their soil he blessed their marriage feasts with his hammer and showed himself ever the friend of churls as odin was the patron of lords and earls this brings us to the figure on the other side of the stream who gives only the name of greybeard some critics have suggested that he is loki the mocking demon who knows better than any the misdemeanours of the other gods and who reviles thor as he reviles them all at aegir's banquet but the name alone reveals him as odin in his usual guise of a grey-bearded old man unrecognised by thor the deeds mentioned can very rarely be identified with those told in other poems but they are such as belong to odin in his various characters as god of war he is seen with battle flag and reddened spear wasting the fair meadows of all green sixteen rousing hatred between nation and nation and inciting men to slay one another twenty four 
as love adventurer he keeps secret trysting with the gold bright maiden thirty who perhaps is billing's crafty daughter page eighty seven and well he knows how to gain the love of women with fair speeches and a false heart as master of magic he does not scorn to win giant maidens by spells like those he had practised on rind page one fifty nine or by sporting aloft with dark witch riders at night twenty he has attained knowledge in his usual way by fair means or foul stanza twenty and from all beings even the dead forty four whom like the vala he has called up from the grave thus a contrast is drawn between thor the patron of the hard-working tillers of the soil and odin the god and here the representative of the aristocratic and cultured classes whose lives were given to love-making and expeditions of plunder and war odin has earls who fall on the battlefield thor has the race of thralls the oppression of the rich could never be atoned for by a ring nor the strife of classes settled by arbitration forty two thor's bitter reply to this mocking suggestion where didst thou learn such scornful speeches seems to give voice to the discontent of the people which is evidently shared by the poet who leaves us in little doubt as to his own views in the portraits which he has drawn of the gods that of odin is bloodthirsty lustful unscrupulous not unlike the fiend and sorcerer that he became to early christians while they still half believed in him as a god thor on the other hand is not painted in such dark colours he is caricatured and stands no longer equipped with all his god's might the grand outline showing beneath the rough exterior he is only pathetic in his discomfiture and even ridiculous the uncouth giant who lives on in popular notions of to-day but the sympathy of the poet is always with thor he is still shown as the warder of midgarth whose lot is to redeem the faults of others and he still retains a mortal glory which was ever his in defeat one reproach of odin's is mysterious and unexplained thirty four thor is accused of having once broken faith which he does not deny does this refer to an incident in mythology such as thor's slaying of the giant smith in asgarth to whom the gods were bound by oath see introduction to voluspa or is it some topical allusion to an occasion when the people had turned against their leaders and betrayed them to a foe if the realism of this scene is at times too great for the dignity of the gods they are at least viewed in an aspect little known to modern readers of mythology the presentation of thor and odin as familiar types if we may trust our poem shows in what light they were regarded by the masses what place they occupied in the hearts of men thor was their protector he was the author of all that was good and kindly in nature and was worshipped less from awe than from love odin on the other hand was feared and perhaps hated by the peasants for his destructive violence as war god and for his magic wonder-working power which was as little comprehensible to them as the culture which lay beyond their range just for a moment by the hand of a sceptic the curtain seems withdrawn and we look into the obscurity of past thought and see something of the relationship between the mythology and the religion of the people end of introduction part ten greybeard and thor introduction part eleven the song of rig rigsthula is not included in any of the best manuscripts of simon's edda but only in the codex wormianus with a prose edda partly for this reason and because its connection with heimdal the god of light seems obscure and improbable the poem is sometimes put aside as a late invention of the skalds it is without doubt a skaldic song one of those lays which were sung in the hall by a court poet in praise of his royal master whose descent he traces from the gods unfortunately the final strophes are missing or we should perhaps learn the name of this king of famous race Harold the fair-haired has been suggested and the date of composition is certainly that of the viking period but the poet is evidently not drawing on his own imagination except for details the art of the skald lay in taking some old theme and singing it like an old melody with variations to suit the occasion the myth in question tells how once of old the god heimdal who was not wont to leave the seat where he kept watch in heaven 
came to earth as a kingly being called Rig. He is described as passing through all the world and visiting first the dwelling of the serf and thrall, then that of the peasant landowner, and lastly the hall of the rich and nobly born. To each home he brings the birth of children who are reared, who pursue occupations, and who wed according to their station. From the highest rank of the earls is born a king, who is given the name of Rig. Thus Heimdall is the originator of different classes of men, but kings especially have their right to claim descent from the god. Snorri knows nothing of this story, but the Vala, page 277, speaks of Heimdall as the father of all holy kindreds, and in the shorter soothsaying, although no name is mentioned, he is called the kinsman allied to all races. The attempt to explain the myth any further, and to identify Rig, as Rydberg has done, with Skef or Skild, the culture hero of the Germanic race, is unsatisfactory. The motif, indeed, is common, for it is primitive and worldwide, and some such myth arose everywhere, when man began to wonder whence he had come, and why he was man with the knowledge of good and evil. Not having yet learned his kinship with the ape, he invented a race founder, sometimes a god in human form. He made up stories which, oft repeated, were soon told as true, and were believed because they took place so long ago, of a culture hero who came to be king over men to awaken them out of their first sleep of ignorance, and teach them to rule nature by wisdom and knowledge, until, as in the poem, wisdom itself became regarded as the divine inheritance of kings. Sometimes, the scene is more poetical than the green roads and the hasty striding figure of rig skilled the danish hero came as a child drifting in a boat to shore and when he had accomplished his work he passed back to unknown regions beyond the sea from the great deep to the great deep king arthur came and went in mystic fashion but the present poet has another end in view than dreaming he is answering man's next question which was in truth the demand of his socialistic countrymen who thus made men of high and low degree they were born so is his answer and he shows by mythic lore that such an order was established by divine authority his contempt for the low-born seems to indicate that he would not change it if he could the political setting of the poem has already drawn it out of the realms of fancy upon historical ground and in its details the description of the customs and manner of life among the different classes it is most valuable some features of life which the poet depicts are out of date as though he were going back to an older period or were very conservative in his views the first-born son stanza six is thrall the old norse thralls were serfs little better than slaves who could be sold at the will of their master in the viking period they were often prisoners of war it was sometimes possible for them to obtain freedom but never any share in the government or influence in the popular assembly as their names indicate their social condition and occupations were very low great-grandfather's table is set with coarse brown bread and broth which are the best that he can lay before his guest in the home of grandfather and grandmother there is more comfort their appearance and clothing are neat and even ornamental their work and that of their children requires skill the son who is born to them has a fair and ruddy skin his bride does not travel on foot and she is graced by a wedding veil churl in stanza eighteen which is a cognate form of icelandic karl does not give a true idea of the position of the latter who here represents the class of free-born peasant proprietor called bondi or bui a name which was given to his offspring and which was used in viking days to designate the emigrants to iceland these formed a kind of hereditary aristocracy self-governed and absolutely independent the karl of this passage scarcely takes so high a position but belongs to an earlier age mother and father are found stanza twenty one in a lordlier dwelling she has no task but to admire and adorn her fair white neck and arms his work is the honourable pursuit of warfare and the fashioning of weapons they have a son earl with bright eyes and shining hair who lives a glorious life of a conqueror distributing spoils and wealth among his dependents yet more than churl he belongs to ancient days and resembles one of the great lords who are mentioned in hindla's lay or those who give rise to the epithets used by poets the ring-breaker and gold-giver 
the old norse ideal was fixed before the rise of any kind of feudal rule the power of earls passed into the hands of the collective bendir and they too become subject to the laws and customs of the thing earl weds the fair daughter of ruler and their children son offspring descendant etc are required only to inherit the rights and follow the customs which belong to their noble birth but to con the youngest who becomes a king is given a higher heritage not of his father jarl but from rig who bestows his own name upon him and endows him with the wisdom of gods he shares their powers he learns to understand and use the sacred runes he interprets nature and is alone the true son of heimdall and the father of all kings this poem has little beauty and grace but a quaint charm in the original the swift movement of the metre keeps time with the striding march of rig and throughout there is an air of superiority which disdains all the polish and delicacies of art for so fine a theme End of Introduction Part 11 The Song of Rig Introduction Part 12 The Lay of Hindla The shorter soothsaying is included in the manuscript with the Lay of Hindla, but is now by general consent regarded as a distinct poem. The main theme of Hindla is the recitation of a family history, but suddenly, with an abrupt change of style, the subject passes to a genealogy of mythical beings then again it reverts to the original theme snorri quotes from this interpolation stanza six as though from some old and famous song and mentions as his authority a poem called the shorter soothsaying of the vala Beluspa my skomu we may assume therefore though in opposition to simons and certain other critics that it is a fragment of a lost and much older work which dealt like the greater soothsaying with the history of the gods someone as in baldur's dreams is holding converse with a witch called up perhaps from the dead the unknown questioner desires to know the origin and kinship of all mythical beings he asks first concerning the gods race and learns that once before the death of baldur the aesir were twelve in number here a gap in the poem leaves their names unrecorded but they may be conjectured from descriptions by snorri and in loca senna of the full assembly in aegir's halls at these banquets were present odin thor heimdall tyr vidar vali forseti ul hiner bragi and loki who with balder make the twelve another passage is missing which should tell how the wains niord frey and freya came among the other gods and throughout there is such confusion and want of sequence that it is only possible to make the poem explicit by grouping the strophes with the help of familiar allusions the questioner would next learn whence came other powers beside the ruling gods those tumultuous forces ever warring with them the jutuns those wise women the valas who could interpret dreams and foretell the future and whence all wizards and witches and monsters like the great wolf fenrir and prodigies such as odin's eight-footed steeds sleipnir the answers to these questions are unfortunately often too dark to understand or tell us only what is known from other sources one awful being stanza eight the mother of all witches was born in mysterious fashion from a burning heart which loki as fire god had devoured she it has been suggested is the same as golden draught who was burned and reburned in odin's hall and who was the cause of the first war between gods and wains page one eighty three in alluding to loki who is half god half giant the questioner has turned once more to higher beings and the birth of one is related whose name is not mentioned but who is easily recognized as heimdall the description agrees with what is told of him elsewhere and belongs to his character as a god of nature heimdall although he plays a considerable part in the edda is only half revealed to us and his nature not clearly understood he is seldom named by the skaldic poets no sacrifices were offered to him no temples built for his worship he had no place in the hearts of men merely to ascribe a late origin to his myth is not sufficient explanation for this strange silence about a god so well known to the edda the myths which encircle him 
point back by their very contradictions to one who has lived through different ages in the changing thought and fancy of mankind their wonders are accepted only because they belong to the past heimdall says snorri is called the white god he is great and holy sometimes he is called golden tooth for his teeth are of gold his steed is goldy lock and his dwelling place is in heaven hill by the bridge bifrost he is warder of the gods and sits at the end of heaven guarding the bridge against the mountain giants he needs less sleep than a bird he can see by night as well as by day a hundred miles around him he hears grass growing on the earth and wool on the backs of sheep besides all else that makes more sound he owns the trumpet gjallar horn whose blast is heard throughout the worlds thus shown as the dazzling god of light he is unapproachable far seen aloof he sits on its mountain throne guarding bifrost where the rainbow reaches heaven he is no less mysterious in his birth which snorri also describes quoting from some lost song of heimdall child am i of mothers nine of sisters nine the son these maidens from their names in stanza twelve are ocean waves and it is again as the god of light that he is born at the world's edge on the horizon where the sky meets the earth and sea it is there at sunrise that he drinks of the crimson splendour which is like the blood of sacrifice offered to the gods heimdall stands apart from other deities in the edda he is less human except when as rig he passes through the world of men and becomes the kinsman of all peoples his epithet of the richest ruler belongs to him perhaps as owner of the wide and glorious dwelling-place of heaven hill the expression weapon famed is here translated armed with glory because it must be derived from the sword of piercing sun rays which is usually the possession of the heaven god in mythology but which heimdall may well borrow as the god of light in the above-mentioned lay of heimdall his sword is mentioned as being made of a man's head and the skaldic poets use heimdall's sword as a synonym for the head these obscure allusions for which even snorri vouchsafes no explanation suggest that even in his day the traditions about heimdall were already half lost and forgotten all the revelations so far have been of the past the vala now becomes prophetic she foretells the fearful signs and wonders in nature the long dread winter page fifty five which shall herald the fulfilment of weird with the doom of the first ruling powers the gods of war and the coming of the new power some say of christianity but whose nature is here kept secret like other hidden things the mightiest one's old mysteries the runes which odin knew alone the words which he whispered into baldur's ear how then was this mythical fragment united to the less exalted themes of Ottar's genealogy which if it were not for the myth in which it is framed should belong to the heroic lays perhaps the author of hinla's lay had in his possession the old soothsaying and purposed to write a corresponding genealogy of earthly beings enumerating those great germanic heroes of legend and saga whom he deemed worthy of immortality he lingers with old-fashioned love for the list of mighty names feeling that they are in danger of perishing forever in these degenerate days when the power of the nobility is being seized by the middle-class bondi now while they are yet fresh in the memories of men let these names be recorded and their worth attested by association with those of the gods as the hero of his subject the writer takes otar the simple a chieftain who is unknown to history but who seems to have belonged to the famous family of hurdeland he is here identified with od the human lover of freya whose story is thus told by snorri Quote, freya was wedded to a mortal called otar and their daughter hnas the treasure is so beautiful that all things fair and costly are named after her but otar went far away and freya followed him weeping and her tears were of red gold End quote. stanza thirty two otar of the poem has wagered his inheritance with another unknown personage angantyr that his descent could he only trace it is the nobler freya is willing to help her favourite and she takes him with her disguised as golden bristle the famous boar which belonged to frey 
They seek Hyndla, who, like other Valas or witches, dwells in a cave and rides forth upon a wolf at night. She is a giantess and thus knows all the history of mankind. But as such, she must be propitiated by a goddess, and Freya promises to win her the favor of Odin, the war father, who at times can be so gracious. Thor, too, the enemy of giant wives, shall be appeased by sacrifice such as men offered to the gods. Hinla suspects the presence of Otar, but Freya denies it, and in answer to questions of the latter, she rehearses the generations of kings while they ride through the night, and Otar's heart must beat with pride as she marshals forth the host of his dead forebears. It is shown how he is allied to the most ancient and noble races, and heroes who can trace their line back to the gods to us all these great names mean nothing or merely call up shadowy figures in the land that lies between history and romance but recited in ancient days by the skalds before the warriors and women gathered in the hall the famous race names of skjuldum skilfing odling ingling were full of deep meaning and expressed their ideal of glory in heroic deeds the skjuldungs are ancient mythical figures who centre round the birth cradle of the germanic race in the various old english icelandic and danish sources which do not always agree in their details is found the legend of an old culture hero deemed perhaps a god in human form he came as a child drifting over the sea in a boat surrounded by treasures with a sheaf of corn from which he took his name skeff though the poem beowulf has transferred the legend to his son skil the boat approached a land called scania where skeff rescued a people in great misery and taught them to cultivate their territory and defend it against the enemy he died in old age leaving skuld or skild to inherit the kingdom and was sent forth once more over the sea in a boat no less richly endowed than when he came but no man it is said knew who received the precious burden from skuld came the skuldungs or as we learn from beowulf the danes whose home was lera in the island of zeland skeff or skeoff in old english genealogies is the ancestor of the angles and saxons with him we must identify skilvir also said to be the father of skuld the progenitor of the skilfings another name for the swedes but who are the inglings ing or ing is also a great race hero an ancestor of the swedes and angles in the poem inglingatal the name ingling and skilfing is used interchangeably thus ing must be identical with skilvir and skilvir as we have seen is the same as skeff or according to beowulf skuld all this confusion leads us back to one mythical founder of the germanic race from whom all the tribes claimed their descent and whom they remembered as a culture hero who had raised them from a state of savagery and seemed to them in later days as the son of a god see rydberg pages eighty nine and ninety to ninety five then hyndla turns to otar's immediate family and those with which it is connected the first great hero mentioned is halfdan the old stanza eighteen he was the king of denmark and one of the patriarchs of the germanic race known to saxo grammaticus and to the author of beowulf his most famous achievement was the slaying of sigtrig a mythical king he sacrificed to the gods in order to obtain long life but he was granted no more than a man's life of three hundred years and the promise that no ignoble offspring should be born in his line hence otar would desire to claim kinship with him skald skaparmal the twelve berserk brothers of stanza twenty three sons of arngrim and Ephora, belong to hervarar saga and their chieftain angantyr is the principal figure in one of the finest of the old norse heroic poems the word berserk had its origin in a superstitious belief that some men were humramer or able to change their forms and become bears or wolves and were hence called berserks or werewolves later on the name was given to those wild beings who from time to time were seized by fits of madness and rage when they seemed possessed of more than human strength and wrought fearful deeds in battle the saga in question tells of a magic sword called tyrfing which came into the hands of angantyr 
it had been forged by dwarfs and stolen from them therefore a curse followed it and though it might serve its bearer well for a lifetime it would at last bring him to death the viking brothers ranged over land and sea till in consequence of angantyr's love for ingibjorg they met in battle and fell before two warriors odd and hjalmar in the island of zamzi herfur angantyr's warlike daughter had inherited the berserk spirit and presently it came upon her she armed herself like a warrior and went forth to seek tyrfing from her father's grave fearlessly she passed through the haunted land with its magic flickering flames until she stood on the how crying hervard hjorvard hirani angantyr wake where ye rest the tree roots under with helm and birni shield and harness sword keen whetted and reddened spear all are they come the sons of arngrim death thirsting warriors to dust of earth and not one comes forth of ephora's offspring in munavagi to speak with me till at length while the whole land was aflame with enchanted fires the grave opened and she won her heritage from the dead stanza twenty five scarcely requires explanation with the mention of the famous but ill-starred niflung and vulsung races a note of warning comes into the poem this great saga is so widely known and has been so oft repeated that it no longer belongs only to the people of the north who told it first and best in written form jormunrek married svanhild daughter of sigurd he caused his wife to be trampled to death by wild horses in consequence of a slander and her brothers sought to avenge the deed in the history of the latin writer jernandez he is ermanric a mighty king of the goths in the fourth century who was conquered in battle by the huns again he is known in saxo's chronicle as the danish king jarmeric and is mentioned in beowulf as eormenric under slightly different names the same story of the sister's death and the brother's vengeance is told in connection with ermanric and jarmeric we have clearly one of the germanic race heroes remembered by all the different tribes after their separation stanza twenty nine alludes to another famous saga and mentions the instigator of one of the greatest legendary battles of the north ivar was a descendant of angantyr stanza twenty eight he conquered and slew hrurik king of sweden whose daughter Aud the deep thoughted he had married she fled with her little son harold and married radbard king of russia their son was ranver harold battletusk lived to be king over the danes in his old age desiring a glorious death he challenged sigurd ring king of the swedes to meet with him at brevelier there took place a combat of world-wide renown which is described by saxo who delights in the slaughter and bloodshed like some old viking kings princes earls nobles chieftains from all germanic tribes gathered upon the field thousands fell on either side and the swedes were victorious after this passage followed the old fragmentary poem placed there not perhaps by the author of hindla's lay but by some later copyist who was ignorant of the old genealogies and knew little of the distinctions between gods and men the scene now returns to freya in hindla whose ride is ended hindla would be left to sleep in peace once more and bids freya high homewards on her wild night journey with the darkness lit up only by the flickering of enchanted fires like those which surrounded herfur and ever haunt the places of the dead freya's mocking request to pass the ale cup to her boar is the acknowledgment of otar's presence the dialogue between her and hindla grows dramatic and breathless ending with a curse from the witch and a blessing from the goddess upon hotar the rearrangement of strophes which is given in the translation has been made with the help of a prose paraphrase in urvar ad saga it agrees in most points with that suggested by gering the few recognized names have suggested the family groups end of introduction part twelve the lay of hindla introduction part thirteen boulder's dreams in boulder's dreams for the first time we meet face to face with the most sublime and beautiful figure in old norse mythology 
one who is universally known for the tenderness and pathos of his story appeal to modern sympathies moreover has ever proved a source of inspiration to modern critics who make for darkness and mystery as the moth makes for the light all endeavours have failed to unravel the secret of his personality and to trace it to any one source in history or mythology this poem belongs to a closing chapter in the history of the gods baldur's death is the great tragedy which foreshadows their doom no facts are recorded of him in his lifetime here and there in some passing allusion he enters a poem and flits across its pages like some gleaming ray of light but only in his death does he become the most human and tender and best loved of all the gods from the poetic edda alone we learn little concerning him and snorri must be allowed to fill in the gaps with his own version of the story baldr was the son of odin and frigg unlike thor he had no kinship with earth both of his father and mother he was born of heaven Quote, he was the best among the gods and praised by all beings he was so fair to behold and so bright that a glory streamed from him and no white herb even though it were the whitest of all herbs could compare with the whiteness of baldur's brow he was the wisest of gods the fairest spoken and the most pitiful and yet of such nature that none might overrule his judgments his home was in the heavens called broadbeam where naught unclean might enter nothing further is told of baldur's life nor what part he played in the history of the gods how he shared in their warring and striving but not in their sinning for of him there is naught but good to tell he must have had a love story which recounted the wooing of nanna his fair wife who must perish with him but now in this poem we hear that baldur while still youthful has had evil dreams and foreseen his fate perhaps like some old norse hero his filga had stood before him that shadowy spirit who follows each man but is seen only at the sunset of life all the gods gather in alarm and hold counsel but none can tell though all can guess the meaning of baldur's dreams odin is sent down to hell to seek tidings from avala who as one of the dead has power to trace the workings of weird before and behind he rides thither by the same road which hermod took afterwards and on the same steed his own eight-footed sleep near and stands calling on the vala until she obeys the spell of the master magician and comes forth from the grave he must have used incantations such as those diabolical songs which are said by latin historians to have been sung by the heathen at night-time to call up their dead and were so sternly prohibited by the church the vala is heard in speech with odin her words are not the mere fortune-telling of a witch but like the oracle of old she pronounces the doom of baldur the weird motif now sounds in the poem and continues like a grim undertone throughout as the vala interprets one by one the visionary pictures of baldur's dreams he has first seen the interior of a great hall being prepared for the reception of an honoured guest the benches are strewn the mead cup is filled and overlaid with a bright shield and all the place adorned as though for the coming of some king but baldur has guessed that this is hell's abode and is troubled now odin learns the name of this expected king and wrathfully asks who would dare thus to slay his son the best loved among all the gods he has answered that no dread frost giant or mountain giant but one among themselves will shoot the fatal shaft who then shall avenge the deed before ever baldur is laid on the bale fire the father's anger is appeased when he is told that the giantess rind shall bear him a mighty child who shall work vengeance on the author of the woe the vala is next questions on the second vision which baldur has seen a mourning world maidens weeping and in wild despair casting their veils to the winds why does she now break out in fierce indignant reproaches and know that her tormentor is odin none living save a god could thus see into the future and perhaps as a dweller in the underworld she resents the attempts which will be made to deprive hell of its victim then odin with mocking fury and refusal to believe the prophecy of the vala bears the dread tidings home to asgarth but she has the last word reminding him how even the gods must suffer doom for all their after efforts the devices of the fond mother to save her son 
are only a hopeless striving against weird here snorri takes up the story Quote, the gods resolved to ask protection for boulder against all harm and frigg took an oath from fire and water from iron and all metals from rocks and earth and trees from poison and serpents that they would spare boulder when this was done and made known it became the sport of boulder and the gods to make him stand up at their meetings while some shot at him some struck him and some cast stones but whatever they did he was unharmed and they deemed it a glorious feat save loki son of leaf isle who was ill-pleased he went in the likeness of a woman to fen halls where frigg dwelt who asked what all the gods were doing at their assembly the woman made answer that they were shooting at baldur but that naught harmed him said frigg nor weapons nor trees will hurt baldur for i have taken an oath from them all and the woman asked have all things taken the oath to spare baldur frigg answered there grows indeed to the west of valhalla a tender shoot called the mistletoe which seemed too young to ask an oath from then all in a moment the woman vanished but loki went and plucked the mistletoe and joined the gathering of the gods there was one hud who stood without the circle for he was blind loki asked why art thou not shooting at boulder and he answered because i cannot see where he stands and moreover i am without weapon thou must do as the other said loki and show honour to boulder shoot now this wand i will show thee where he stands so hud took the mistletoe and aimed as loki showed him the shaft flew and pierced boulder who fell dead to the earth and tis deemed the direst shot that ever was shot among gods and men when boulder had fallen speech failed the gods and likewise power in their hands to lift him each looked at the other and all were of one mind about him who had wrought the deed but they could not seek revenge there for it was a holy place of peace when the gods sought to speak there was only sound of weeping and the one could not tell his sorrow to the other but the greatest sorrow was to odin for he best foreknew what loss and woe had befallen the gods with the death of baldur when at length they had come to themselves again frigg asked who among them all desired to win her grace and favour and would ride the hell road and seek if haply he might find baldur and offer ransom to hell that she should let him return home to asgarth and hermod the eager-hearted son of odin was chosen for the journey then gliding sleipnir the steed of odin was brought forth and hermod mounted and rode swiftly away but the gods took the body of baldr to send it floating out to sea his vessel called ringhorn was the greatest of all ships and when the gods sought to launch it forth and kindle the bale-fire thereon for baldr it could nowise be stirred so they sent to jotunheim after the giantess fire shrivelled hiruk who came riding on a wolf using serpents for the reins when she had dismounted odin called four berserks to mind the steed but they could not hold it until they had felled it to the ground hiruk went forward to the prow and in one push she launched the boat with such force that sparks flew from the rollers and the whole ground was shaken then was the thunderer wroth he seized his hammer and would have broken her head if all the other gods had not asked mercy for her then they bore forth the dead form of baldr and laid it in the vessel and when his wife nanna nep's daughter beheld it her heart broke from sorrow and she died she too was laid on the bale fire and the flame was kindled thor stood by and hallowed the pile with mjolnir at his feet ran a dwarf called lit and thor spurned it with his foot into the fire and it was burned all manner of folk came to the burning of baldr first came odin and with him frigg and the valkyries and his ravens hugin and munin frey came driving in a car drawn by the boar called golden bristle or fierce fang and helmdal riding the steed goldenlock freya was there with her cats thither came too a host of frost giants and mountain giants then odin laid on the bale fire that ring called draupnir which is of such value that therefrom fall eight like rings every ninth night and baldr's steed was led to the balefire in all its trappings meanwhile hermod rode nine whole nights through dales so dark and deep that he could see naught till he came to the loud roaring river gjallar and rode over the echoing gjallar bridge which is thatched with shining gold there the maiden called modgud keeps watch 
She asked Hermod his race and name, and told him how yesterday five phantom troops had ridden over the bridge. But under thee the bridge echoes full as loud, nor hast thou the hue of a dead man. Why art thou riding on the hell road? He answered, I must needs ride to hell and seek Baldr. Hast thou seen aught of him on the hell road? Baldr, said she, has ridden over the Gjallar bridge. Downward and northward lies the way to hell. So Hermod rode on till he came to the hell gates. There he sprang from horseback, tightened his saddle girths, and mounting again he spurred his steed so fiercely that it leapt high over the gates, and not so much as touched them with its heels. Then he rode onward to the hall, where he dismounted and entered. He saw there his brother Baldr sitting on the high seat, and he stayed the night. In the morning he besought Hel to let Baldr ride home with him, and told her how great mourning there was among the gods. Hel said that she would make trial whether Baldr was as much beloved as men said. If all things, both quick and dead, in all the worlds, shall weep for Baldr, then shall he fare home to the gods. But if aught refuse, let Hel keep what she has. Then Hermod arose, and Baldr brought him forth from the hall, and gave him the ring Draupnir to bear to Odin as a token of remembrance, while Nanna sent a veil to Frigg and a golden veil to Fula. Then Hermod went his way home to Asgarth, and told them all the things which he had seen and heard. The rest of Snorri's account, and how Baldr could not be delivered, is given with the fragments, page 273. Other Icelandic sources of this myth are found in allusions of the skalds, and in the description of the Beofire and Hustrapa by Ulf Ugason. Throughout there is little discrepancy and confusion. Indeed, if a knowledge of Baldr had been confined to the north, he might have rested in peace. But other nations claim to have known and perhaps worshipped him. The Old English trace their descent from Beldeg, son of Wodan. In Germany they knew him as a hero, full, Meersburger Spruche. In Denmark strange rites were observed with burning of rings at Baldur's Hagi, Frivio's Saga. In the latter country alone, however, do we find any legend corresponding to the above. Saxo relates how Hotherus, a Swedish king, wooed and won Nanna, a Norwegian princess but Balderus also loved her, and the two princes long fought for the maiden, until the latter was slain by a magic sword. In this account, Hud appears as the hero of the story, and is beloved by Nanna. Balder is the villain, and like other old Norse gods, he is degraded by Saxo to a demigod. He is invulnerable to all weapons except the sword which Hotherus wins from the wood spirit Miming. In certain features, the Danish story may be regarded as the older version. It is less exalted in tone and nearer to folklore than to literature. Loki's share in the deed, Hermod's ride to hell, and the weeping for Baldr are probably late additions to the myth. As to whether the sword or the mistletoe is the older weapon, it is difficult to decide. A fateful object with which the life of a hero is bound up is a common motif in mythology or fairy tale. Sometimes it is a sword or a wand, sometimes a charmed drink, or even some beast or bird. In Voluspa, stanza 32, the mistletoe is described in this light, and if, as Fraser suggests, Baldr does indeed represent the tree spirit of an oak, then his life may be said to reside in the fair and slender plant, which remains green in winter when the oak tree seems to die. The dead Baldr has suffered yet more than the living. A helpless victim, the prey of critics, he has been rent asunder, and his whole life story distributed in fragments to the different sources whence it came. Nature myths, primitive worship, poetic fancy, legendary history, Christian influence, classical lore. Theorists on all these topics have taken Baldr as their subject, and encircled his name with hybrid myths, and drawn new pictures of his death scene. Almost worthy of him, is that of the glorious sun-god who perishes daily, or perhaps yearly, and with him his wife, the summer fruit and blossom, or that in which he is seen as the incarnate spirit of nature's growth and life, which seems to die during the winter months, but which in the springtime will be born anew. This interpretation of Baldr as a tree spirit, and of his death as the poet's description of a heathen rite, is fully discussed by Fraser in The Golden Bough. He shows how universal among nations was the offering of a human victim, 
not in sacrifice to some special deity but in the performance of a magic drama by which men sought to assist nature through imitation of her work savage and primitive peoples have often thought to make rain and sunshine by sprinkling water and lighting fires so too in springtime the death of the old tree spirit and the birth of the new might be enacted and furthered by human representatives it is true that many legends and customs may be interpreted in this light but it does not serve to explain the balder myth there are no grounds nor any details in his history even with the ingenious use of the mistletoe by which balder as we know him can be transformed into a tree spirit another picture of ancient ceremonial is drawn by kaufmann in this scene balder is brought forth as the scapegoat for men deemed it possible to expel not merely the decaying spirit of vegetative life but all the evils physical and moral which assailed them to serve this purpose a scapegoat was chosen to bear the ills of humanity in early days his person reserved for a special end was sacred and tabooed no dishonour was attached to his vocation and the higher the victim who might be a king or even a god the more efficacious was the sacrifice subsequently the scapegoat was degraded and became an object of shame who was chosen from among criminals and outcasts as in the pharmacion at athens where a human victim was sacrificed as late as the fifth century may there not have been a time among the german nations when balder the most innocent and lovable of all the gods was sacrificed in yearly ceremony for his kind and for humanity whatever the truth may be as to the origin of the myth it is certainly as a scapegoat that he figures in the edda weird was fast overtaking the old faulty war gods and the first victim was innocent balder both these last theories recall acts of ancient ritual we come now to another in which balder is the impersonation of an idea the conception of a christ in old norse religion which arose from the need of humanity for a god divine in his beauty and goodness but human in his suffering and death this suggestion however demands too great a power of abstraction from an uncultured people it only explains the final form of the balder myth as reinterpreted by a later age Bugge was certainly of that opinion when he attempted to show that the death scene as given in the edda is only a copy of the christian sacrifice loki represents lucifer and hud the blind longinus as they were conceived in the traditions of the middle ages just as the eye is beginning to grow accustomed to this transformation scene and to recognize familiar features and real correspondence it changes anew and balder passing into balderus becomes achilles hud or hotheris is seen as paris and nana as inoni there is this truth in Bugge's theory that the first conception of balder must have undergone gradual transformation with the nation's developing thought and assumed in some degree the form and colour of external influences but it is difficult to follow a change so sudden and complete the common-sense theory which sifts fact from fiction has given us one other picture of balder from the dim background of history he steps forth some old king who seems more like a god when thus beheld in the twilight of past days his name which means a lord or prince seems to confirm an explanation which always has the semblance of probability but the hero chosen by a primitive race for such honours was usually a glorious conqueror or a benefactor of mankind not the pathetic victim of a fruitless sacrifice if the myth has its source in history saxo's more human love story must be the earlier version let us return however to the first picture balder stands invulnerable still no hailing shower of commentary or weapon of research has destroyed the beauty and reality of the figure which snorri and the icelandic poets have drawn end of introduction part thirteen balder's dreams introduction part fourteen loki's mocking there is one writes snorri who is numbered among the gods although some call him their reviler and the shame both of gods and men his name is loki or lopt the rover of air son of the jutun fierce beater his mother is called leaf isle or pine needle and his brothers are beleipt and hell dazzler 
loki is beautiful and fair of face but evil of mind and fickle in his ways he is more versed in the art of cunning than others and is crafty in all things oft he brings the gods into great plight and delivers them off by his wily counsel this bright elusive figure like a spark of the fire which he personifies kindles with life and humour every tale into which he enters appearing and reappearing in different forms a god in his power and a devil in his deeds he well deserves a place among the portraits which art has drawn of the latter personality no stormy power of evil like the satan of paradise lost he yet provokes war in heaven and snares by his tempting the wives of gods his rebellion is more dangerous to them than a wild assertion of the individual for he is the undermining instrument of fate compared too with mephistopheles loki rich in human life and mirth and beauty finds more victims among men than the cold seducer of the spirit in all the more familiar myths of snorri's edda he appears a purely scandinavian figure of late origin and possibly moulded by christian influence but in the poems he may be traced back to some old germanic fire god perhaps called logi flame who lent his name and attributes to loki the ender or destroyer of the gods however this may be his double nature and the poetical contradictory myths which are told concerning him find explanation in his origin as a fire god fire is mighty beneficent life restoring swift and beautiful to the eye such character has loki when as lodur he bestows the gift of warmth and goodly hue on man when he fetches idun out of jutenheim and appears a god of wondrous beauty but fire may also be cruel treacherous fierce and destroying and was it not loki himself who enticed idun out of asgarth who betrayed freya mocked the gods at their banquet worked the death of baldr and led the hell hosts at the doom in all his mythical adventures loki appears sometimes as the friend of the gods and especially as the companion of odin and hynir and sometimes in alliance with the giants he commits some folly or crime he brings the gods into danger and then by his power and cunning he extricates them and is forgiven until he works the evil which can never be atoned or remedied the death of baldr after this he must suffer punishment till ragnarok loki's mocking is the best poem of its kind in the whole collection of the edda continually striving after more and more vivid representation old norse art has at last attained its perfection in an inimitable dramatic poem where the whole interest is centred in living personality the characters are drawn in masterly fashion with a neat crisp touch the dialogue is racy humorous forcible and has a bitterness which flavours the whole much skill is shown in the introduction of new speakers with their ever-varying tones and quick repartees the author is never didactic he has no end in view beyond this comedy of the fallen discredited gods or is it not rather their tragedy for although the collective poems of the edda do not give us a complete history of the gods and the earlier ones do not even suggest the somewhat ethical light in which it is here presented this idea of tragedy is not a purely modern interpretation the poet of Voluspa regards the fall of the gods as the result of their warring the retribution of weird the distinctive feature in the new world is its peacefulness the present poet has his own notion of the sequence of events this is clearly one of the latest and the gods as shown by him are so degenerate that they can exist no more the banquet scene is a crisis in their history the vala of the preceding poem had spoken the doom of baldr in her solemn accents was heard the first note of warning and loki with wild mocking words pronounces judgment on the rest they are gathered for peaceful converse in the sea halls of Egir, recalling with quiet satisfaction or intoxicated joy their old deeds of glory when in bursts a fierce intruder the fiery loki half demon in his spite and cunning half god in his beauty and might truths bitter and shameful he hurls at them and they shrink condemned before his unwelcome revelation and give him place at their banquet one by one he singles out the gods and spares not the goddesses and the sting of each accusation lies in its truth bragi the poet so ready in speech is doubtless a boaster and a coward 
like the singer hunferth in beowulf it is well known that odin the high one has degraded himself by working magic that frigg is unfaithful that frey has parted with his sword to buy gerd that thor was outwitted by utgarth loki heimdall and tyr he can taunt only with their sufferings in baldr he can find no stain yet boasts that he himself was author of the crime whereby the god was slain but loki though invincible in his words cannot stand before mjolnir and on the entrance of the thunderer in godlike wrath with a few parting jibes the hateful intruder takes flight it is a wild picture of disillusionment painted in lurid colours which are intensified by recalling the gloomy scene which comes before the tragedy of baldur's death and that which follows the extinction of the banquet lights the punishment of loki and the fulfilment of doom for so events as of a story already complete seem to have shaped themselves in the poet's mind it is a last gathering before the round table of the war gods it dissolved the very conception of a balder had been their condemnation for it was the birth of a new ideal here the sceptic leaves them stripped of all their old glory shown as fickle shadowy beings the ever-changing gods of nature for it is in this light that the poem must be interpreted as a much obscured picture of elemental forces loki figures throughout as the destructive fire demon from his strife with the peaceful hearth fire on entering to the last curse which he hurls upon aegir most of his taunts and accusations may thus be explained except in passages such as stanzas seventeen and fifty two where the myths of idun and skjad are unknown frey and freya whose names are masculine and feminine forms of the same word lord and lady are in their origin different aspects of the same sun deity hence their close union as brother and sister and as husband and wife but nothing further is known of some myth alluded to in stanza thirty which must have grown up to explain it hence too the loss of frey's sword in the sunbeam which he sent to gerd or earth stanza forty two Njord also stanza thirty four appears in the character of a peaceful sea-god who says snorri dwells in ship home he rules the way of the wind and stills the sea and slakes the fire flame he is not of aesir race but he was fostered in the land of wains who gave him as hostage to the gods and took in exchange one who is called hinir thus peace was made between the gods and wains loki in stanza thirty six accuses Njord of what is recounted of him in inglinga saga that before he came among the aesir he was married to his sister who bore him a son and daughter frey and freya as such a union was not permitted among the aesir he now declares frey to be the son of skadi his after history how he was sent on by the gods as hostage into jutenheim and was kept a prisoner there during the long winter months like ocean itself when held in bondage by the frost is told by snorri and given with the fragments page two seventy one as sea god too hymir's daughters the glacier streams poured themselves into his mouth stanza thirty four drawn from some nature myth must be the allusions of stanza twenty six odin as heaven god as a wife of like nature frigg but in less exalted character he is also the husband of the earth goddess jord does frigg allow herself to be wooed by odin's brother vili and ve who are again different aspects of himself as the cloud goddess who has made the sport of the wind in all its moods frigg's unfaithfulness in inglinga saga is told as traditional history of odin the race founder it occurred during his banishment not he alone appears under varying forms as a nature god but frigg and freya have their shadowy image in gefjon stanza two mentioned by snorri as a maiden who is served by such as die unwed here like frigg she has foreknowledge of fate and like freya she owns the famous necklace page one thirty one which was won by heimdall the fair youth stanza twenty from loki who had stolen it idun the wife of bragi appears but this once in the poems snorri says she keeps in her casket those apples whereof the gods eat when they wax old and which make them young again thus they have given a great treasure into the keeping of idun which once was well-nigh lost 
These words recall one of the most famous incidents in the history of the gods, which involved the slaying of Tiazi, stanza 50, in Njord's periods of exile. Loki, when journeying with Odin and Hynir, had once been made prisoner by the giant Tiazi, and was released only on promise of betraying Idun to the giants, who, like Freya, was coveted by them as a summer goddess. He enticed her out of Asgarth by saying he had found apples as wondrous as her own. Then there was wailing among the gods at the loss of Idun, and ere long they waxed grey-haired and old. They gathered in council, and each asked the other what he knew last concerning Idun, and it was found that she was last seen going forth from Asgarth with Loki. The latter, to save his life, donned Freya's falcon plumes, and flew into Jutunheim and fetched back Idun in the form of a nut. Tiazi pursued him as an eagle, and just missing him, flew into a fire which the gods had kindled outside the walls of Asgarth. His wings were burnt, and there he was slain. Skadi, his daughter, demanded vengeance, and would make peace only on two conditions. One, that the gods should make her laugh, which only Loki could do by acting the part of a buffoon. Secondly, that she should choose a husband among them, and she chose Njord, page 271. Even more famous than this occurrence was the binding of Fenrir by Tyr, the god who accompanied Thor in his quest after the cauldron. According to Snorri, he is the best and bravest hearted of all the gods who rules victory in battle. It appears from his name that he once owned a more distinguished place than that of war god. Sanskrit, Dios, Greek, Zeus, Latin, Jupiter, Old High German, Zeu, Old English, Tuesday, Old Norse, Tyr, are all derived from the same germanic root dew to shine which must originally have belonged to the heaven god snorri relates how loki had three terrible children by the giantess sorrow bringer fenrir the world serpent and hell all father bade the gods bring them to him and he cast the serpent into the deep where it lies encircling all lands and grown so huge that it bites its own tail hell he cast into mist home and the wolf was reared at home. Tyr alone had courage to approach him with food. And when they beheld how he waxed mightier each day, they remembered the prophecy, how it was foretold that he should work their woe. And after they had taken counsel together, they forged a very strong fetter called Ledin, and brought it to the wolf and bade him try his strength upon it. Seeing that it was not over mighty, Fenrir let the gods bind him as they willed, and at his first struggle the fetter was broken. Thus he loosed himself from leading. Then the gods forged another fetter, twice as strong, which they called Dromi, and bade the wolf try his strength upon this, and told him that he would become famed for his might if a chain of such forging would not hold him. Fenrir knew well how strong was the fetter, but he knew likewise that he had waxed mightier since he broke leading moreover it came into his mind that one must needs risk somewhat for the sake of fame and he allowed himself to be bound when the gods said they were ready fenrir shook himself and loosened the fetter till it touched the ground then he strove fiercely against it and spurned it off him and broke it so that the pieces flew far and wide thus fenrir freed himself from dromi then were the gods filled with fear and deemed they would never be able to bind the wolf and Allfather sent Skirnir, Frey's shining courier, down to the underworld, where dwelt the dark elves or dwarfs, who forged for him the fetter called Gleipnir. Out of six things they wrought it, the footfalls of cats, the beards of women, the roots of mountains, the sinews of bears, the breath of fish, and the spittle of birds. It was soft and smooth as a silken band, yet strong and trusty withal the wolf would consent to be bound only with this fetter on condition that one among the gods would lay a hand in his mouth and each god looked at the other and weened that here was choice of two ills but none made offer until tyr put forth his right hand and laid it in the wolf's mouth so they bound fenrir and watched him struggle while the fetter grew tighter and sharper and they laughed one and all save tyr alone who lost his hand but this attempt, as with Baldr, to stay the course of Weird is in vain, and the wolf will remain bound only to Ragnarok. Stanza 60 alludes to that luckless journey of Thor's into Jutunheim, page 48, 
when he was so many times outwitted by Utgarth Loki, who is here called Skrymir. On this occasion, the giant had offered to carry the provisions of the gods with his own, and he bound them up so tightly that Thor could not loosen the knot. This poem is a review of the whole life history of the gods. It recalls all the main events which took place in their midst. It indicates the part played by each character. But the skeptical attitude of the writer can best be seen by comparing it with the dignity and pathos of the poem which follows Snorri's fragments, Voluspa. The fragments themselves have already been explained, where possible, by similar passages in the poetic Edda. End of Introduction Part 14 Loki's Mocking Introduction Part 15 The Soothsaying of the Vala In Vuluspa, the god's history is reviewed once more from beginning to end, this time by one who sees it in its truest light, the artist. Just touched, as it seems, by later influence and new ideals, this poem cannot be taken as primitive, or as the work of one who held the mythical fancies as religious beliefs. The old gods have had their day, their story is complete, but once more it is told before it is forgotten, in an age when their nature and strivings are yet understood. Some poet who has seen truth in the beauty of these old world tales has endeavoured to give them a unity which is still retained in spite of all after meddling with his work. It is seen in the thread which runs like a guiding principle throughout, the bond of weird which weaves itself inch by inch out of the acts of gods and men as we have shown this poem is the conscious recognition of a principle which must exist in any mythology founded on a religion of nature for this reason it needs to be read both first and last first because it sums up and interprets the other poems and last because without a previous knowledge of its myths the vala's words can scarcely be understood even with such knowledge as we have already gathered some passages cannot be explained owing to lost connections and forgotten incidents others because their difficulty arises from the nature of mythology itself with its rational and irrational ideas its blendings of poetry and superstition and the thoughts of one age with those of another but as the poet himself has seen little beauty and no truth can be revealed in the detailed rehearsal of myths by which men have sought to represent the mysteries of life. He has given rather the spirit in which they tried to grasp them. The old Norsemen turned a serious face towards life and refused to regard it either as a playground or a home of rest. It was essentially a field of endeavor and of strife between man and nature, God and Jutun, powers of good and evil. All this is echoed in the struggle of the gods with weird, the power and deep war notes of the poem, the solemnity of tone which is relieved at times by a quiet rejoicing in the mere movement and activities of life peculiar too was the attitude of the norseman towards the supernatural mysteries to him were not further mystified by speculation or emotion but as such they were left and took their place among the factors of his daily life where all else was tangible and definite to the eye we can well imagine such an attitude of mind arising among men who had been brought to dwell in a land where nature is full of mystery and who were forced to live a practical and strenuous life in conflict with powers only half understood loneliness and dim perils of ice and snow became a part of their everyday existence hence the atmosphere and setting of the poem its background dim and misty grey and subdued in tone lit only by aurora gleams of imagination and its foreground with the well-defined and vivid pictures characteristic too is the figure of the vala so-called probably though the point is much disputed from the staff which she carried she was a wandering prophetess who clad in her fur cap and her dark robes went from house to house foretelling and divining hidden things the power of second sight which she claimed was common not only to such as she but to many a good housewife in icelandic sagas but while those so gifted knew only of trivial matters interpreted dreams and omens advised and warned this vala addressing all kindreds of the earth reveals the fate and history of the world like the witch in baldur's dreams she has been called up from the dead and like the mighty weaver she is one of those primeval beings who remember all things 
and she recalls in visionary scenes one by one the great events of time snorri has vainly attempted to bring sequence and order into his corresponding description and has invented details which spoil the grandeur of that given by the vala for want of better authority however we are often obliged to rely upon him for explanations she tells first of the creation in the beginning was chaos when as yet there was no heaven or earth only in the north a region of snow and ice and in the south one of fire and heat with a yawning gap between from which life arose in the form of ymir the stirring rustling sounding jutun followed by others of his kind born out of the elements and as yet hardly to be distinguished from them then the gods were born who forthwith made war upon these giant powers and half subduing them they ordered the universe with its worlds of gods and elves of dwarfs and giants of men the living in midgarth the dead in hell all held in the sheltering embrace of a great world tree but from whence sprang this tree or when and how it grew not even the giants could tell sun moon and stars were set in heaven and when sun turned her face towards earth and shone upon its threshold stones it brought forth fruit and its bare surface was overspread with green but as yet the paths of the heavenly bodies had not been decreed what did sun do in her perplexity how did she fling her right hand over the rim of heaven how did she appear to the spectator to glide on towards the right and linger in the northern heavens without knowing the hall of her setting did she face round from the south and marching back eastward fling her own right hand over the horizon and set in the east or have we in stanza five a description of the midnight sun dipping for a moment below the horizon and then rising to put to shame moon who had not yet learned his secret influence over the destiny of man and the stars who knew not their courses for the first time the gods gathered in council in their holy place by the well of weird to order this matter again they met to rescue the humble dwarf folk who had been left half created as the maggots which crawled out of ymir's flesh they were given human form and a share in creative power but all their work the forging of secret treasures they must do beneath the ground then followed the greatest act of creation concerning which the gods held no counsel for it came to pass in the course of destiny when sun obeying the law of her own being had first shone upon the world vegetative life was quickened in the earthy matter now the gods once faring on their homeward way bestowed each after his own nature gifts upon two barren trees and human life was awakened with individuality and a soul odin as the wind god gave them breath which has ever been held as the emblem of the spirit or even as spirit itself hynir of whom little is known except that he was wise see below gave an understanding mind loki here called lodur the fire god gave warm blood and the bright hue of life meanwhile what snorri calls the golden age was passing when the gods were building the fair homes mentioned by grimnir rejoicing in their work in their play and doubtless too in their love it must have been then that bragi wooed idun with fluent tongue that baldr wedded nanna that thor's heart was given to sif the golden-haired the most guileless among all the goddesses but soon this peaceful age was broken the first shadow of doom fell as three mighty maidens passed from jutenheim and sat them down beneath the tree yggdrasil these fair norns who wrote the past and present on their tables and laid down the future lots of men are later forms of weird personified as a grim goddess of fate and known to all germanic races then swiftly followed the first war among kindred races of the gods the aesir and the wains from the last more cultured tribe there came a witch called golden draught among the warlike aesir two things she taught this simple folk the lust for gold and the use of magic the last was deemed an unpardonable sin among germanic nations and was punished by burning in like manner the aesir sought to destroy golden draught by burning her in odin's hall but in vain for as many times as they burned her she was born anew war broke out and the wains demanded wergild and a council of peace was held 
but the warfather arose and hurling his spear gave the signal for strife to rage anew it ended in the storming and destruction of asgarth by the wains here a gap in the poem or a timely clouding of the vala's vision hides the shame and defeat of the gods in inglinga saga four it is told as legendary history that after a while both sides became weary of a war in which victory fell now to the one and now to the other and in which the countries of both were spoiled so they held a peace meeting and made a truce and exchanged chieftains the wains sent their noblest Njord, with his children frey and freya and the aesir sent hinir who was deemed well fitted to be a ruler and with him they sent also one of great understanding mimir in exchange for kvasir the wisest among the wains hinir was made a chief in wainholm when the people found that he could give no counsel without mimir but said on all occasions let others decide they thought themselves cheated by the aesir and cut off mimir's head and sent it to odin he smeared it with herbs and sang rune songs and gave it power of speech through which he learned many secret things according to snorri kvasir was a wondrous being fashioned by all the gods from whose blood the song mead was brewed up page twenty eight in both accounts the details are evidently of late invention this war between strength and valour on the one side art and skill on the other is like a shadowy recollection of a time in history when the barbaric children of the north were dazzled by roman gold and roman civilization but such a strife with the first weakening of the war powers was inevitable in the story of the gods immediately following this incident it would seem from the illusion of the vala stanza twenty five took place an event which snorri recounts a fierce struggle with the jutuns and a crafty attempt on their part to win freya the summer goddess who had just been brought to asgarth the gods were in need of a builder to raise anew the walls of their dismantled city which by the last war had been left open to the inroads of frost and mountain giants a craftsman appeared and offered to do the work in three half years but asked as his payment freya and with her the sun and moon at the evil counsel of loki and seemingly in the absence of thor they agreed to his demands if he could finish the work in a single winter before the first day of summer otherwise his reward would be forfeited he worked night and day with the help of his giant horse svadilfari and the walls were well nigh complete when it still wanted three days before the summer then the gods took counsel and questioned one another who had thus planned to send freya as bride into jutunheim who had filled all the sky and heaven with darkness by taking thence the sun and moon it is this scene which the poem describes but it tells nothing of what is learned from snorri that the gods knew one and all that he must have counselled this whoever counsels ill loki the son of leaf isle then they laid hands upon him and made him swear to deliver them out of their plight and he did this by changing himself into a mare and enticing svadilfari away into the woods and when the craftsman saw that he could not finish the work he flew into a jutun rage and the gods knew now for certain that it was one of the mountain giants who had come among them and oaths were disregarded and thor was called who came even as swiftly then was mjolnir raised aloft and the craftsman received his wage but he returned not into jutunheim with the sun and moon for at the first blow his skull was broken into pieces and he was sent down to mist hell beneath once more a scene of shame is veiled for the gods had broken faith with the jutuns in trying to undo their own folly when the vala resumes a new part of the poem has begun and her words become more mysterious she is revealing now no longer old tidings heard or things remembered but secret knowledge which she has won at night-time when she sat out enchanting and holding commune with the spirits of nature on some such occasion it seems that odin has come to consult with her but when this occurred or whether she is rehearsing a past incident is not made clear she proves first her power to foretell the future by showing that her knowledge penetrates to the holiest secrets of the gods she knows of their pledges heimdall's hearing odin's eye and baldr's life heimdall can hear grass growing in the earth and wool on the back of sheep 
is it his ear which he has hidden in the secret well beneath yggdrasil to obtain this wonderful power which he needs in his watch against the mountain giants and why has odin pledged his eye to mimir this last question can be answered only by tracing back the history of mimir in german tradition he is a wise teacher and wonderful smith who instructed siegfried and weyland according to snorri he is hynir's companion whom the wains beheaded and who became the friend and counsellor of odin in the poetic edda he is also closely associated with a god whose wisdom as we have seen is not the natural attribute of his divinity but is drawn from all sources giants valas from hell ravens in the air instruct him but his friend of friends is mimir the deep thinker with whom he takes counsel at the doom mimir is a giant in the older edda and guardian of a sacred well of wisdom or rather at an earlier date that well itself from whose source or head flowed the moisture used in the writing of the runes page thirty one and in whose waters odin has pledged his eye to gain insight into hidden things a further interpretation which mullenhoff suggests belongs to a still older stratum of thought a nature myth of the sun drawing precious moisture from the sea and in return casting its own reflection its second eye into the deep sun and sea thus mutually dependent together give nourishment to the world as odin and mimir together bestow their wisdom in stanza thirty two is mentioned the third and yet more mysterious pledge baldur's life and fate which are bound up with the mistletoe page sixty four but the description of the vala is now growing more and more visualized and she herself can scarce interpret the floating pictures which represent now some future now some present scene she is looking into all the different worlds earth where the valkyries are speeding to the battlefields of men asgarth where beside valhalla the fateful mistletoe is already high upgrown the cave where she foresees the torment of loki hell where evil men are suffering the penalty of their misdeeds jutenheim with its feasting hall of giants dark dwarf land where no sun nor moon can penetrate lit only by the glowing forge fires of these active beings and again eastward into jutenheim where skull was fostered the dark wolf son of fenrir who follows the fleeing sun goddess across the heavens until he clutches her in the west and stains all the sky at sunset with crimson like the blood of men page sixteen all these grim sights have in them something fearful and ill-omened the shadow of fate is growing darker the weird motif is heard more and more clearly now the true spydom of the vala begins she has turned to the future and foretells the doom of the gods but she grows less visionary the scene is a twilight glimpse of dawn she can only see dimly and she is listening to the crowing of the cocks in giant land in asgarth and in hell and following the long expected signals of alarm she hears a rumbling through all jutenheim as the giant enemies of the gods bestir themselves for battle the clashing of weapons in valhalla as the war sons of odin awake and pour forth through the five hundred doorways while the gods are gathering at the doomstead and holding speech together in hell the rending of chains fenrir has broken loose loki is free she hears the gleeful song of the giant's warder answered by heimdall with the roaring blast of gjallarhorn which sounds through all the worlds in the earth too among men she hears wars and rumours of wars crashing of shields and swords from below comes the groaning of the imprisoned dwarfs and throughout at intervals waxing louder and wilder the deep baying of the hellhound garm amid this tumult she catches another sound more fearful still the shivering and rustling of the great ash the tree of fate as it quivers but does not fall and yet one other sound a voice in the storm the murmur of words odin is holding speech with mimir now light falls once more the vala can see the foes are gathering from all quarters on the great battlefield which measures a hundred miles each way from the east come frost and mountain giants from the south come fire giants from the north the hell hosts and loki from the west must come the gods led by odin with all his chosen warriors in single combats the last battle is depicted weird is triumphant 
a second time must the heaven goddess weep when the war father is devoured by fenrir though vengeance quickly follows and the wolf falls before vidar frey who is parted with the sword which waged itself is destroyed by the fire giant surt thor meets once more with the world serpent and still glorious in defeat he slays and is slain thus the war gods perish and fire consumes the world throughout this passage the tone of the poem has changed solemn and meditative at first or rippling blithely on through each fresh disclosure of life it has grown abrupt and stormy with the strivings of weird to fulfil itself now again it changes to a tone of peaceful exultation which heralds the restitution of all things there is nothing visionary now or mystic in the scene it is a calm fresh morning after the night of storm all nature is at rest life is resumed seldom do we find in old poetry so realistic a description the green earth is still bathed with moisture the rushing of waterfalls is heard the living eagles in contrast to the pale-beaked monster of stanza fifty seek their wonted food in mountain pools the gods are come again but not all for the rule of the war gods is at an end and their home of battle will henceforth be the dwelling-place of peace it is a continuation of a former existence without labour and without strife old sports are renewed old achievements are not forgotten old mysteries are disclosed powers of evil depart and there comes a new god but here fresh mysteries appear and must wait for solution by a later poet who seeks like the present one to explain existent myths in the light of a higher creed end of introduction part fifteen the soothsaying of the vala end of introduction by olive bray part one the sayings of grimnir odin and frigg were sitting once on window shelf gazing out over all the world said odin seest thou agnar thy fosterling how he begets children with a giantess in a cave but geirud my fosterling is a king and rules over the realm he is such a meat grudger answered frigg that he starves his guests when he deems that too many are come into his halls odin swore that this was the greatest lie and they wagered on the matter frigg sent her handmaiden fulla to geirud to bid the king beware lest an enchanter who had come into the land should bewitch him and she gave him this sign whereby he might be known no dog however fierce would assail him men had lied greatly in saying that geirud was not hospitable but for all that he caused a certain guest to be seized when the dogs would not attack he came clad in a blue mantle calling himself grimnir the masked one and would tell naught beside however much they asked him then the king ordered him to be tortured till he should speak and they set him in the midst between two fires and eight nights he sat there geirud's son who was ten years old and named agnar after the king's brother went up to grimnir and gave him to drink out of a brimming horn saying that the king had done ill thus to torture him without cause and grimnir drank at length when the fire had waxed so high that his mantle burned upon him he spake fierce art thou fire and far too great flame get thee further away my cloak is scorched though i hold it high my mantle burns before me eight nights have i sat betwixt the fires while no man offered me food save only agnar the son of geirud who alone shall rule the realm blessed be thou agnar the god of all beings shall call a blessing upon thee for one such draught thou shalt never more so fair a guerdon win the twelve homes of the gods holy is the land which yonder lies near the world of gods and elves in the home of strength shall the thunderer dwell even till the powers perish yew dale is called the realm where ul hath set him a hole on high an elf home that which the gods gave frey as tooth fee in days of yore a third home is there whose hall is thatched with silver by blessed powers vala shelf that seat is named which was founded in former days the fourth is falling brook there for ever the chill waves are rushing over while day by day drink odin and saga 
glad hearted from golden cups the fifth is called glad home and gold bright valhalla spacious lies in its midst there odin shall choose his own each day of the warriors fallen in war tis easily known by all who come to visit odin's folk with shafts tis raftered with shields tis roofed with burnies the benches are strewn tis easily known by all who come to visit odin's folk there hangs a wolf for the western door and an eagle hovers over the sixth is sound home where thiazi bode that fearful jutun of yore now skadi dwells fair bride of gods in her father's former home the seventh is broad gleam there hath baldr set him a hall on high away in the land where i ween are found the fewest tokens of ill the eighth is heaven hill world bright heimdall rules o'er its holy fanes in that peaceful hall the watchman of gods glad-hearted the good mead quaffs the ninth is folk field freya rules there choice of seats in the hall one half the dead she chooses each day but half the war-father owns the tenth is glistener pillared with gold and eke with silver roofed there forseti dwells nigh the long day through the judge and soothes all strife the eleventh is noatun newered in that haven hath built him a hall by the sea a prince of men ever faultless found he holds the high-built fanes with brushwood grows and with grasses high wood home vidar's land from his steed that son of odin shall show him strong to avenge his sire the sky road to valhalla the thunder flood roars while sports the fish of the mighty wolf therein o'erwhelming seems the flow of that stream for the host of slain to wade halls five hundred and forty more hath the lightning abode in its bendings of all the high-roofed houses i know highest is that of the thunderer valhalla death barrier stands the sacred gate on the plain for the sacred doors old is the lattice and few have learned how it is closed on the latch doors five hundred and forty more i ween may be found in valhalla and eight hundred chosen pass through each one when they fare to fight with the wolf their sooty face boils in sooty flame the boar called sooty black tis the best of fare which few have heard is the chosen warrior's food glorying the battle wont father of hosts feeds ravener and greed his wolves but on wine alone ever odin lives the weapon famed god of war ravens hugin and munin of thought and memory wing the wide world each day i tremble for thought lest he come not again yet for memory more i fear the waters of the world sky bright o'er valhalla stands the goat who gnaws the shelterer's boughs she fills a bowl with the shining mead tis a draught which runs not dry oak thorn o'er valhalla stands the heart who gnaws the shelterer's boughs run drops from his horns into roaring kettle whence flow all floods in the world cormped and ormped and the bath-tubs twain these must the thunderer wade when he fares each day to his throne of doom under yggdrasil's ash there bifrus burns the bridge of the gods and the mighty waters well glad one goldie gleamer race giant silvery lock and sinewy shiner pale hoof gold lock lightfoot these are the steeds which the gods ride when they fare each day to their thrones of doom under yggdrasil's ash the world trees torments there are three roots stretching three diverse ways from under yggdrasil's ash neath the first dwells hell neath the second frost giants and humankind neath the third an eagle sits in the boughs of the ash knowing much of many things and a hawk is perched storm pale aloft betwixt that eagle's eyes ratatosk is the squirrel with gnawing tooth which runs in yggdrasil's ash he bears the eagle's words from above and to fierce stinger tells below there are four hearts too who with heads thrown back gnaw the topmost boughs of the tree dain the dead one dvalin the dallier 
Do ne'er endure a thror. More serpents lie under Yggdrasil's ash than a witless fool would ween. Goin and Moin, the offspring of grave monster, Greyback and grave haunting worm, weaver and soother. I ween they must ever rend the twigs of the trees. Yggdrasil's ash suffers anguish more than mortal has ever known. On high gnaw hearts it rots at the side, and fierce stinger rends it beneath. Then cries he from the fire torment, Would that hrist and mist would bear me a horn, my Valkyrie's axe and spear point, bond and war fetter, battle and might, shrieker and spear fierce in strife, shield fierce, counsel fierce, strength maiden, all who bear ale to the chosen in war. Sun and Earth early woke all fleet hence must these horses wearily draw up the sun but under their withers the gods gracious powers and iron coolness have hid there is one called the cooler who stands for the sun a shield from the shining goddess the mountains i ween and the stormy sea will flame if he fall from thence skul is the wolf called who hunts the bright sun goddess even to the sheltering grove a second fair's moon hater offspring of fenrir in front of that fair bride of heaven from the flesh of ymir the world was formed from his blood the billows of the sea the hills from his bones the trees from his hair the sphere of heaven from his skull out of his brows the blithe powers made midgarth for sons of men and out of his brains were the angry clouds all shaped above in the sky the kettle is taken off the fire in geirud's hall the favour of ul and of all the powers to him touching first the fire for gods can enter the homes of men when the kettle is raised from the hearth the treasures of the world went the wielder's sons of old to build skidbladnir the wooden bladed best of all ships for the bright god frey ever bountiful son of Njord yggdrasil's ash tis the best of trees but skidbladnir of ships odin of gods sleipnir of steeds bifrost of bridges bragi of skalds habrok of hawks and garm of hounds grimnir reveals himself as odin now my face have i shown to the war god's sons therewith shall help awake and the gods shall gather all glad to the bench in ygir's feasting hall dulled with ale art thou geirud too much hast thou drunk of great treasure art thou deprived bereft of my help and of all chosen warriors even the favour of odin much have i told thee but little thou mindest by tricks thou hast been betrayed ere long shall i see thy sword good friend lying all bathed in blood thy days are run out the dread warfather owns him who is slain by the sword the spirits are hostile behold now tis odin more nigh shalt thou come if thou canst he makes known his names they have called me hoodwinker called me wanderer helm-bearer lord of the host welcomer third highest wave and slender high one dazzler of hell they have called me soothsayer true and fickle on-driver eager in war flashing-eyed flaming-eyed bale-worker shapeshifter veiled one masked one wile-wise and much-wise broad hat long-beard war-father on-thruster all-father death-father on-rider freight-wafter ne'er was i called by one name alone since i passed through the people of men they called me grimnir the masked one at geirud's yalk was i named at osmond's keeler once when i drew the sledge thror in council in strife the stormer wish-giver wind-roar tree-rocker equal ranked greybeard and wizard of gods they called me sage and wise when i duped the old jutun who dwells neath the earth and slew single-handed the glorious son of that monster who owned the mead they call me now odin but erewhile the dread one thund was i called before that watcher and shaker wafter and counsellor maker and yalk among gods weaver and soother names which i deem come all from myself alone king geirud was sitting by with a half-drawn sword across his knees 
when he knew that odin was there he rose up desiring to remove the god from the fire but as he did so the sword slipped out of his hand point upwards while losing his feet he fell forward upon it and was pierced through and slain then odin vanished and agnar was left to rule long time as king end of part one the sayings of grimnir part two the wisdom of allwise allwise ere long shall a bride deck the bench beside me we will hasten home together swift in my wooing shall i seem to all beings but at home none shall hinder my peace thor what being art thou so pale of hue hast dwelt to-night with the dead a likeness to giants i trow hangs o'er thee thou wast not born for a bride Allwise, I am allwise who dwell far under the earth. I hide in a rock for my home. I look for the thunderer, lord of the goat wain. Let none break a firm sworn vow. Thor, I will break it. Who rule o'er the bride as father? He alone among gods is the giver. I was far from home when that fair maid of mine was promised thee ever as bride. Allwise, what hero is this? who holds in his power that fair glowing maiden as gift like a far straying arrow none knows who thou art nor whence all the wealth which thou wearest thor winged thunder am i wide have i wandered son of sigrani long-bearded ne'er with my will shalt thou win the young maiden and get thee a wife among gods all wise thy good will then must i speedily gain and win me a wife among gods I would liefer hold in my arms than lack that snow-white maiden as mine. Thor. The maiden's love thou shalt not lack, stranger, who seemest wise, if thou canst tell out of every world all that I long to learn. Tell me this all-wise, since thou art learned in the ways of all beings, I ween, how is earth which lies spread before sons of men, named by the whites of all worlds? All-wise earth tis named among men but field among gods wains call it ever the way jutuns fair green elves the grower high powers call it clay thor tell me this all-wise since thou art learned in the ways of all beings i ween how is heaven which once was born of ymir named by the whites of all worlds all-wise heaven tis named among men time-teller among gods wains call it weaver of wind Jutun's overworld, elves the fair roof, dwarfs the dripping hall. Thor, tell me this all-wise, since thou art learned in the ways of all beings, I ween. How is the moon which men behold named by the whites of all worlds? All-wise, moon tis named among men, the ball among gods, but the whirling wheel in hell. Of Jutun's the hastener, of dwarfs the shimmerer, tis year-teller called of elves thor tell me this all-wise since thou art learned in the ways of all beings i ween how is soul which the sons of men behold named by the whites of all worlds all-wise soul tis named among men but sun among gods dwarfs call it dallier's playmate ever glowing the jutuns fair wheel the elves all shine the children of gods thor tell me this all-wise since thou art learned in the ways of all beings i ween how are clouds of the sky that with showers are mingled named by the whites of all worlds all wise they are clouds among men shower promised to gods wind floater called of wains rain omen of jutuns storm might of elves helm of the hidden in hell thor tell me this all wise since thou art learned in the ways of all beings i ween how is the wind which wanders wide named by the whites of all worlds all wise wind tis named among men but waverer of gods the wise powers call it whinnier jutuns the howler elves roaring rider in hell tis called swooping storm thor tell me this all wise since thou art learned in the ways of all beings i ween how is the calm ever wont to rest named by the whites of all worlds all wise calm tis named among men sea rest among gods wains ever call it wind lull 
Jotuns the swelterer, elves day soother, dwarfs the refuge of day. Thor. Tell me this all wise, since thou art learned in the ways of all beings, I ween. How is the sea which is sailed of men, named by the whites of all worlds? All wise. Sea tis named among men, wide ocean of gods. Wains call it flowing wave. Jotuns ilholm, elves the water stave, by dwarfs tis called the deep. Thor, tell me this all wise, since thou art learned in the ways of all beings, I ween. How is fire which burns before men's sons, named by the whites of all worlds? All wise, fire tis named among men, but flame among gods, wains call it leaping wave. Jotuns the ravener, hell folk the racer, dwarfs the burning bane. Thor, tell me this all wise, since thou art learned in the ways of all beings, I ween. How is wood which waxes before men's sons named by the whites of all worlds? All wise. Wood tis named among men, wold locks among gods, by heroes seaweed of the hills. Jotun's life feeder, elves the fair limbed, waves ever call it wand. Thor. Tell me this all wise, since thou art learned in the ways of all beings, I ween. How is night who is born the daughter of Nur named by the whites of all worlds? all wise she is night among men but mist among gods the high powers call her hood the jotuns unlight elves the sleep joy dwarfs the goddess of dreams thor tell me this all wise since thou art learned in the ways of all beings i ween how is seed which is sown by the sons of men named by the whites of all worlds all wise tis named barley among men but bare among gods Wains call it growth of the ground. Jotun's foodstuff, elves the sapstaff, hell dwellers drooping head. Thor, tell me this all wise, since thou art learned in the ways of all beings, I ween. How is ale which sons of men drink oft, named by the whites of all worlds? All wise, ale tis named among men, but beer among gods, the stirring draught of wains, of Jotun's clear flowing, of hell folk mead, by the sons of Sutung feast. Thor. Not e'er have I found in the bosom of one more learning of olden lore, but with wiles art thou duped, thus dallying here, while dawn is upon thee, dwarf. Behold, sun shines in the hall. All wise the dwarf is turned into stone. End of part two. The wisdom of all wise. Part three. THE WORDS OF THE MIGHTY WEAVER Odin Now counsel me, Frigg, for I fain would seek the mighty weaver of words. I yearn to strive with that all-wise giant in learning of olden lore. Frigg Nay, father of hosts, I fain would keep thee at home in the garth of the gods. No giant I deem so dread and wise as that mighty weaver of words. Odin far have i fared much have i ventured oft have i proved the powers this now must i know how the house-folk fare in the mighty weaver's home frigg then safely go come safely again and safely wend thy way may thy wit avail thee father of beings when thou weavest words with the giant then odin went to prove with words the wisdom of the all-wise giant he reached the hall of the Jotun race the dread one entered forthwith. Odin. Hail, mighty weaver. Here in this hall I have come thyself to see. And first will try if thou art in truth all wise and all knowing, giant. Weaver. What man is here who dares in my hall to throw his words at me thus? Thou shalt ne'er come forth again from our courts if thou be not the wiser of twain. Odin. Riddle reader, I am called i come from my roaming thirsty here to thy halls in need of welcome and kindly greeting long way have i wandered giant weaver why speak riddle reader standing thus take here thy seat in the hall and soon shall be seen who knows the more stranger or ancient sage odin let the penniless wretch in the house of the rich speak needful words or none prating i ween works ill for him who comes to the cold in heart Section 1. The Proving of Riddle Reader Weaver. Say, Riddle Reader, since on the floor thou fain wouldst show thy skill, 
how the steed is called which draws each day over the children of men odin tis shining mane who draws bright day over the children of men they hold him best of steeds in the host streams light from his mane evermore weaver say riddle reader since on the floor thou fain wouldst show thy skill how the steed is called who forth from the east draws night o'er the blessed powers odin tis rimy mane who draws evermore each night o'er the blessed powers he lets fall drops from his bit each dawning thence comes dew in the dales weaver say riddle reader since on the floor thou fain wouldst show thy skill how the river is called which parts the realm of the jotun race from the gods odin that river is ifing which parts the realm of the jotun race from the gods free shall it flow while life days last never ice shall come o'er that stream weaver say riddle reader since on the floor thou fain wouldst show thy skill how the field is called wherein strife shall meet dark sort and the gracious gods odin warpath is the field wherein strife shall meet dark sort and the gracious gods a hundred miles it measures each way tis the field marked out by fate weaver wise art thou stranger but come now and sit by my side on the jotun seat let us talk and wager on wisdom of mind our two heads here in the hall odin seats himself by the giant part two the proving of the mighty weaver odin answer well the first if thou hast the wit and knowest mighty weaver from whence the earth and the heavens on high wise giant came once to be weaver from the flesh of ymir the world was formed from his bones were mountains made and heaven from the skull of that frost-cold giant from his blood the billows of the sea odin answer well the second if thou hast the wit and knowest mighty weaver whence moon hath come who fares over men and whence sun hath had her source weaver the mover of the handle is father of moon and the father eke of sun round the heavens they roll each day for measuring of years to men odin answer well the third if thou hast the wit and knowest mighty weaver whence day arose to pass o'er the race and night with her waning moons weaver there is one called dawning the father of day but night was born of nur new and waning moons the wise powers wrought for measuring of years to men odin answer well the fourth if thou hast the wit and knowest mighty weaver whence winter came and warm summer first the wise powers once among weaver there is one called sweet sooth father of summer but wind cool is winter's sire the son was he of sorrow seed all fierce and dread is that race odin answer well the fifth if thou hast the wit and knowest mighty weaver who was born of gods or of jotun brood the eldest in days of yore weaver untold winters ere earth was fashioned roaring bergelm was born his father was thrudgelm of mighty voice loud-sounding ymir his grandsire odin answer well the sixth if thou hast the wit and knowest mighty weaver whence came ymir loud-sounding jotun the first of thy race wise giant weaver from stormy billow sprang poison drops which waxed into jotun form and from him are come the whole of our kin all fierce and dread is that race odin answer well the seventh if thou hast the wit and knowest mighty weaver how that ancient being begot his children who knew not joy of a giantess weaver tis said that under the frost giant's arm grew a boy and girl together foot with foot begot of that first wise giant and a six-headed son was born odin answer well the eighth if thou hast the wit and knowest mighty weaver what mind'st thou of old and didst earliest know since i ween thou art all wise giant weaver untold winters ere earth was shaped roaring bergam was born i mind the first when that most wise giant of old in a cradle was laid odin answer well the ninth if thou hast the wit and knowest mighty weaver whence comes a wind which fares o'er the waves but which never man hath seen 
Weaver. Corpse swallower sits at the end of heaven, a Jotun in eagle form. From his wings, they say, comes the wind which fares over all the dwellers of earth. Odin. Answer well the tenth, since all tidings of gods thou knowest, mighty weaver. Whence Nierd first came, mid the Aesir kin, courts and altars he owns in hundreds, who was not reared in their race. Weaver. In Wayne home once the wise powers made him, and gave him as hostage to gods. In the story of time he shall yet come home to the wise foreseeing wanes. Odin. Answer well the eleventh, since they call thee wise, if thou knowest, mighty weaver, who are the beings who thus do battle in the dwellings of Odin each day. Weaver. All the chosen warriors are waging war in the dwellings of Odin each day. They choose the slain, ride home from the strife, then at peace sit down together. Odin. Answer well the twelfth, how all the story of the powers thou knowest, weaver. Canst thou truly tell me the secrets of Jotuns and all the gods, wise giant? Weaver. Most truly I can tell thee the secrets of Jotuns and all the gods. Since I have been into every world, even nine worlds, to mist hell beneath, whither die the dead from hell. Odin. Far have I fared, much have I ventured, oft have I proved the power what beings shall live when the long dread winter comes o'er the people of earth weaver life and life craver who hidden shall lie in the boughs of yggdrasil's ash morning dews they shall have as meat thence shall come new kindreds of men odin far have i fared much have i ventured oft have i proved the powers whence comes a new sun in the clear heaven again when the wolf has swallowed the old weaver one daughter alone shall that elf beam bear before she is swallowed by the wolf and the maid shall ride on the mother's path after the powers have perished odin far have i fared much have i ventured oft have i proved the powers who are those maidens who pass o'er the sea wandering wise in mind weaver there fly three troops of mugthrasir's maidens and hover over homes of men the only guardian spirits on earth and they are of jotuns born odin far have i fared much have i ventured oft have i proved the powers who shall afterwards hold the wealth of the gods when the fire of dark surt is slaked weaver in the fanes of the gods shall dwell vidar and vali when the fire of dark surt is slaked to modi and magni shall mjolnir be given when to thor comes the end of strife odin far have i fared much have i ventured oft have i proved the powers what foe shall bring at the doom of gods to odin the end of life weaver fenrir shall swallow the father of men but this shall vidar avenge with his sword he shall cleave the ice-cold jaws of the mighty monster in strife odin far have i fared much have i ventured oft have i proved the powers what spake odin's self in the ear of his son when baldr was laid on the bale-fire weaver that no man knows what thou didst speak of old in the ear of thy son thus with faded lips have i uttered old lore and told the great doom of the powers for i have striven in word skill with odin's self thou art ever the wisest of all end of part three the words of the mighty weaver part four the words of odin the high one wisdom for wanderers and counsel to guests at every doorway ere one enters one should spy round one should pry round for uncertain is the witting that there be no foeman sitting within before one on the floor hail ye givers a guest is come say where shall he sit within much pressed is he who fain on the hearth would seek for warmth and weal he hath need of fire who now is come numbed with cold to the knee food and clothing the wanderer craves who has fared o'er the rimy fell he craves for water who comes for refreshment drying and friendly bidding marks of good will fair fame if tis won and welcome once and again he hath need of his wits who wanders wide aught simple will serve at home 
but a gazing stock is the fool who sits mid the wise and nothing knows let no man glory in the greatness of his mind but rather keep watch o'er his wits cautious and silent let him enter a dwelling to the heedful come seldom harm for none can find a more faithful friend than his wealth of mother wit let the wary stranger who seeks refreshment keep silent with sharpened hearing with his ears let him listen and look with his eyes thus each wise man spies out the way happy is he who wins for himself fair fame and kindly words but uneasy is that which a man doth own while it lies in another's breast happy is he who hath in himself praise and wisdom in life for oft doth a man ill counsel get when tis born in another's breast a better burden can no man bear on the way than his mother wit tis the refuge of the poor and richer it seems than wealth in a world untried a better burden can no man bear on the way than his mother wit and no worse provision can he carry with him than too deep a draught of ale less good than they say for the sons of men is the drinking oft of ale for the more they drink the less can they think and keep a watch o'er their wits a bird of unmindfulness flutters o'er ale feasts whiling away men's wits with the feathers of that fowl i was fettered once in the garths of gunlow below drunk was i then i was overdrunk in that crafty Utun's court but best is an ale feast when man is able to call back his wits at once silent and thoughtful and bold in strife the prince's bairn should be joyous and generous let each man show him until he shall suffer death a coward believes he will ever live if he keep him safe from strife but old age leaves him not long in peace though spears may spare his life a fool will gape when he goes to a friend and mumble only or mope but pass him the ale cup and all in a moment the mind of that man is shown he knows alone who has wandered wide and far has fared on the way what manner of mind a man doth own who is wise of head and heart keep not the mead cup but drink thy measure speak needful words or none none shall upbraid thee for lack of breeding if soon thou seek'st thy rest a greedy man if he be not mindful eats to his own life's hurt oft the belly of the fool will bring him to scorn when he seeks the circle of the wise herds know the hour of their going home and turn them again from the grass but never is found a foolish man who knows the measure of his maw the miserable man and evil-minded makes of all things mockery and knows not that which he best should know that he is not free from faults the unwise man is awake all night and ponders everything over when morning comes he is weary in mind and all is a burden as ever the unwise man weans all who smile and flatter him are his friends nor notes how oft they speak him ill when he sits in the circle of the wise the unwise man weans all who smile and flatter him are his friends but when he shall come into court he shall find there are few to defend his cause the unwise man thinks all to know while he sits in a sheltered nook but he knows not one thing what he shall answer if men shall put him to proof for the unwise man tis best to be mute when he comes amid the crowd for none is aware of his lack of wit if he wastes not too many words for he who lacks wit shall never learn though his words flow ne'er so fast wise he is deemed who can question well and also answer back the sons of men can no secret make of the tidings told in their midst too many unstable words are spoken by him who ne'er holds his peace the hasty tongue sings its own mishap if it be not bridled in let no man be held as a laughing-stock though he come as guest for a meal 
wise enough seem many while they sit dry skinned and are not put to proof a guest thinks him witty who mocks at a guest and runs from his wrath away but none can be sure who jests at a meal that he makes not fun among foes oft though their hearts lean towards one another friends are divided at table ever the source of strife twill be that guest will anger guest a man should take always his meals betimes unless he visit a friend or he sits and mopes and half famished seems and can ask or answer naught long is the round to a false friend leading e'en if he dwell on the way but though far off fared to a faithful friend straight are the roads and short a guest must depart again on his way nor stay in the same place ever if he bide too long on another's bench the loved one soon becomes loathed one's own house is best though small it may be each man is master at home though he have but two goats and a bark thatched hut tis better than craving a boon one's own house is best though small it may be each man is master at home with a bleeding heart will he beg who must his meat at every meal let a man never stir on his road a step without his weapons of war for unsure is the knowing when need shall arise of a spear on the way without i found none so noble or free with his food who was not gladdened with a gift nor one who gave of his gifts such store but he loved reward could he win it let no man stint him and suffer need of the wealthiest one in life oft is saved for a foe what was meant for a friend and much goes worse than one weans with raiment and arms shall friends gladden each other so has one proved oneself for friends last longest if fate be fair who give and give again to his friend a man should bear him as friend and gift for gift bestow laughter for laughter let him exchange but leasing pay for a lie to his friend a man should bear him as friend to him and a friend of his but let him beware that he be not the friend of one who is friend to his foe hast thou a friend whom thou trustest well from whom thou cravest good share thy mind with him gifts exchange with him fair to find him oft but hast thou one whom thou trustest ill yet from whom thou cravest good thou shalt speak him fair but falsely think and leasing pay for a lie yet further of him whom thou trusted ill and whose mind thou dost misdoubt thou shalt laugh with him but withhold thy thought for gift with like gift should be paid young was i once i walked alone and bewildered seemed in the way then i found me another and rich i thought me for man is the joy of man most blessed is he who lives free and bold and nurses never a grief for the fearful man is dismayed by aught and the mean one mourns over giving my garments once i gave in the field to two landmarks made as men heroes they seemed when once they were clothed tis the naked who suffer shame the pine tree wastes which is perched on the hill nor bark nor needles shelter it such is the man whom none doth love for what should he longer live fiercer than fire among ill friends for five days love will burn but anon tis quenched when the sixth day comes and all friendship soon is spoiled not great things alone must one give to another praise oft is earned for naught with half a loaf and a tilted bowl i have found me many a friend little the sand if little the seas little are minds of men for ne'er in the world were all equally wise tis shared by the fools and the sage wise in measure let each man be but let him not wax too wise for never the happiest of men is he who knows much of many things wise in measure should each man be but let him not wax too wise seldom a heart will sing with joy if the owner be all too wise wise in measure should each man be 
but ne'er let him wax too wise who looks not forward to learn his fate unburdened heart will bear brand kindles from brand until it be burned spark is kindled from spark man unfolds him by speech with man but grows over secret through silence he must rise betimes who fain of another or life or wealth would win scarce falls the prey to sleeping wolves or to slumberers victory and strife he must rise betimes who hath few to serve him and see to his work himself who sleeps at morning is hindered much to the keen is wealth half won of dry logs saved and roof bark stored a man can know the measure of firewood too which should last him out quarter and half years to come fed and washed should one ride to court though in garments none too new thou shalt not shame thee for shoes or breeks nor yet for a sorry steed like an eagle swooping over old ocean snatching after his prey so comes a man into court who finds there are few to defend his cause each man who is wise and would wise be called must ask and answer aright let one know thy secret but never a second if three a thousand shall know a wise counselled man will be mild in bearing and use his might in measure lest when he come his fierce foes among he find others fiercer than he each man should be watchful and wary in speech and slow to put faith in a friend for the words which one to another speaks he may win reward of ill at many a feast i was far too late and much too soon at some drunk was the ale or yet unserved never hits he the joint who is hated here and there to a home i had haply been asked had i needed no meat at my meals or were two hams left hanging in the home of that friend where i had partaken of one most dear is fire to the sons of men most sweet the sight of the sun good is health if one can but keep it and to live a life without shame not reft of all is he who is ill for some are blessed in their bairns some in their kin and some in their wealth and some in working well more blessed are the living than the lifeless tis the living who comes by the cow i saw the hearth fire burn in the rich man's hall and himself lying dead at the door the lame can ride horse the handless drive cattle the deaf one can fight and prevail tis happier for the blind than for him on the bale fire for no man hath care for a corpse best have a son though he be late born and before him the father be dead seldom are stones on the wayside raised save by kinsman to kinsman two are hosts against one the tongue is the head's bane neath a rough hide a hand may be hid he is glad at nightfall who knows of his lodging short is his ship's berth and changeful the autumn night much veers the wind ere the fifth day and blows round yet more in a month he that learns naught will never know how one is the fool of another for if one be rich another is poor and for that should bear no blame cattle die and kinsmen die thyself too soon must die but one thing never i ween will die fair fame of one who has earned cattle die and kinsmen die thyself too soon must die but one thing never i ween will die the doom on each one dead full stock folds had the fatling's son who bare now a beggar's staff brief as wealth as the winking of an eye most faithless ever of friends if haply a fool should find for himself wealth or a woman's love pride waxes in him but wisdom never and onward he fares in his folly all will prove true that thou askest of runes those that are come from the gods which the high powers wrought and which odin painted then silence is surely best maxims for all men praise day at even a wife when dead a weapon when tried a maid when married ice when tis crossed and ale when tis drunk 
hew wood in wind sail the trees in a breeze woo a maid in the dark for day's eyes are many work a ship for its gliding a shield for its shelter a sword for its striking a maid for her kiss drink ale by the fire but slide on the ice buy a steed when tis lanky a sword when tis rusty feed thy horse neath a roof and thy hound in the yard the speech of a maiden should no man trust nor the words which a woman says for their hearts were shaped on a whirling wheel and falsehood fixed in their breasts breaking bow or flaring flame ravening wolf or croaking raven routing swine or rootless tree waxing wave or seething cauldron flying arrows or falling billow ice of a night-time coiling adder woman's bed-talk or broken blade play of bears or a prince's child sickly calf or self-willed thrall witch's flattery new-slain foe brother's slayer though seen on the highway half-burned house or horse too swift useless were it with one leg broken be never so trustful as these to trust let none put faith in the first sown fruit nor yet in his son too soon whim rules the child and weather the field each is open to chance like the love of women whose thoughts are lies is the driving unroughshod or slippery ice of a two-year-old ill-tamed and gay or in a wild wind steering a helmless ship or the lame catching reindeer in the rhyme thawed fell lessons for lovers now plainly i speak since both i have seen unfaithful is man to maid we speak them fairest when thoughts are falsest and while the wisest of hearts let him speak soft words and offer wealth who longs for a woman's love praise the shape of the shining maid he wins who thus doth woo never a wit should one blame another whom love hath brought into bonds oft a witching form will fetch the wise which holds not the heart of fools never a wit should one blame another for a folly which many befalls the might of love makes sons of men into fools who once were wise the mind knows alone what is nearest the heart and sees where the soul is turned no sickness seems to the wise so sore as in naught to know content odin's love quests this once i felt when i sat without in the reeds and looked for my love body and soul of me was that sweet maiden yet never i won her as wife billing's daughter i found on her bed fairer than sunlight sleeping and the sweets of lordship seemed to me naught save i lived with that lovely form yet nearer evening come thou odin if thou wilt woo a maiden all were undone save two new alone such a secret deed of shame so away i turned from my wise intent and deemed my joy assured for all her liking and all her love i weened that i yet should win when i came ere long the war troop bold were watching and waking all with burning brands and torches borne they showed me my sorrowful way yet nearer morning i went once more the house-folk slept in the hall but soon i found a barking dog tied fast to that fair maid's couch many a sweet maid when one knows her mind is fickle found towards men i proved it well when that prudent lass i sought to lead astray shrewd maid she sought me with every insult and i won therewith no wife odin's quest after the song mead in thy home be joyous and generous to guests discreet shalt thou be in thy bearing mindful and talkative wouldst thou gain wisdom oft making mention of good he is simpleton named who has naught to say for such is the fashion of fools i sought that old yutun and now safe in my back little served my silence there but whispering many soft speeches i won my desire in sutung's halls i bored me a road there with rati's tusk and made room to pass through the rock while the ways of the yutun stretched over and under i dared my life for a draught twas gunnlod who gave me on a golden throne a draught of the glorious mead 
but with poor reward did i pay her back for her true and troubled heart in a wily disguise i worked my will little is lacking to the wise for the soul stirrer now sweet mead of song is brought to men's earthly abode i misdoubt me if ever again i had come from the realms of the Yutun race had i not served me of gunlod sweet woman her whom i held in mine arms came forth next day the dread frost giants and entered the high one's hall they asked was the bale worker back mid the powers or had Sutung slain him below a ring oath odin i trow had taken how shall one trust his troth twas he who stole the mead from Sutung and gunlod caused to weep the counselling of the stray singer tis time to speak from the sage's seat hard by the well of weird i saw and was silent i saw and pondered i listened to the speech of men of runes they spoke and the reading of runes was little withheld from their lips at the high one's hall in the high one's hall i thus heard the high one say i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy wheel if thou winnest them rise never at night-time except thou art spying or seekest a spot without i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy will if thou winst them thou shalt never sleep in the arms of a sorceress lest she should lock thy limbs so shall she charm that thou shalt not heed the counsel or words of the king nor care for thy food or the joys of mankind but fall into sorrowful sleep i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy will if thou winst them seek not ever to draw to thyself in love whispering another's wife i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy will if thou winst them should thou long to fare over fell and firth provide thee well with food i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy will if thou winst them tell not ever an evil man if misfortunes thee befall from such ill friend thou needst never seek return for thy trustful mind wounded to death have i seen a man by the words of an evil woman a lying tongue had bereft him of life and all without reason of right i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy wheel if thou winnest them hast thou a friend whom thou trustest well fare thou to find him oft for with brushwood grows and with grasses high the path where no foot doth pass i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy wheel if thou winnest them in sweet converse call the righteous to thy side learn a healing song while thou livest i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy wheel if thou winnest them be never the first with friend of thine to break the bond of fellowship care shall gnaw thy heart if thou canst not tell all thy mind to another i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy wheel if thou winnest them never in speech with a foolish knave shouldst thou waste a single word from the lips of such thou needst not look for reward of thine own good will but a righteous man by praise will render thee firm in favour and love there is mingling in friendship when men can utter all his whole mind to another there is not so vile as a fickle tongue no friend is he who but flatters i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy wheel if thou winnest them strive not in three words with a man worse than thee oft the worst lays the best one low i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy wheel if thou winnest them be not a shoemaker nor yet a shaft-maker save for thyself alone 
let the shoe be misshapen or crooked the shaft and a curse on thy head will be called i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy weal if thou winnest them when in peril thou seest thee confess thee in peril nor ever give peace to thy foes i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy weal if thou winnest them rejoice not ever at tidings of ill but glad let thy soul be in good i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy weal if thou winnest them look not up in battle when men are as beasts lest the whites bewitch thee with spells i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy weal if thou winnest them wouldst thou win joy of a gentle maiden and lure to whispering of love thou shalt make fair promise and let it be fast none will scorn their weal who can win it i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy weal if thou winnest them i pray thee be wary yet not too wary be wariest of all with ale with another's wife and a third thing eke that knaves outwit thee never i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy weal if thou winnest them hold not in scorn nor mock in thy halls a guest or wandering wife they know but unsurely who sit within what manner of man is come none is found so good but some fault attends him or so ill but he serves for somewhat i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy weal if thou winnest them hold never in scorn the hoary singer off the counsel of the old is good come words of wisdom from the withered lips of him left to hang among hides to rock with the rennets and swing with the skins i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy weal if thou winnest them growl not at guests nor drive them from the gate but show thyself gentle to the poor mighty is the bar to be moved away for the entering in of all shower thy wealth or men shall wish thee every ill in thy limbs i counsel thee stray singer accept my counsels they will be thy boon if thou obeyest them they will work thy weal if thou winnest them when ale thou quaffest call upon earth's might tis earth drinks in the floods earth prevails o'er drink but fire o'er sickness the oak o'er binding the ear-corn o'er witchcraft the rye spur o'er rupture the moon o'er rages herb o'er cattle plagues runes o'er harm odin's quest after the runes i trow i hung on that windy tree nine whole days and nights stabbed with a spear offered to odin myself to mine own self given high on that tree of which none hath heard from what roots it rises to heaven none refreshed me ever with food or drink i peered right down to the deep crying aloud i lifted the runes then back i fell from thence nine mighty songs i learned from the great son of balethorn besla's sire i drank a measure of the wondrous mead with the soul stirrer's drops i was showered ere long i bare fruit and throve full well i grew and waxed in wisdom word following word i found me words deed following deed i wrought deeds hidden runes shalt thou seek in interpreted signs many symbols of might and power by the great singer painted by the high powers fashioned graved by the utterer of gods for gods graved odin for elves graved dane dvalin the dallier for dwarfs all wise for jutuns and i of myself graved some for the sons of men dost know how to write dost know how to read dost know how to paint dost know how to prove dost know how to ask dost know how to offer dost know how to send dost know how to spend better ask for too little than offer too much like the gift should be the boon better not to send than to overspend thus odin graved ere the world began 
Then he rose from the deep and came again. The Song of Spells Those songs I know which nor sons of men nor queen in a king's court knows. The first is help which will bring thee help in all woes and in sorrow and strife. A second I know which the son of men must sing who would heal the sick. A third I know if sore need should come of a spell to stay my foes when I sing that song which shall blunt their swords nor their weapons nor staves can wound a fourth i know if men make fast in chains the joints of my limbs when i sing that song which shall set me free spring the fetters from hands and feet a fifth i know when i see by foes shot speeding a shaft through the host flies it never so strongly i still can stay it if i get but a glimpse of its flight a sixth i know when some thane would harm me in runes on a moist tree's root on his head alone shall light the ills of the curse that he called upon mine a seventh i know if i see a hole high o'er the benchmates blazing flame it ne'er so fiercely i still can save it i know how to sing that song an eighth i know which all can sing for their weal if they learn it well where hate shall wax mid the warrior's sons i can calm it soon with that song a ninth i know when need befalls me to save my vessel afloat i hush the wind on the stormy wave and soothe all the sea to rest a tenth i know when at night the witches ride and sport in the air such spells i weave that they wander home out of skins and wits bewildered an eleventh i know if haply i lead my old comrades out to war i sing neath the shields and they fare forth mightily safe into battle safe out of battle and safe return from the strife a twelfth i know if i see in a tree a corpse from a halter hanging such spells i write and paint in runes that the being descends and speaks a thirteenth i know if the new-born son of a warrior i sprinkle with water that youth will not fail when he fares to war never slain shall he bow before sword a fourteenth i know if i needs must number the powers to the people of men i know all the nature of gods and of elves which none can know untaught a fifteenth i know which folkstirer sang the dwarf at the gates of dawn he sang strength to the gods and skill to the elves and wisdom to odin who utters a sixteenth i know when all sweetness and love i would win from some artful wench her heart i turn and the whole mind change of that fair-armed lady i love a seventeenth i know so that e'en the shy maiden is slow to shun my love these songs stray singer which man's son knows not long shalt thou lack in life though thy weal if thou winnest them thy boon if thou obeyest them thy good if haply thou gainst them an eighteenth i know which i ne'er shall tell to maiden or wife of man save alone to my sister or haply to her who folds me fast in her arms most safe are secrets known to but one the songs are sung to an end now the sayings of the high one are uttered in the hall for the weal of men for the woe of utuns hail thou who hast spoken hail thou that knowest hail ye that have hearkened use thou who hast learned end of part four part five the lay of hymir of old when the war gods their prey had won them in mood for feasting and still unsated they shook divining twigs scanned the blood drops and found all dainties in aegir's halls as the rock giant sat in his wave brood rejoicing and seemed in likeness the son of mist blind came thor and looked in his eyes with threatening make now a goodly feast for the gods but the harsh-voiced hero angered the giant who forthwith pondered revenge on the powers he bade the thunderer bring him a cauldron wherein for all of you ale i may brew the glorious gods the holy powers such vessel as this could nowhere find till tyr the trusty whispered in secret words of friendly counsel to thor tyr there dwells to the east of stormy billow the all-wise hymir at heaven's end 
my fierce-souled father who owns the kettle the broad-roomed cauldron a full mile deep thor dost know can we win that water seether tear if we use wiles thereto my friend so forth they drove through the livelong day till they came from asgarth to egil's home he stalled the goats of the splendid horns while they turned to the hall which hymir owned unsightly seemed to tear his grandam for heads she had nine hundred in all but another came all golden forth fair browed and bearing to her son the ale cup hymir's wife kinsman of giants fain would i hide you neath yon cauldrons though bold of heart for my lord and master oft-time shows him mean to strangers moves soon to wrath long tarried that monster fierce mooded hymir ere he came from his hunting home he entered the hall and icicles clashed all frozen was the bushy beard on his chin wife hail to thee hymir be gracious in mood for here in thy halls is come our offspring whom long we awaited from distant ways and with him fares the foe of giants the friend of men whose name is warder dost see where they hide the hall gable under sheltering themselves with a pillar between but the column was shattered at the glance of the giant the mighty rafter was reft asunder down from the beam eight cauldrons crashed one hard hammered alone was whole then forth they stepped but the ancient Utun ever followed the foe with his eyes for evil whispered his mind when he saw the bane of giant wives stand on the hearth yet took they soon of the oxen three and hymir bade them cook forthwith each one left they less by a head and laid them soon on the seething fire then ere he slumbered the thunderer ate himself alone of the oxen twain but hymir the hoary friend of hrungnir deemed too ample the meal of thor to-morrow at eve shall we three have naught save our hunting spoil whereon to sup spake thor and said he would fish in the sea if the fierce-souled giant would find him bait hymir go if thou darest slayer of rock giants seek thy bait from the herd thyself for such as thou i ween twill seem that bait from an ox were easy to win forthwith sped thor bold youth to the wood and soon all swart stood an ox before him then over its horns the slayer of jutun struck and sundered the head high towering hymir methinks thou art worse by far afoot than at table sitting steerer of barks then the lord of goats bade the low-born churl drive the launch sea-horse further from shore but little he wished that wary giant to row any further over the ocean alone the famous and fierce-souled hymir caught on his hook two whales at once but aft in the stern the son of odin fashioned with craft his fishing line lone serpent slayer and shield of men he baited his hook with the head of the ox and he whom the gods hate gaped thereat the girdle lying all lands beneath then thor drew mightily swift in his doing the poison glistening snake to the side his hammer he lifted and struck from on high the fearful head of fenrir's brother moaned the wild monster the rocks all rumbled the ancient earth shrank into itself then sank the serpent down in the deep so cheerless was the giant as back they rode that for a while not a word he spake then anew he turned the tiller of thought hymir now half the work shalt thou share with me or more thou fast our floating steed or bear the whales to the dwellings home all through the hollows of the wooded hills then the thunderer rose laid hold on the stem he landed the boat with the water therein and the ocean swine with the baler and oars himself he bore to the giant's home but still the jutun stubborn as ever questioned anew the thunderer's might i deem none strong row he ne'er so well save he who hath power to break my cup then the storm god swift when it came to his hands dashed into pieces a pillar of stone yea sitting he hurled the cup through the columns but whole twas borne to hymir again at length the fair mistress with friendly words made known the secret she only knew strike at hymir's skull the food-filled giants tis harder than ever a wine-cup was then rose to his knees a strong lord of goats 
and girt him with all the might of the gods still sound above was the head of hymir shattered below was the shapely wine-cup hymir gone already i trow is my treasure when i see the cup now cast by thee kneeling so spake the churl i can say never more ale in my cauldron now art thou brewed but tis yet to prove if ye can bear the mighty vessel forth from our court twice in vain sought tear to move it ever unstirred the cauldron stood then the father of wrath laid hold on the rim and heaved the cauldron high on his head against his heels the handles clinked as across the hearth he strode down the hall far had they fared ere odin's son had turned him once to look behind and eastward saw from the cairns forthcoming with hymir a war-host hundred-headed from his shoulders raised he the resting cauldron swung he mjolnir death-craving hammer and the monsters all from the mountains slew but they fared not far ere the thunderer's goat had laid him down half dead in the way for lame in the leg was the shaft-bound steed twas the work of loki crafty in wiles but ye have heard for who knows it better of sages learned in the lore of the gods what amends made the dweller in wastes who paid to the thunderer both his bairns swelling with might to the meeting of gods came thor with the cauldron which hymir had owned and the holy ones ever shall well drink ale each harvest of flax in the sea god's hall end of part five the lay of hymir part six the lay of thrym wroth was the thunderer when he awakened and missed his hammer the mighty mjolnir his beard was quivering his locks were shivering as he groped around him the son of earth list now loki to this i shall tell thee these first of all his words he spake no wight in high heaven or earth yet weans it the god of thunder is reft of his hammer then sought they the shining halls of freya and these first of all his words spake thor wilt thou freya lend me thy feather coat that perchance i may find my hammer freya i would give it thee though twere golden still would i grant it though twere silver away flew loki the feather coat rustled till he came without the dwellings of asgarth came within the jutun realms thrym sat on a mound the lord of giants for his greyhounds twisting golden circlets smoothing over the manes of his steeds thrym how do the gods fare how do the elves fare why alone art come into jutunheim loki ill do the gods fare ill do the elves fare speak hast thou hidden the thunderer's hammer thrym yea i have hidden the thunderer's hammer eight miles under deep in the earth and never a being back shall win it till he bring me as bride fair freya away flew loki the feather coat rustled till he came without the realms of the jutuns came within the garths of the gods there midst the courts the thunderer met he and these first of all his words spake thor hast thou had issue meet for thy labour tell out aloft and at length thy tidings for oft when sitting a tale is broken oft when resting a lie is spoken loki i have had toil and issue also thrym has thy hammer lord of giants never a being back shall win it till he bring him as bride fair freya forthwith went they to find fair freya and these first of all his words spake thor bind thee freya in bridal linen we twain must drive into jutunheim wroth then was freya fiercely she panted the halls of asgarth all trembled under burst that mighty necklet of breezings know me to be the most wanton of women if i drive with thee into jutunheim straight were gathered all gods at the doomstead goddesses all were in speech together and the mighty powers upon this took counsel how the thunderer's hammer they should win again spake then heimdall of gods the fairest even as the wains could he see far forward come bind we thor in bridal linen let him wear the mighty brisinga men let us cause the keys to jingle under him weeds of a woman to dangle round him and over his breast lay ample jewels and daintily let us hood his head spake the thunderer of gods the sturdiest womanish then the powers will call me if i let me be bound in bridal linen 
spake then loki the son of laufey silence thor with words so witless soon shall the jotuns dwell in asgarth unless thou get thee again thy hammer then bound they thor in bridal linen eke with the mighty brisinga men they caused the keys to jingle under him weeds of a woman to dangle round him and over his breast laid ample jewels and daintily they hooded his head spake then loki the son of laufey i will fare with thee as thy serving maiden we twain will drive into jotunheim forthwith the goats were homeward driven sped to the traces well must they run rent were the mountains earth was a flame fared odin's son into jotunheim spake then thrym the lord of giants stand up jotuns and strew the benches now shall ye bring me as bride fair freya daughter of njord from noatun golden horned kine are found in my dwellings and oxen all swarthy the joy of the giant i own many treasures i rule many riches and freya alone to me seems lacking swiftly drew the day to evening born was the ale cup forth to the jotuns thor ate an ox and ate whole salmon with dainties all as should a damsel three full cups of mead he quaffed spake then thrym the lord of giants didst ever see damsel eat so bravely ne'er have i seen one bite so boldly nor a maiden quaff more cups of mead all crafty sat by the serving maiden who answer found to the giants asking naught has freya these eight nights eaten so sore her yearning for jotunheim stooped then thrym neath the veil to kiss her back he leapt the hall's whole length why are fair freya's eyes so fearful meseems from those eyes a fire is flaming all crafty sat by the serving maiden who answer found to the giants asking not a whit has freya these eight nights slumbered so sore her yearning for jotunheim in came the wretched sister of jotuns and dared to beg for a bridal token take the red rings from off thy fingers if thou wilt win thee mine affection mine affection all my favour spake then thrym the lord of giants bring in the hammer the bride to hallow mjolnir lay on the knee of the maiden hallow was twain with the hand of the troth goddess laughed in his breast the heart of the thunderers strong was his soul when he spied his hammer he first smote thrym the lord of giants and all the jotuns kindred crushed smote he the ancient sister of jotuns her who had begged for a bridal token she got but a stroke in the place of shillings mjolnir's mark and never a ring and thus thor won him again his hammer end of part six the lay of thrym part seven the story of skirnir once frey son of njord had seated himself on window shelf and was gazing out over all worlds when he looked into jotunheim he beheld a fair maiden going from her father's hall to the bower and at the sight of her he was seized with great sickness of heart now frey's servant was called skirnir and njord bade him ask speech of his master and skadi wife of njord said rise bright skirnir run thou swiftly and beseech our son to speak ask the wise youth to answer thee thus gainst whom his wrath is aroused skirnir if i seek for speech with him your son ill words i shall haply win if i ask the wise youth to answer me this gainst whom his wrath is aroused skirnir to frey tell me truly frey thou ruler of gods what i fain would learn from thy lips why sitst thou alone in the hall my lord lingering the livelong day frey how shall i ever own to thee youth the great heart's burden i bear the elf light shines each day the same but works not yet my will skirnir scarce are the longings of thy love so great but i trow thou canst tell them to me we were young together in days of yore we twain may well trust each other frey in the courts of gymir the frost giant saw i that maiden most dear to me light shone out from her arms and thence all the air and sea were a shine she is dearer to me than ever was maiden to youth in days of yore but none among all the gods and elves hath willed that we twain should wed skirnir give me steed to bear me safe through the dim enchanted flickering flame 
and the sword which wages war of itself gainst the fearful jotun folk frey here is steed to bear thee safe through the dim enchanted flickering flame and the sword which wages war of itself if he who bears it be bold skirnir speaking to the horse dark tis without tis time i ween to fare o'er the dewy fells mid the throng of giants we shall both win through or the awful jotun have both then skirnir rode into jotunheim to the dwellings of gymir where fierce dogs were chained up before the gate of the enclosure which surrounded gerd's hall he rode up to a herdsman who was sitting on a mound and said speak thou herdsman who sitst on a mound and watchest every way how for gymir's hounds shall i e'er hold speech with that jotun's youthful maid herdsman either doomed art thou or one of the dead going forth to the halls of hell never a word shalt thou win i ween with gymir's goodly maid skirnir a wiser choice than to whine makes he who is ready to run his race my time was set to a certain day and my length of life decreed gerd within the hall what is the clanking and clashing of sounds which echoing i hear in our halls trembles the earth and before it all the courts of gymir are shook a serving maid see a man without he is sprung from his steed which he now lets graze on the grass gerd bid him come in let him enter our halls let him quaff the glorious mead yet i fear me much lest that man without the slayer of my brother should be gerd to skirnir who has entered who comes nor of elves nor of god's race seeming nor yet of the all-wise wains why has fared alone through the raging fire to visit the folk in our halls skirnir i come nor of elves nor of god's race am i nor yet of the all-wise wains who has fared alone through the raging fire to visit the folk in our halls eleven apples all golden have i these will i give thee gerd to win thy heart that from henceforth fray be deemed thy dearest in life gerd not e'er will i take those silver apples at the will of any white nor will we twain live frey and i together while life shall last skirnir then a ring i offer thee once twas burned with odin's youthful son it lets fall ever eight golden rings of a like weight each ninth night gerd no ring do i want though once twere burned with odin's youthful son gold is not lacking in gymir's courts nor my father's riches to rule skirnir seest thou this sword maiden slender rune graven which here i hold in my hand thy head will i hew from off thy neck if thou speak not soon thy consent gerd it shall ne'er befall me to suffer force to the will of any wight i ween if thou meet'st with gymir in war that fiercely you twain would fight skirnir seest thou this sword maiden slender rune graven which here i hold in my hand before its keen edge shall fall that old giant thy father is doomed to death with a taming wand i will touch thee maid and win thee soon to my will i will send thee far off where thou shalt be seen never more by the sons of men on an eagle's mound shalt thou sit from morn gazing out of the world toward hell thy food shall seem loathlier than bright-hued serpent seemed ever to man among men sight of wonder when thou walkest all beings shall stare on thee and the frost giant fix thee with his eye known wider than heimdall the watchman of gods thou shalt gape through the gates of hell trolls shall torment thee from morn till eve in the realms of the jotun race each day to the dwellings of frost giants must thou creep helpless creep hopeless of love thou shalt weeping have in the stead of joy and sore burden bear with tears with a three-headed giant must thou abide or lack ever husband in life care shall lay hold on thy heart and mind thou shalt waste with mourning away as a thistle shalt be which hath thrust itself up in the latter season full late the frost-hooded giant shall hold thee fast beneath the doors of the dead at the tree's roots there shall wretched thralls give thee foul water of goats and other draughts shalt thou never drink at thy wish maiden with my will made sit thee down i will further woes twofold bespeak thee a whelming wave of care 
may madness and shrieking bondage and yearning burden thee with trouble and tears wroth is odin wroth is the thunderer frey too shall hate thee i trow thou evil maiden well hast thou earned the awful anger of the gods hear now jutuns frost giants hear me sutun's sons neath the earth ye godfolk too how i ban and forbid man's love to the maiden man's joy to the maid i went to the forest to find and fetch a magic wand of might to a greenwood tree and i got me there this mighty magic wand i have cut thee a giant and carved thee three staves lust and raving and rage even as i cut them on so can i cut them off if haply i have the will gerd offers him a foaming cup be gracious rather youth take now this rimy cup filled with famous old mead little i thought that ever in life i should love a waneling well skirnir all my errand will i know to the end before i ride homeward hence when wilt thou maiden meet at the trysting the stalwart son of Nyrd? gerd pine needle is the wood of peaceful faring we twain know well the way there shall gerd bestow on the son of Nyrd her heart's love nine nights hence then skirnir rode home frey was standing without and he greeted him and asked for tidings frey speak skirnir cast not saddle from the steed and stir not one step hence what hast thou one of thy will in mine in the realms of the jutun race skirnir pine needle is the wood of peaceful faring we twain know well the way there shall gerd bestow on the son of Nyord her heart's love nine nights hence frey long is one night long are two nights how shall i live through three shorter a month has seemed to me oft than waiting this half night here end of part seven the story of skirnir part eight day spring and menglud part one the spell songs of groa son wake thou groa wake sweet woman at the doors of the dead awake thy child thou badest me dost thou not mind thee come to the cairn of thy grave groa what sorrow grieves thee mine only son with what burden art overborne that thou callest thy mother who is turned to dust and gone from the folk world forth son a fearful task hath that false woman set me who fondly my father hath clasped she hath sent me where none may go to seek the gay necklaced maiden menglud groa long is the faring long are the pathways long are the loves of men well it may be that thou gain thy will but the end must follow fate son sing me spell songs sweet and strong ones mother shield me thy child dead on the way i ween i shall be for i feel me too young in years groa i sing thee the first well it serves they say which rinder sang to ron be thy burden too heavy may it fall from thy back and may self lead self at will i sing thee the second if haply thou strayest joyless on journeys far may the web of weird be around thy way and save thee from shameful plight i sing thee the third if mighty streams with their waters o'erwhelm thy life may those floods of hell flow back and dry be the paths before thy feet i sing thee the fourth if foes should lurk in ambush armed for thy death be their hearts forthwith toward thee turn and their minds be moved to peace i sing thee the fifth if men make fast a charm on the joints of thy limbs that loosening spell which i sang o'er thy legs shall break fetters from hands and feet i sing thee the sixth if thou fare o'er seas mightier than men do know may wind and wave for thee work thy boat and make peaceful thy path o'er the deep i sing thee the seventh if thou art assailed by frost on the rimy fell may thy flesh not die in the deadly cold be thou sound in life and limb i sing thee the eighth if night o'ertake thee wandering on the misty way none the more may ghosts of christian women have power to work thy woe i sing thee the ninth when thou needs must stand in speech with that spear-famed giant 
May words and wisdom to lips and heart in abundance be bestowed. May thou ne'er be led where danger lurks, may harm not hinder thy will. At the doors I stood on an earthbound stone while I sang these songs to thee. Child, bear with thee a mother's words, let them abide in thy breast. Wealth enough in life thou shalt win if thou keep'st my counsel in mind. Part two the sayings of much wise stood day spring without the walls and saw loom high the yutun's home day spring what monster is that who guards the threshold and prowls round the perilous flames much wise whom dost thou seek of whom are in search what friendless wight wouldst thou learn back wander hence on thy dewy way not here is thy haven lone one day spring what monster is that who guards the threshold and bids not welcome to wanderers lacking all seemly speech wert thou born hence speaker hie thee home much wise much wise i am called for i am wise in mind though none too free with my food here in the court shalt thou never come get thee hence like a wolf on thy way day spring longs the lover again for the light of his eyes with his sweetheart back in sight glowing are the walls of that golden hall i would fain make here my home much wise tell me bold youth from whom thou art sprung son of what being wert born day spring they call me wind cold the son of spring cold whose father was fierce cold named now answer me much wise this that i ask and fain would learn from thy lips who here doth rule and hold in power the wealth and wondrous halls much wise there is one called menglud who of her mother was born to sleepthorn's son tis she doth rule and hold in power the wealth in wondrous halls day spring now answer me much wise this that i ask and fain would learn from thy lips what is that gate called ne'er among gods was more fearful barrier found much wise sounding clangor the gate is called wrought by three sons of soulblind fast is the chain to each wanderer who seeks to lift that door from the latch day spring now answer me much wise this that i ask and fain would learn from thy lips what is that wall named ne'er among gods was more fearful barrier found much wise guest crusher tis called from the clay giant's limbs i built that barrier myself so fast have i set it that firm twill stand for ever while life shall last day spring now answer me much wise this that i ask and fain would learn from thy lips what is that tree which far and wide spreads limbs o'er every land much wise tis the tree of mimir but no man knows by what roots it rises to heaven twill fall at last by what least one weans for nor fire nor weapons will wound it day spring now answer me much wise this that i ask and fain would learn from thy lips what befalls the fruit of that famous tree which nor fire nor weapons will wound much wise the fruit thereof must be laid on the fire for the wheel of travailing women they shall then come out who had been within to mankind tis the giver of life day spring now answer me much wise this that i ask and fain would learn from thy lips what cock sits perched in yon lofty tree who is glistening all with gold much wise wood snake he is called whose storm bright sits in the boughs of mimir's tree with one long dread he galls beyond measure giant and giant wife day spring now answer me much wise this that i ask and fain would learn from thy lips what fierce hounds watch in front of the courts ravening and roaming around much wise one is called greed the other glutton if haply thou wouldst hear mighty warders they are who watch for a till the powers perish day spring now answer me much wise this that i ask and fain would learn from thy lips is there never a being may pass within while the fierce hounds are held in sleep much wise division of sleep was ever their lot since twas given them to guard sleeps one by night and the other by day and none who comes may win through day spring 
now answer me much wise this that i ask and fain would learn from thy lips is there no food which man can find them and dart through the doors while they feast much wise there lie two wings in the wood snake's sides if haply thou wouldst hear this alone is that food which if man can find he shall dart through the doors while they feast day spring now answer me much wise this that i ask and fain would learn from thy lips is there no weapon to strike the wood snake down to the halls of hell much wise tis the wounding wand which loki plucked beneath the doors of the dead sinmara keeps it with nine fast locks shut in sea lover's chest day spring now answer me much wise this that i ask and fain would learn from thy lips comes he ever again who goes to seek and craves to win that wand much wise he shall come again who goes to seek and craves to win that wand if he brings the treasure which none doth own the gold bright goddess to please day spring now answer me much wise this that i ask and fain would learn from thy lips is there no treasure which man can take to rejoice that pale hued giantess much wise in its quill must thou bear the bright sickled plume which was taken from wood snake's tail and give to sinmara ere she will grant thee that weapon of war to use day spring now answer me much wise this that i ask and fain would learn from thy lips what hall is yonder all girt around by enchanted flickering flames much wise ember tis called and long must it quiver as though on the spear's point set far tidings only throughout all time man hears of this wondrous hall day spring now answer me much wise this that i ask and fain would learn from thy lips what beings born of the gods have built what i saw inside the court much wise uni and iri bari and ori var and vegdrasil dori and uri delling atvard lidskelf and loki were these day spring now answer me much wise this that i ask and fain would learn from thy lips what hill is that on whose height i see yon wondrous woman resting much wise tis the hill of healing long hath it held for the sick and sorrowful joy each woman is healed who climbs its height even of year-long ills day spring now answer me much wise this that i ask and fain would learn from thy lips who are the maidens at menglud's knees all gathered in peace together much wise they are spirits sheltering shielding giants guarding warriors in war bright and tender blithe and peaceful gentle generous maids day spring now answer me much wise this that i ask and fain would learn from thy lips will they shelter all who make offering to them if need thereof arise much wise those wise ones shelter where men make offering in the sacred altar stead no peril so mighty can man befall but they save him soon from need day spring now answer me much wise this that i ask and fain would learn from thy lips is there never being in the world may lie in men glued soft arms sleeping much wise there is never being in the world may lie in men glued soft arms sleeping save day spring to whom of yore was given that sunbright maiden as bride day spring fling open the door make wide the gate day spring is here behold yet hie thee first and find if in truth menglud longs for my love much wise to menglud hearken menglud a guest is here come thou the stranger behold the hounds are joyous the hall hath opened tis day spring well i ween menglud now may fierce ravens rend thine eyes out high on the gallows hanging if falsely thou sayest that from far away comes day spring here to my halls to day spring whence hast thou come whence made thy way how do thy home folk call thee show race and name ere i know that to thee in truth i have been betrothed day spring day spring am i the child of sunbright by winds on my chill way wafted the doom of weird may no white withstand e'en though meted amiss menglud now welcome art thou my will is one with greeting comes the kiss never sweeter is sight of heart's desire than when one brings love to another 
long have i sat on the hill of healing awaiting thee day by day till that i looked for at length is come thou art back youth here in my halls yearnings had i oft for thy heart and thou didst long for my love now all is made sure we twain shall share together the days of time end of part eight day spring in menglud part nine greybeard and thor as thor was journeying from the eastern land of the jutuns he came to a sound on the other side was a ferryman with his boat thor what swain of swains art thou who thus on yonder side of the sound art standing greybeard tell me rather what carl of carls thus calls across the wave thor row me over a meal this morn i'll pay thee choicer fare thou shalt never find thee here on my back there hangs a basket in peace i ate myself ere i started herrings and goat's flesh and still am i sated greybeard as a morning's work thou dost boast thy meal but thou art not all foreseeing filled with care at home are thy kindred dead i trow is thy mother thor worst of all tidings art thou telling when thou sayest me now that dead is my mother greybeard at least thou lookst not like one who owns a lot of three fair lands bare-legged thou standest clad like a beggar and not even breeks hast thou on thor steer the bark hither i will show thee a haven who owns yon boat which by the brink thou holdest greybeard battle-wolf bade me wise counselled hero who dwells in council isle sound to keep it in fairy nor rogues nor robbers but the worthy and those i know well now shalt thou tell me thy name if thou fain wouldst hither fare o'er the flood thor were i outlawed yet my name would i tell thee eke my race i am son of odin the brother of meili and father of magni god's strength wielder thou speak'st with thor fain would i know now thy name and kinship greybeard they call me greybeard tis seldom i care to hide my own name from any thor wherefore shouldst thou not show thy name except thou have cause of strife with thy foemen greybeard have i cause gainst such as thee will i hold my life unless i be doomed thor sore shame twould be to wet my burden in wading thus through the water toward thee those mocking words would i pay thee mannikin could i but reach yon side of the sound now greybeard here i stand and await thee ne'er met'st thou with sturdier hero since hrungnir was slain thor dost tell how we once fought i and hrungnir that hard-hearted giant whose head was rock-hewn yet did he fall and bow before me what the while wast thou working greybeard greybeard i dwelt with wary wise five whole winters in the island called all green battles we fought there and felled the doomed much daring and wiling women thor got ye weal or woe from those wives of your winning greybeard merry wives had we owned had they borne them wisely shrewd wives had they shown them true all out of sand they spun them ropes and dug from the deep dales earth yet slyest was i who with seven sisters slept and won all their liking and love what the while wast thou working thunderer thor slew i Thiazi, son of all wielder strong-souled jutun and flung his eyes up where men shall behold in the shining heavens the tokens great of my deeds hereafter what the while wast thou working greybeard greybeard i had dealings in love with the dark witch riders from their husbands i wiled them away stout giant seemed hellebard till his wand he gave me and i wiled him out of his wits thor then spite for those goodly gifts thou gavest greybeard let one oak take what it scrapes off another and let each man seek his own what the while wast thou working thunderer thor slew i the evil wives of jutuns far in the east as they fled to the mountains were they all left in the land of the living huge would have been now the host of giants and never a man would there be in midgarth what the while wast thou working greybeard greybeard in the land of the slain i warred and stirred up princes to strive without peace 
Odin has earls who fall on the battle field, Thor has the race of thralls. Thor. Unfairly wouldst thou divide the slain among gods if power too great were given thee. Greybeard. Strength enough has the thunderer, naught of daring. From fear and faintness of heart thou wert thrust, I ween, in a glove thumb once, and scarce could deem thyself Thor. Lest Fjallar should hear thee, for fright thou durst not sneeze nor stir a hair. Thor. Greybeard, thou craven! Could I but stretch o'er the sound, I would smite thee soon to hell home. Greybeard. Why shouldst thou stretch o'er the sound and smite me? No reason have we for wrath. What the while wast thou working, thunderer? Thor. Eastward held I the flood of Ething against the sons of Svarang the Whelmer. With stones they beset me, but small gain got they, and first were found to ask peace of foemen. What the while wast thou working, Greybeard? Greybeard. In the east I dallied with one, my chosen. I played with that linen fair lass, kept secret trysting, and gladdened the gold-bright maiden, merry in the game. Thor. Glad meetings of love, had ye there with maidens? Greybeard. Need had I then of help from Thor, to have kept that linen fair lass. Thor. Fain would I give it thee, could I but get there. Greybeard. Fain would I now put trust in thy faith, wert thou not wont to betray me. Thor. No heel-biter I, like an old shoe in springtime. Greybeard. What the while wast thou working, thunderer? Thor. Slew I berserk-wives in the isle of Egir. Vile things wrought they, all menfolk wiling. Greybeard. A base deed, then, wast thou doing, thunderer, waging war with women. Thor she-wolves were they and scarcely women my ships laid up on the shore they shattered with clubs they threatened me tealfi chased they what the while wast thou working greybeard greybeard to raise the war-flag and redden the spear hither i came in the host thor wouldst tell how with hate thou camest to harm us greybeard let a ring make atonement as the day's men meted who sought to set us at peace thor where didst thou learn those scornful speeches? Never were words more wounding said me. Greybeard. I learnt them once from ancient beings who dwell in the hills of home. Thor. Fair name for cairns to call them home hills. Greybeard. Tis even as I think concerning such things. Thor. Surely thy skill in words should serve thee. Could I but wade to thee through the water, louder I ween than a wolf wilt thou howl, if haply thou gett'st a stroke from my hammer. Greybeard. Sif has a lover, thy wife at home. Art thou not eager to meet him? That a deed of daring now must thou do, a work which well befits thee. Thor. Faint heart. Speak'st thou as worse me seems, by the counsel of thy lips, for I trow thou liest. Greybeard. Truly, I ween that my words are spoken. Too slow art thou in thy travelling. Far on thy way hadst thou fared now, Thor, if thou hadst but gone in disguise. Thor. Greybeard, thou craven! Too long thou delayest me. Greybeard. I had never weaned boatmen would hinder the way of Thor, the thunderer of gods. Thor. Now will I counsel thee. Come in thy boat hither. Fetch Magni's father, and cease we from mocking greybeard hie thee hence away from the sound the ferry to thee is refused thor show me a path then since thou wilt not ferry me over the flood betwixt us greybeard tis little to withhold tis far to fare a while to the stock in the stone thus shalt thou hold to the left-hand path till thou light on the land of men there will earth meet her son and show him the way of his race to the realms of odin thor Shall I to-day reach the dwellings of Odin? Greybeard. With weariness and toil, when the dew is wet at sunrise, I ween thou wilt win them. Thor. Short be our speech now, with but jeering thou answerest. When we meet next, I'll pay thee for denying me passage. Greybeard. Hie thee hence, away where the fiends may seize thee, body and soul. End of part nine. Greybeard and Thor. Part 10. The Song of Rig 
it is told in the sagas of old time that a certain god called heimdal was passing on his way along the seashore when he came to a farm he entered calling himself rig according to the story which thus relates one the birth of thrall once walked tis said the green ways along mighty and ancient a god most glorious strong and vigorous striding rig ever on he went in the middle of the way till he came to a house with door unclosed he entered straight there was fire on the floor and a hoary couple sitting by the hearth great-grandfather and mother in ancient guise well knew rig how to give them counsel he sat him down in the middle of the floor with the home-folk twain upon either side great-grandmother fetched a coarse-baked loaf all heavy and thick and crammed with husk she bore it forth in the middle of the dish with broth in a bowl and laid the board thence rig uprose prepared to rest well he knew how to give them counsel he laid him down in the middle of the bed and the home-folk twain upon either side thus he tarried three nights together then on he strode in the middle of the road while thrice three moons were gliding by great-grandmother bore a swarthy boy with water they sprinkled him called him thrall forthwith he grew and well he throve but rough were his hands with wrinkled skin with knuckles knotty and fingers thick his face was ugly his back was humpy his heels were long straightway gan he to prove his strength with bast a binding loads a making he bore home faggots a live long day there came to the dwellings a wandering maid with wayworn feet and sunburned arms with down-bent nose the bond maid named she sat her down in the middle of the floor beside her sat the son of the house they chatted and whispered their bed preparing thrall and bond maid the long day through joyous lived they and reared their children thus they called them brawler cowherd boar and horsefly lewd and lustful stout and stumpy sluggard swarthy lout and leggy they fashioned fences they dung the meadows swine they herded goats they tended and turf they dug daughters were there loggy and cloggy lumpy leggy and eagle nose whiner bondwoman oaken peggy tattercoat and the crane-shanked maid thence are come the generations of thralls two the birth of churl ever on went rig the straight roads along till he came to a dwelling with door unclosed he entered straight there was fire on the floor grandfather and grandmother owned the house the home folk sat there hard a-working by them stood on the floor a box hewed the husband wood for a warp beam trim his beard and the locks o'er his brow but mean and scanty the shirt he wore the wife sat by him plying her distaff swaying her arms to weave the cloth with snood on her head and smock on her breast studs on her shoulders and scarf on her neck well knew rig how to give them counsel he sat him down in the middle of the floor and the home folk twain upon either side grandmother set forth plenteous dishes cooked was the calf of dainties best thence rig uprose prepared to rest well he knew how to give them counsel he laid him down in the middle of the bed and the home folk twain upon either side thus he tarried three nights together then on he strode in the middle of the road while thrice three moons were gliding by a child had grandmother churl they called him and sprinkled with water and swathed in linen rosy and ruddy with sparkling eyes he grew and throve and forthwith gan he to break in oxen to shape the harrow to build him houses and barns to raise him to fashion carts and follow the plough then home they drove with a key hung maiden in goatskin kirtle named daughter-in-law they wed her to churl in her bridal linen the twain made ready their wealth a-sharing kept house together and joyous lived children reared they thus they called them youth and hero thane smith yeoman broad-limbed peasant sheaf-beard neighbour farmer speaker and stubbly beard by other names were the daughters called dame bride lady gay and gaudy made wife woman bashful slender thence are come the kindreds of churls three the birth of earl still on went rig the straight roads along till he came to a hall whose gates looked south pushed was the door too a ring in the post set he forthwith entered the rush-strewn room each other eyeing the home folk sat there father and mother twirling their fingers 
there was the husband string a twining shafting arrows and shaping bows and there was the wife o'er her fair arms wondering smoothing her linen stretching her sleeves a high peaked coif and a breast brooch wore she trailing robes and a blue tinged sark her brow was brighter her breast was fairer her throat was whiter than driven snow well knew rig how to give them counsel he sat him down in the middle of the floor and the home folk twain upon either side then took mother a figured cloth white of linen and covered the board thereafter took she a fine baked loaf white of wheat and covered the cloth next she brought forth plenteous dishes set with silver and spread the board with brown fried bacon and roasted birds there was wine in a vessel and rich wrought goblets they drank and revelled while day went by well knew rig how to give them counsel he rose ere long and prepared his couch he laid him down in the middle of the bed and the home folk twain upon either side thus he tarried three nights together then on he strode in the middle of the road while thrice three moons were gliding by then a boy had mother she swathed him in silk and with water sprinkled him called him earl light were his locks and fair his cheeks flashing his eyes like a serpent shown grew earl forthwith in the halls and gan to swing the shield to fit the string to bend the bow to shaft the arrow to hurl the dart to shake the spear to ride the horse to loose the hounds to draw the sword and to swim the stream forth from the thicket came rig astriding rig astriding and taught him runes his own name gave him as son he claimed him and bade him hold the ancestral fields the ancestral fields in the ancient home then on rode earl through the murky wood through the rimy fells till he reached a hall his shaft he shook his shield he brandished his steed he galloped his sword he drew war he wakened the field he reddened the doomed he slew and won him lands till alone he ruled over eighteen halls gold he scattered and gave to all men treasures and trinkets and slender ribbed horses wealth he strewed and sundered rings along dewy roads his messengers drove till the hall they reached where ruler dwelt a daughter owned he dainty fingered fair and skilful erna called they wooed her and brought her home a-driving to earl they wed her in veil fine woven husband and wife lived happy together their children waxed and life enjoyed four the birth of king heir was the eldest bairn the second babe successor inheritor boy descendant offspring son youth kinsman con the kingly was youngest born forthwith grew up the sons of earl games they learned in sports and swimming taming horses round shields bending war shafts smoothing ash spears shaking but king the youngest alone knew runes runes eternal and runes of life yet more he knew how to shelter men to blunt the sword edge and calm the sea he learnt bird language to quench the fire flame heal all sorrows and soothe the heart strength and might of eight he owned then he strove in runes with rig the earl crafty wiles he used and won so gained his heritage held the right thus rig to be called and runes to know young king rode once through thicket and wood shooting arrows and slaying birds till spake a crow perched lone on a bough why wilt thou thus kill birds young king twould fit thee rather to ride on horses to draw the sword and to slay the foe dan and damp have dwellings goodlier homesteads fairer than ye do hold and well they know the keel to ride the sword to prove and wounds to strike end of part ten the song of rig part eleven the vala's shorter soothsaying eleven only the war gods numbered when baldr sank on the bale fire down but vali showed him strong to avenge it and slew ere long his brother slayer father of baldr was odin Bur's son frey wedded gerd she was gymir's daughter and arbodas of jutun race tiazi also came of their kindred the shape-shifting giant skadi's sire much have i told thee yet more i remember needs must one know it thus wilt thou yet further witch and horse-thief are sprung from rhyme bringer all the valas sprung from forest-wolf all the wizards sprung from wish-giver 
all the sorcerers sprung from Swarthead, and all the Jutuns come from Ymir. Much have I told thee, yet more I remember. Needs must one know it thus, wilt thou yet further? Woe-bringer bore the wolf to Loki, with Swadilfari begat he Sleipnir. But one was deemed the deadliest of all, the monster brood from Loki born. When the heart of a woman, home of love, he ate half burned with linden wood, and bore ere long a loathly being whence witches all in the world are sprung much have i told thee yet more i remember needs must one know it thus wilt thou yet further one was there born in days of old girt with great power of the kindred of gods nine giant maidens bore that being armed with glory on the rim of earth yelper bore him griper bore him foamer bore him sandstrewer bore him she-wolf bore him sorrow-whelmer dusk and fury and iron sword he was girt with all the power of earth of the ice-cold sea and of sacred swine blood he was the one born greater than any girt with all the power of earth men call him ever the richest ruler rig the kinsman of every race much have i told thee yet more i remember needs must one know it thus wilt thou yet further the sea shall rise in storms to heaven it shall sweep o'er the land and the skies shall yield in showers of snow and biting blasts at the doom of the powers the gods of war there shall come hereafter another mightier whose name i dare not now make known few there are who may see beyond when odin fares to fight with the wolf end of part eleven the vala's shorter soothsaying part twelve the lay of hinla freya wake maid of maidens friend awaken sister hinla in a rock-hole biding comes the gloom of gloaming we twain together must ride to valhalla the holy dwelling the war-father bid we be mild in his mood who grants and gives to his followers gold he gave to hermod a helm and burney and to sigmund gave a sword to take to some grants he wealth to his children war fame word skill to many and wisdom to men fair winds to seafarers song craft to scalds and might of manhood to many a warrior to thor will i offer and this will i ask him to bear him truly ever toward thee e'en though foe of the wives of jutuns now of thy wolves take one from the stall and swift let him run by the side of my boar Hinla. nay loath is thy swine to tread the god's way nor will i burden my noble beast false art thou freya thou fain wouldst tempt me thine eyes betray thee thou turnest ever to where on the dead's way thy lover is with thee otar the youthful instein's son freya dull art thou hinla i trow thou art dreaming when thou deem'st my lover is here on the dead's road where golden bristle the boar is glowing the swine of battle which once they made me dane and nabi the crafty dwarfs let us now strive in our saddles sitting and hold converse o'er the long long lines of kings heroes all who are come from the gods otar the youthful and angantir on this have wagered their wealth of gold needs must i help the youthful hero to hold the heritage after his fathers he built me an altar with stone o'erlaid like glass all riven is that rock with fire for he reddened it oft with the fresh blood of oxen a to the goddesses otar was true come now let ancient kinsmen be numbered and let it be told the long lines of men who is of skuldungs who of skilfings who is of ethlings who of inglings who is freeborn who is gentleborn choicest of all the men under midgarth hinla otar's race thou art otar born of instein instein came from alf the old alf was from wolf wolf from seafarer and seafarer sprang from swan the red thou hadst a mother shining in jewels Fledis, i ween she was named the priestess her father was frodi and freout her mother all of this race among lords are reckoned hildegun was the mother of freout child was she a svafa and sea king all this race is thine otar the simple needs must one know it thus wilt thou yet further clip's son ketil was spouse of hildegun he was the father of thy mother's mother older than kari yet was frodi but alf was of all the eldest born next came nanna 
the daughter of Nokvir, her son was thy father's brother by wedlock. Old is that kindship, still on will I tell thee, for all this race is thine, Otar the Simple. Isolf and Olsolf were sons of Olmod, and born of Skurhild, daughter of Skekel. Thou shalt reckon back to many a chieftain, all this race is thine, Otar the Simple. Halfdan's Race Far back was Ali, mightiest of men, Halfdan before him, highest of Skjuldungs. World were his deeds round the skirts of heaven, Great wars of nations the chieftains waged. He joined him to Eymund, highest of heroes, Sigtrig slew with the icy sword edge, Wedded Amveg, loftiest of ladies, So he began him sons eighteen. Thence are the Skjuldungs, thence the skilfings thence are the athlings thence the inglings thence are freeborn thence are gentleborn all the choicest of men under midgarth all this race is thine otar the simple dog's wife was thora mother of warriors reared in that race were the mightiest heroes fradmar and geird and both the wolf cubs josumar am and alf the old needs must one know it thus wilt thou yet further the berserks Born in Bolm in the eastern land were Arngrim's sons and Iphora's. Woes unnumbered the berserks worked, like the fairing of fire or land and sea. Hervard, Hurvard, Hrani, Angantir, Bui and Brami, Bari and Reifnir, Tind and Tirfing and Hadung's twain. All this race is thine, Otar the Simple. Gunnar Battle Wall, grim strong minded, Thorir Iron Shield, Wolf the Gaper rode and hurvi once i knew them both in the train of frulf the old the vulsung race given to the gods were the warrior sons all the children of jormunrek the kinsmen of sigurd list to my saga fear of nations who fafnir slew that ruler was born of the race of vulsungs and hurdis came his mother of hraudungs and eilimi her sire of athlings all this race is thine otar the simple Gunnar and Hugni were sons of Gjuki, Gudrun their sister was eke his offspring, but not of their kin, with Guthorm Battlesnake, though of the twain he was held the brother. All this race is thine, Otar the Simple. Best was Haki of Fedna's children, the father of Fedna was Jorvald. Race of Harald Wartooth. Born from Aud was Harald Wartooth, son of Hrurik, slinger of rings and deep-thoughted was ivar's daughter and ranver the son of rodbard born all this race is thine otar the simple freya to my boar now bear the ale of memory so shall he tell forth all this tale when the third morn comes and with ungantir he shall trace back the mighty men of their race hinla hie away hence for i fain would sleep and few fair words shalt thou win from me thou gaddest forth good friend that nights like a she-goat string bold among bucks yearning ever thou hast followed odd many a sweetheart has slept in thine arms thou gaddest forth good friend at nights like a she-goat string bold among bucks freya i will strike fire about thee giantess so that unburnt thou hie not hence hinla thou gaddest forth good friend at nights like a she-goat string bold among bucks lo all around us the earth is flaming many must render their lives as ransom bear now the ale cup to otar's hand all mingled with poison and omens of ill thou gaddest forth good friend at nights like a she-goat string bold among bucks freya the word of thine omen shall work no evil albeit thou cursest vile wife of Utuns. sweet shall the draught be that otar drinks for i pray all the powers to shield him well End of part 12, The Lay of Hinla. Part 13, Baldur's Dreams. Straight were gathered all gods at the doomstead, goddesses all were in speech together, and the mighty powers over this took counsel, why to Baldur came dreams foreboding. Up rose Odin, the ancient creator, he laid the saddle on gliding Sleipnir, and downward rode into misty hell. Met him a hound from a cavern coming, all its breast was blood besprinkled, long it bayed at the father of spells. Onward he rode, the earth's way rumbled, to the lofty hall of hell came Odin. 
Round he rode to a door on the eastward, where he knew was a witch's grave. He sang there spells of the dead to the vala. Needs she must rise, a corpse, and answer. What man is this to me unknown, who torment adds to my toilsome way? I was snowed on with snow, and dashed with rain. I was drenched with dew, I have long been dead. Odin. They call me Waywont, I am son of Warwont. Tell me tidings of hell, I will tell of the world. For whom are the benches strewn with rings? For whom is the fair dais flooded with gold? Vala. Here stands for Baldr, brood the mead. The shining cup the shield lies over. But the gods' race all are in despair. Needs have I spoken, now will I cease. Odin. Cease not, Vala. Still will I ask thee. I must see yet onward till all I know. Who will be the slayer of Baldr? Who Odin's son will of life bereave? Vala. Hod shall bear thither the high-grown fame bow. He will be the slayer of Baldr. Yea, Odin's son will of life bereave. Needs have I spoken. Now will I cease. Odin. Cease not, Vala. Still will I ask thee. I must see yet onward till all I know. Who shall work revenge for the woe on Hood, and lay on the bale-fire Baldr's foe? Vala. Rin shall bear Vali in the western halls. He, Odin's son, shall fight one night old. Nor hand will he wash, nor head will he comb, till he lay on the bale-fire Baldr's foe. Needs have I spoken, now will I cease. Odin. Cease not, Vala. Still will I ask thee. I must see yet onward till all I know. Who are the maidens who weep at will, and up toward heaven their neck veils fling? Vala. Not Waywont art thou, as I had weaned, but thou art Odin, the ancient creator. Odin. No Vala art thou, nor woman wise, but of three giants thou art mother. Vala. Ride homeward, Odin, glorying in thy gain, for thus shall no being ever meet me more. Ere Loki roves from his fetters free, and the destroyers come at the power's great doom. End of part 13. Baldur's Dreams. Part 14. Loki's Mocking. At the Banquet of Ygir. Ygir, who is also called Gymir, the Binder, bade the gods to an ale feast after he had got possession of the great cauldron, as already told. To this banquet came Odin and Frigg, his wife. Thor came not because he was journeying in the east country, but his wife Sif was there, and Bragi with his wife Idun. Tyr also, who was one-handed, because the wolf Fenrir had torn off the other hand while the gods were binding him. There were Njord and his wife Skadi, Frey and his servants Barley and Bela, Freya, Vidar, the son of Odin, with many other gods and elves. There, moreover, was Loki. Ygir had two servants, Nimble Snatcher and Fire Stirrer. Shining gold was used in the hall for the light of fire. The ale bore itself, and the place was held as a holy peace stead. Men praised Ygir's servants and said oft how good they were. But Loki could not brook this, and he slew Nimble Snatcher. The gods all shook their shields and cried out against Loki, and chased him away to the woods, and then betook themselves again to drink. The Loki turned back, and finding Fire-Stirrer standing without, he hailed him. Loki, tell me, Fire-Stirrer, but whence thou standest, move not a single step. What are the sons of the war-gods saying, or the ale-cup here within? Fire-Stirrer, of their weapons are speaking the sons of the war-gods. They boast of their battle-fame. But mid gods and elves who within are gathered, not one is thy friend in his words. Loki, I shall now enter the halls of Ygir, this banquet to behold. Mockery and strife will I bring to the gods' sons, and mingle sorrow with their mead. Fire stirrer. Know if thou enter the halls of Ygir, this banquet to behold. If reproach and slander on the blessed powers thou pour, they shall wipe out thy words upon thee. Loki. Know thou, fire stirrer, if we twain must fight together with wounding words, if thou talk too freely, thou soon shalt find me in answering ready and rich. Then Loki entered the hall, and when those assembled saw who was come in, they all became silent. Loki. Thirsty come I, the rover of air, to this feasting hall from afar. I would ask the gods to give me but one sweet draught of the mead to drink. Why all silent, ye sullen gods? 
Can ye speak no single word? Make me room on the bench, give me place at the banquet, or bid me high homeward hence. Bragi. Nor place at the banquet, nor room on the bench the gods shall give to thee. Well they know for what manner of white they should spread so fair a feast. Loki. Mindest thou, Odin, how we twain of old, like brothers, mingled our blood? Then saidst thou that never was ale cup sweet unless twere born to us both. Odin. Rise up, Vidar, and give the wolf's father bench room at the banquet, lest Loki shame us with scornful speeches here in Aegir's halls. Then Vidar arose and poured out ale for Loki, who thus greeted the gods before he drank. Hail, ye gods, and goddesses, hail. Hail, all ye holy powers. Save only one who sits within, thou Bragi upon the bench. Bragi. Steed and sword from my store will I give thee, and reward thee well with rings, lest thou pour thy hate on the gracious powers. Rouse not their wrath against thee. Loki nor steeds nor rings wilt thou ever own as long as thou livest bragi thou art wariest in war and shyest at shot of all gods and elves herein bragi were i without now even in such mood as within the halls of aegir that head of thine would i hold in my hand twere little reward for thy lie loki bold seemst thou sitting but slack art thou doing bragi thou pride of the bench come forth and fight if in truth thou art wroth a bold warrior bides not to think idun nay bragi i beg for the sake of blood kindred and of all the war sons of odin upbraid not loki with bitter speeches here in aegir's halls loki silence idun i swear of all women thou the most wanton art who couldst fling those fair washed arms of thine about thy brother's slayer idun i blame thee not loki with bitter speeches here in aegir's halls i seek but to soothe the ale-stirred bragi lest in your fierceness ye fight gefjon wherefore ye gods twain with wounding words strive ye here in the hall who knows not loki that he loathes all beings and mocks in his madness of soul loki silence gefjon i will tell that tale of him who once stole thy heart that fair swain who gave thee a shining necklace him thou didst hold in thine arms odin wild art thou loki and witless now thus rousing gefjon to wrath i ween she knows all the fate of the world even as surely as i loki silence odin when couldst thou ever rule battles of men aright oft hast thou given to them who had earned not to the slothful victory and strife odin no if ever i gave to them who had earned not to the slothful victory and strife eight winters wert thou below in the earth like a maiden milking kine and there thou gavest birth to bairns which i weened was a woman's lot loki but thou in samsi wast weaving magic and making spells like a witch thou didst pass as wizard through the world of men which i weened was a woman's way Frigg tell ye to no man the shameful tale of the deeds ye did of old how ye two gods wrought in ancient time what is gone is best forgot loki silence frigg who hast earth's spouse for a husband and hast ever yearned after men ve the holy and vili the lustful both lay in thine arms wife of odin frigg know if i had but in aegir halls a son like my balder the slain thou wouldst never come whole through the host of the gods but fiercely thou shouldst be assailed loki wouldst have me frigg tell a few more yet of these shameful stories of mine twas i wrought the woe that henceforth thou wilt not see balder ride back to the halls freya mad art thou loki to tell thus the shame and grim deeds wrought by you gods frigg knows i ween all the fate of the world though she whispers thereof to none loki silence freya full well i know thee and faultless art thou not found of the gods and elves who here are gathered each one hast thou made thy mate freya false thy tongue is too soon twill sing its own song of woe as i ween wroth are the gods and the goddesses wroth rueful thou soon shalt run home loki silence freya thou art a sorceress all with evil blent once at thy brothers the blithe gods caught thee and then wast thou frightened freya Nured. 
small harm it seems if haply a woman both lover and husband have but behold the horror now in the halls the vile god who bairns hath born loki silence Njord. thou wast eastward sent as hostage from hence by the gods there into thy mouth flowed the maids of hymir and used thee as trough for their floods Njord. yet was i gladdened when sent afar as hostage from hence by the gods there a son i got me the foe of none and highest held among gods loki silence now Njord. set bounds to thy lying i will no longer let this be hid with thine own sister that son thou gottest though he is not worse than one weaned tear nay frey is the best of all bold riders who enter the garths of the gods nor wife nor maiden he makes to weep but he breaks the prisoner's bonds loki silence tear who in truth couldst never bring good will betwixt twain the tale will i tell of that right hand which fenrir reft from thee once tear if i want for a hand for thy wolf son thou we both bear burden of want and tis ill with the wolf who must bide in bonds till the twilight come of the powers loki be silent tear while i tell of the son whom thy wife got once by me not even a penny or ell of cloth didst thou get for thy wrong poor wretch frey i see fenrir lying at the mouth of the flood he shall bide to the powers perish and thou mischief maker shall meet with like fate if thou hold not herewith thy peace loki wealth gavest thou frey for gymir's maid thou didst sell thy sword for gerd but how shalt thou fight when the sons of fire through the murkwood ride poor wretch barley were i of ing's race even as frey owned i a land blessed as elf home i would crush like marrow yon croaker of ill and break all his bones into bits loki what is that wee thing whining and fawning snuffling and snapping i see ever at frey's ear flattering and chattering or murmuring under the mill barley barley i am named too bold and brisk i am called by gods and men here am i glorying that odin's sons all are drinking ale together loki silence barley corn never couldst thou even serve meat among men and when they fought thou couldst scarce be found safe neath the bed straw hiding heimdall so drunk art thou loki thou hast lost thy wits why wilt thou not cease from thy scoffing ale beyond measure so masters man that he keeps no watch on his words loki silence heimdall that hard life of thine was settled for thee long since with weary back must thou ever bide and keep watch thou warder of gods skadi blithe art thou loki but brief while shalt thou with free tale frolic thus ere long the gods shall bind thee with guts of thy rhyme cold son to a sword loki if in truth the gods shall bind me with guts of my rhyme cold son to a rock know that first and last was i found at the death when we set upon tiazi thy sire skadi if first and last thou wert found at the death when ye set upon tiazi my sire know that in house or home of mine shall be shown thee little love loki milder were thy words to loki once when thou badst him come to thy bed for such tales i ween will be told of us twain if we own all our acts of shame then sif came forth and poured out mead for loki in the foaming cup sif hail now loki quaff this rimy cup filled with the old mead full at least grant that i of the kindred of gods alone am free from all fault loki took the horn and quaffed thou alone wert blameless hadst thou in bearing been sly and shrewish with men but thor's wife had one lover at least as i know even loki the wily wise byla all the fells are quaking fast is the thunderer faring i trow from home he will soon bring to silence him who thus slanders all beings here in the hall loki silence byla wife of barley corn all with foulness filled ne'er mid the gods came one so uncouth thou bondmaid stained and soiled then came the thunderer in and spake silence vile being my hammer of might mjolnir shall spoil thee of speech i will strike that rock head from off thy shoulders and soon will thy life-days be spent 
loki tis the son of earth who enters the hall why dost thou threaten so thor ne'er wilt thou venture to fight with the wolf he shall swallow the warfather whole thor silence vile being my hammer of might mjolnir shall spoil thee of speech i will drive thee forth to the eastern land and no man shall see thee more loki of thy eastern journeys never shouldst thou tell unto men the tale how once in a glove thumb thou warrior didst crouch and scarce couldst think thyself thor thor silence vile being my hammer of might mjolnir shall spoil thee of speech this right hand shall smite thee with hrungnir's slayer till each bone of thee shall be broke loki though haply thou threatenest with thy hammer of might long will my life be i ween sharp were screamir's thongs mind'st thou when starving thou couldst not get at the food thor silence vile being my hammer of might mjolnir shall spoil thee of speech with hrungnir's slayer i will smite thee to hell down neath the gates of the dead loki before sons and daughters of gods have i spoken even as i was moved by my mind now at length i go and for thee alone for well i ween thou wilt fight thou hast brewed thine ale but such banquet aegir never more shalt thou make may flames play high o'er thy wealth in the hall and scorch the skin of thy back then loki went forth and hid himself in Franong's stream in the form of a salmon where the gods caught him and bound him with the guts of his son narfi but his other son vali was turned into a wolf skadi took a poisonous snake and fastened it up over loki so that poison dripped from it upon his face sigin his wife sat by and held a basin under the drops and when the basin was full she cast the poison away but meanwhile the drops fell upon loki and he struggled so fiercely against it that the whole earth shook with his strivings which are now called earthquakes end of part fourteen loki's mocking part fifteen fragments from snorri's edda one how Njord was made skadi's spouse then skadi daughter of the great tiazi when she heard how the gods had slain her father donned helm and burney and all her weapons of war and went to revenge him in asgarth for the sake of peace they offered her as wergild the choice of a spouse among the gods but in her choosing she should behold no more than their feet and when she saw that the feet of one were exceeding fair and shapely she cried him will i choose for scant is the blemish in Baldur. but lo it was nured out of noatun thus he took to wife skadi daughter of the jutun tiazi she would fain keep the dwellings of her father among the mountains in the land called sound home but njord desired to be near the sea so they made agreement thus nine nights they should dwell in sound home and afterwards three in noatun but when njord came back to noatun from the mountains he said hateful the hills though not long i lingered nights only nine i dwelt there the howling of wolves was ill me seemed beside the song of the swans and skadi spake thus sleep i could not on ocean's couch for the wailing cry of the gull from the wide sea faring that bird awoke me when he came each day at dawn two concerning the goddess na frigg sends na the floater on errands into many worlds she rides a horse called hoofflinger which fares through the sky and over the sea once as she was passing certain of the wains saw her riding in the air and one said what flies there what fares there what flits there aloft and she made answer i fly not yet am faring and i flit here aloft high on the hoofflinger who was of hedgebreaker born and the fine flanked steed three how the world wept for baldur the gods sent messengers throughout all the world to plead that baldur might be wept out of hell and all beings wept men and living creatures the earth and rocks and trees and metals even as such things weep when after being fast bound with frost they become warm when the messengers had well done their errand they returned and found a certain giantess called thok sitting in a cave they bade her weep baldur out of hell but she answered thok shall weep with dry tears alone that baldur is laid on the bale-fire never joy have i had from man living or dead 
let hell hold fast what she hath thus they knew that loki son of laufey had been there who was ever wont to work most evil among the gods four how thor slew the daughters of geirud when thor was faring once into jotunheim he came to the river vimur of all rivers the greatest there he girt him with his belt of strength and leant on gridar's staff as he went downstream loki held on under the belt when thor had come into the midst of the flood it had risen so high that it flowed over his shoulders then he spake wax not vimur i needs must wade thee to reach the jotun realms know if thou wax forthwith shall wax my god's might high as heaven and when thor had reached geirud's court he and loki were taken to lodge in the guest-house there was but one stool there and thor sat down upon it but presently he became aware that it was rising up to the roof under him he thrust gridarth's staff against the rafters and pushed the stool down and then came a great crash and a shriek was heard for the daughters of geirud yelper and gripper had been under the stool and both their backs were broken then spake thor once only i used my god's might all in the realms of the jotun race when yelper and gripper gerud's maids would have raised me high to heaven five the glistener in asgarth before the gates of valhalla there stands a wood called glistener whose leaves are all of red gold as here is written glistener stands with golden leaves in front of the warfathers halls end of part fifteen fragments from snorri's edda part sixteen the soothsaying of the vala hearing i ask all holy kindreds high and low-born sons of heimdal thou too odin who bidst me utter the oldest tidings of men that i mind the world's beginning i remember of yore were born the jotuns they who aforetime fostered me nine worlds i remember nine in the tree the glorious fate tree that springs neath the earth twas the earliest of times when ymir lived then was sand nor sea nor cooling wave nor was earth found ever nor heaven on high there was yawning of deeps and nowhere grass ere the sons of the gods had uplifted the world plain and fashioned midgarth the glorious earth sun shone from the south on the world's bare stones then was earth o'ergrown with herb of green sun moon's companion out of the south her right hand flung round the rim of heaven sun knew not yet where she had her hall nor knew the stars where they had their place nor ever the moon what might he owned ordering of times and seasons then went all the powers to their thrones of doom the most holy gods and o'er this took counsel to night and the new moons names they gave they named the morning and named the midday afternoon evening to count the years the golden age till the coming of fate gathered the gods on the fields of labour they set on high their courts and temples they founded forges wrought rich treasures tongs they hammered and fashioned tools they played at tables in court were joyous little they wanted for wealth of gold till there came forth three of the giant race all fearful maidens from jotunheim creation of the dwarfs then when all the powers to their thrones of doom the most holy gods and o'er this took counsel whom should they make the lord of dwarfs out of ymir's blood and his swarthy limbs mead drinker then was made the highest but durin second of all the dwarfs and out of the earth these twain shaped beings in form like man as durin bade new moon waning moon all thief dallier north and south and east and west corpse like death like nipping dying beefer boffer bomber nori Anne and onar ay mead wolf vig and wand elf wind elf thrain feck and thorin thror vit and lit near and regin new council wise council now have i numbered the dwarfs aright fili kili fundin nali heptifili hanar svir frar hornbori freg und loni arvang yari oaken shield tis time to number in dallier's song mead all the dwarf kind of lofar's race who from earth's threshold the plains of moisture sought below the sandy realms there were draupnir and dogthrasir har and haugspuri hlevang gloin 
Dori, Ori, Dauf, Anvari, Skirfir, Virfir, Skafid, Ai, Elf and Yngvi, Oaken Shield, Fjallar and Frost, Finn and Ginnar. Thus shall be told throughout all time the line who were born of Lofar's race. Creation of Men Then came three gods of the Aesir kindred, mighty and blessed towards their home. They found on the seashore, wanting power, with fate unwoven, an ash and elm. Spirit they had not, and mind they owned not, blood nor voice nor fair appearance. Spirit gave Odin, and mind gave Hunir, blood gave Lodur, an aspect fair. The Tree of Life and Fate An ash I know standing, tis called Yggdrasil, a high tree sprinkled with shining drops. Come dews therefrom, which fall in the dales, it stands ever green o'er the well of weird. There are the maidens all things knowing, three in the hall which stands neath the tree. One is named Weird, the second being, who grave on tablets, but shall the third. They lay down laws, they choose out life, they speak the doom of the sons of men. The War of the Gods I remember the first great war in the world, when golden draught they pierced with spears, and burned in the hall of Odin the High One. Thrice they burned her, the three times born, oft not seldom, yet still she lives. Men called her a witch when she came to their dwellings, flattering Cirrus, wands she enchanted, spells many wove she, light-hearted wove them, and of evil women was ever the joy. Then went all the powers to their thrones of doom, the most holy gods, and o'er this took counsel, whether the Aesir should pay a were-guild, and all powers together make peaceful offering but odin hurled and shot mid the host and still raged the first great war in the world broken then were the bulwarks of asgard the wains war wary trampled the field war with the jutuns then went all the powers to their thrones of doom the most holy gods and o'er this took counsel who all the air had mingled with poison and freya had yielded to the race of jutuns alone fought the thunderer with raging heart seldom he rests when he hears such tidings oaths were broken words and swearing all solemn treaties made betwixt them the secret pledges of the gods i know where heimdall's hearing is hidden under the heaven want holy tree which i see ever showered with falling streams from all father's pledge would ye know further and what i sat lone enchanting when came the dread one the ancient god and gazed in my eyes what dost thou ask of me why dost thou prove me all know i odin yea where thou hast hidden thine eye in the wondrous well of mimir who each morn from the pledge of all father drinks the mead would ye know further and what then odin bestowed on me rings and trinkets for magic spells and the wisdom of wands i saw far and wide into every world from far i saw the valkyries coming ready to ride to the hero host fate held a shield and lofty followed war and battle bond and spear-point numbered now are the warfather's maidens valkyries ready to ride over earth i saw for balder the bleeding god the child of odin his doom concealed high o'er the fields there stood upgrown most slender and fair the mistletoe and there came from that plant though slender it seemed the fell woe shaft which hood did shoot but Baldr's brother was born ere long, that son of Odin fought one night old. For never hand he bathed nor head, ere he laid on the bale-fire Baldr's foe. But Frigg long wept o'er the woe of Valhalla in Fen's moist halls. Would ye know further, and what? Vision into Hell in Jutenheim I saw lying bound in Cauldron Grove, one like the form of guile-loving Loki, and there sat Sigyn, yet o'er her husband, rejoicing little. Would ye know further, and what? From the eastward a flood, the stream of fear, bore swords and daggers through poison dales. To the northward stood on the moonless plains the golden hall of the sparkler's race. And a second stood in the uncooled realm, a feast hall of Utuns, fire tis called. And far from the sun I saw a third on the strand of corpses, with doors set northward, down through the roof dripped poison drops, for that hall was woven with serpents' backs. I saw there wading the whelming streams, wolf-like murderers, men forsworn, and those who another's love-whisperer had wiled. 
the dragon fierce stinger fed on corpses a wolf tore men would ye know further and what far east in ironwood sat an old giantess fenrir's offspring she fostered there from among them all doth one come forth in guise of a troll to snatch the sun he is gorged as on lives of dying men he reddens the place of the powers like blood swart grows the sunshine of summer after all baleful the storms would ye know further and what signs of doom sits on a mound and strikes his harp the gleeful swordsman warder of giant wives o'er him crows in the roosting tree the fair red cock who fjallar is called crows o'er the gods the golden combed he wakes the heroes in warfathers dwellings and crows yet another beneath the earth a dark red cock in the halls of hell loud bays garm before gaping hell the bond shall be broken the wolf run free hidden things i know still onward i see the great doom of the powers the gods of war brothers shall fight and be as murderers sisters children shall stain their kinship tis ill with the world comes fearful whoredom a sword age axe age shields are cloven a wind age wolf age ere the world sinks never shall man then spare another mim's sons arise the fate tree kindles at the roaring sound of gjalla horn loud blows heimdall the horn is aloft and odin speaks with mimir's head groans the ancient tree fenrir is freed shivers yet standing yggdrasil's ash how do the gods fare how do the elves fare all jutunheim rumbles the gods are in council before the stone doors the dwarfs are groaning a rock wall finding would ye know further and what loud bays garm before gaping hell the bond shall be broken the wolf run free hidden things i know still onward i see the great doom of the powers the gods of war gathering of the destroyers drives Hrim from the east holding shield on high the world serpent writhes in Jutun rage he lashes the waves screams a pale beaked eagle rending corpses the death boat is launched sails the bark from the north the hosts of hell o'er the sea are coming and loki steering brother of beliest he fares on the way with fenrir and all the monster kinsmen rides sort from the south fire bane of branches son of the war gods gleams from his sword the rock hills crash the troll wives totter men flock hellward and heaven is cleft the last battles of the gods soon comes to pass frigg's second woe when odin fares to fight with the wolf then must he fall her lord beloved and belly's bright slayer must bow before sort comes forth the stalwart son of the warfather vidar to strive with the deadly beast let's see the sword from his right hand leap into fenrir's heart and avenged is the father comes forth the glorious offspring of earth thor to strive with the glistening serpent strikes in his wrath the warder of midgard while mortals all their homes forsake nine feet recoils he the son of odin bowed from the dragon who fears not shame the end of the world the sun is darkened earth sinks in the sea from heaven turn the bright stars away rages smoke with fire the life feeder high flame plays against heaven itself loud bays garm before gaping hell the bond shall be broken the wolf run free hidden things i know still onward i see the great doom of the powers the gods of war the new world i see uprising a second time earth from the ocean green anew the waters fall on high the eagle flies o'er the fell and catches fish the gods are gathered on the fields of labour they speak concerning the great world serpent and remember their things of former fame and the mightiest gods old mysteries then shall be found the wondrous seeming golden tables hid in the grass those they had used in days of yore and there unsown shall the fields bring forth all harm shall be healed baldr will come hud and baldr shall dwell in valhalla at peace the war gods would ye know further and what then hunir shall cast the twigs of divining and the sun shall dwell of odin's brothers in wind home wide would ye know further and what i see yet a hall more fair than the sun 
roofed with gold in the fire-sheltered realm ever shall dwell there all holy beings blessed with joy through the days of time coming of the new power passing of the old comes from on high to the great assembly the mighty ruler who orders all fares from beneath a dim dragon flying a glistening snake from the moonless fells fierce stinger bears the dead on his pinions away o'er the plains i sink now and cease end of part sixteen the soothsaying of the vala recording by expatriate in bangor maine end of the elder edda author unknown translated by olive bray